by the definition of a pastoral nation, I have recalled a long description of the economy, the warfare, and the government that prevail in that state of society, I may add, that to fishing, as well as to the chase, the Hungarians were indebted for a part of their subsistence, and since they seldom cultivated the ground, they must, at least in their new settlements, have sometimes practiced a slight and unskillful husbandry in their emigrations. Perhaps in their expeditions, the host was accompanied by thousands of sheep and oxen which increased the cloud of formidable dust, and afforded a constant and wholesale supply of milk and animal food. A plentiful command of forage was the first care of the general, and if the flocks and herds were secure of their pastures, the hardy warrior was alike insensible of danger and fatigue. The confusion of men and cattle that overspread the country exposed their camp to a nocturnal surprise, had not a still wider circuit been occupied by their light cavalry, perpetually in motion to discover and delay the approach of the enemy. After some experience of the Roman tactics, they adopted the use of the sword and spear, the helmet of the soldier, and the iron breastplate of his steed, but their native and deadly weapon was the tartar bow, from the earliest infancy there. Children and servants were exercised in the double science of archery and horsemanship, their arm was strong, their aim was sure, and in the most rapid career, they were taught to throw themselves backwards, and to shoot a volley of arrows into the air. In open combat, in secret ambush, in flight or pursuit, they were equally formidable, an appearance of order was maintained in the foremost ranks, but their charge was driven forwards by the impatient pressure of succeeding crowds. They pursued, headlong and rash, with loosened reins and horrific outcries, but, if they fled, with real or dissembled fear, the ardor of a pursuing foe was checked and chastised by the same habits of irregular speed and sudden evolution. In the abuse of victory, they astonished Europe, yet smarting from the wounds of the Saracen and the Dane, mercy they rarely asked, and more rarely bestowed, both sexes if accused is equally inaccessible to pity, and their appetite for raw flesh might countenance the popular tale, that they drank the blood, and feasted on the hearts of the slain. Yet the Hungarians were not devoid of those principles of justice and humanity, which nature has implanted in every bosom. The license of public and private injuries was restrained by laws and punishments, and in the security of an open camp, theft is the most tempting and most dangerous offense. Among the barbarians there were many, whose spontaneous virtue supplied their laws and corrected their manners, who performed the duties, and sympathized with the affections, of social life. 29. Return, Leo has observed, that the government of the Turks was monarchical, and that their punishments were rigorous. Tactic P. 896, Regino, in Chronicles AD 889, mentions theft as a capital crime, and his jurisprudence is confirmed by the original. Code of Street Stephen, A.D. 1016 If a slave were guilty, he was chastised, for the first time, with the loss of his nose, or a 
fine of five heifers, for the second, with the loss of his ears. Or a similar fine, for the third, with death, which the freeman did not incur till the fourth offence, as his first penalty was. The loss of liberty, Katona, History Regum Hungartam, IP 231. 232. After a long pilgrimage of flight or victory, the Turkish hordes approached the common limits of the French and Byzantine empires. Their first conquests and final settlements extended on either side of the Danube above Vienna, below Belgrade, and beyond the measure of the Roman province of Pannonia, or the modern kingdom of Hungary. 30 That ample and fertile land was loosely occupied by the Moravians, a Sclavonian name and tribe, which were driven by the invaders into the compass of a narrow province. Charlemagne had stretched a vague and nominal empire as far as the edge of Transylvania, but, after the failure of his legitimate line, the Dukes of Moravia forgot their obedience and tribute to the monarchs of Oriental France. The bastard Arnulf was provoked to invite the arms of the Turks, they rushed through the real or figurative wall, which his indiscretion had thrown open, and the king of Germany has been justly reproached as a traitor to the civil and ecclesiastical society of the Christians. During the life of Arnulf, the Hungarians were checked by gratitude or fear, but in the infancy of his son Louis, they discovered and invaded Bavaria, and such was their Scythian speed, that in a single day a circuit of fifty miles was stripped and consumed. In the Battle of Augustsburg the Christians maintained their advantage till the seventh hour of the day, they were deceived and vanquished by the flying stratagems of the Turkish cavalry. The conflagration spread over the provinces of Bavaria, Swabia, and Franconia, and the Hungarians 31 promoted the reign of anarchy, by forcing the stoutest barons to discipline their vassals and fortify their castles. The origin of walled towns is ascribed to this calamitous period, nor could any distance be secure against an enemy, who, almost at the same instant, laid in ashes the Helf Tien Monastery of Street Gaul, and the city of Bremen, on the shores of the northern ocean. Above thirty years the Germanic Empire, or Kingdom, was subject to the ignominy of tribute, and resistance was disarmed by the menace. The serious and effectual menace of dragging the women and children into captivity, and of slaughtering the males above the age of ten years. I have neither power nor inclination to follow the Hungarians beyond the Rhine, but I must observe with surprise, that the southern provinces of France were blasted by the tempest, and that Spain, behind her Pyrenees, was astonished at the approach of these formidable strangers. 32 The vicinity of Italy had tempted their early inroads, but from their camp on the Brenta, they beheld with some terror the apparent strength and populousness of the new discovered country. They requested leave to retire, their request was proudly rejected by the Italian king and the lives of twenty thousand Christians paid the forfeit of his obstinacy and rashness. Among the cities of the West, the royal Pavia was conspicuous in fame and splendor, and the preeminence of Rome itself was only derived from the relics of the apostles. 
The Hungarians appeared, Pavia was in flames. Forty-three churches were consumed, and, after the massacre of the people, they spared about two hundred wretches who had gathered some bushels of gold and silver, a vague exaggeration, from the smoking ruins of their country. In these annual excursions from the Alps to the neighborhood of Rome and Capua, the churches, that yet escaped, resounded with a fearful litany. Oh, save and deliver us from the arrows of the Hungarians. But, the saints were deaf or inexorable, and the torrent rolled forwards, till it was stopped by the extreme land of Calabria. 33. A composition was offered and accepted for the head of each Italian subject, and ten bushels of silver were poured forth in the Turkish camp. But falsehood is the natural antagonist of violence, and the robbers were defrauded both in the numbers of the assessment and the standard of the metal. On the side of the east, the Hungarians were opposed in doubtful conflict by the equal arms of the Bulgarians, whose faith forbade an alliance with the pagans, and whose situation formed the barrier of the Byzantine Empire. The barrier was overturned, the Emperor of Constantinople beheld the waving banners of the Turks, and one of their boldest warriors presumed to strike a battle axe into the Golden Gate. The arts and treasures of the Greeks diverted the assault, but the Hungarians might boast, in their retreat, that they had imposed a tribute on the spirit of Bulgaria and the majesty of the Caesars. 34. The remote and rapid operations of the same campaign appear to magnify the power and numbers of the Turks, but their courage is most deserving of praise, since a light troop of three or four hundred horse would often attempt and execute the most daring inroads to the gates of Thessalonica and Constantinople. At this disastrous era of the 9th and 10th centuries, Europe was afflicted by a triple scourge from the north, the east, and the south, the Norman, the Hungarian, and the Saracen, sometimes trod the same ground of desolation. And these savage foes might have been compared by Homer to the two lions growling over the carcass of a mangled stag. 35. 30. Return, see Katona, History. Tukum Hungar. p. 321 to 352. 31. Return, Hungarorum gens, Kujus Omnisphere Nations Experti. Sivashia Mensi, is the preface of Lyud Prand, L.I.C. 2, who frequently expatiated on the calamities of his own times. C.L. I.C. 5, L. 2. C. 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, L. 3. C. 1, N. C. L. V. C. 8. 15, in Legat. p. 485. His colors are glaring but his chronology must be rectified by Pagei and Muratori. 32, Return, the Three Bloody Reigns of Arpad, Zoltan, and Takus, are critically illustrated by Katona, Historidukum, and C.P. 107 to 499, his diligence has searched both natives and foreigners. Yet to the deeds of mischief, or glory, I have been able to add. The destruction of Bremen, Adam Bremensis, I 43. 33, return, Muratori has considered with patriotic care the 
Danger and Resources of Medina The Citizens Basoth Street Gemini Anus, their patron, to avert, by his intercession, the Rabies, Flagellum, and C. Nunc T. E. Ragamus, Lysit Servi Pesimi, Abe. Unger Orum Nos Defendas Jaculis The bishop erected walls for the public defense, not contra domino serenos, antiquitat. Italian. Med. Evi, Tom. I. Dissertat. I. P. 21, 22, and the song of the Nightly Watch is not without elegance or use, Tom 3 Dis XL. P. 709. The Italian on a list has accurately traced the series of their inroads, Annali d'Italia, Tom 7 p. 365, 367, 398, 401, 437, 440, Tom 8 p. 19, 41, 52, and c. 34, return, both the Hungarian and Russian annals suppose, that they besieged, or attacked, or insulted Constantinople, pray. Dissertat. X. P. 239. Katona, History Ducum, P. 354-360, and they. Fact is almost confessed by the Byzantine historians, Leo. Grammaticus, P. 506. Cedrinus, Tom. 2 p. 629, yet, however. Glorious to the nation, it is denied or doubted by the critical. Historian, and even by the notary of Bella. Their skepticism is. Meritorious, they could not safely transcribe or believe they. Rustic orum fabulas, but Katona might have given due attention to. The evidence of Lyut Prand, Bulgar Orum Gentimat Dac Orum. Tributarium Fiserant, History L. 2 C. 4, p. 435. 35, Return, Iliad, 16. 756. The deliverance of Germany and Christendom was achieved by the Saxon princes, Henry the Fowler and Otho the Great who, in two memorable battles, forever broke the power of the Hungarians. 36. The valiant Henry was roused from a bed of sickness by the invasion of his country, but his mind was vigorous and his prudence successful. My companions, said he, on the morning of the combat, maintain your ranks, receive on your bucklers the first arrows of the pagans, and prevent their second discharge by the equal and rapid career of your lances. They obeyed and conquered, and the historical picture of the castle of Merseburg expressed the features, or at least the character, of Henry, who, in an age of ignorance, entrusted to the finer arts they Perpetuity of his name. 37 At the end of twenty years, the children of the Turks who had fallen by his sword invaded the empire of his son, and their forces defined, in the lowest estimate, at one hundred thousand horse. They were invited by domestic faction, the gates of Germany were treacherously unlocked and they spread, far beyond the Rhine and the Meuse, into the heart of Flanders. But the vigor and prudence of Otho dispelled the conspiracy, the princes were made sensible that, unless they were true to each other, their religion and country were irrecoverably lost, and the national powers were reviewed in the plains of Augustsburg. 
They marched and fought in eight legions, according to the division of provinces and tribes, they first, second, and third, were composed of Bavarians, the fourth, of Franconians, the fifth, of Saxons, under the immediate command, of the monarch, the sixth and seventh consisted of Swabians, and the eighth legion, of a thousand Bohemians, closed the rear of the host. The resources of discipline and valor were fortified by the arts of superstition, which, on this occasion, may deserve the epithets of generous and salutary. The soldiers were purified. With a fast, the camp was blessed with the relics of saints and martyrs, and the Christian hero girded on his side the sword of Constantine, grasped the invincible spear of Charlemagne, and waved the banner of street. Maurice, the prefect of the Theban Legion. But his firmest confidence was placed in the Holy Lance. 38 Whose point was fashioned of the nails of the cross, and which his father had extorted from the king of Burgundy, by the threats of war, and the gift of a province. The Hungarians were expected. In the front, they secretly passed the Lech, a river of Bavaria, that falls into the Danube, turned the rear of the Christian army, plundered the baggage, and disordered the legion of Bohemia and Swabia. The battle was restored by the Franconians, whose duke, the valiant Conrad, was pierced with an arrow as he rested. From his fatigues, the Saxons fought under the eyes of their king, and his victory surpassed, in merit and importance, the triumphs of the last two hundred years. The loss of the Hungarians was still greater in the flight than in the action. They were encompassed by the rivers of Bavaria, and their past. Cruelties excluded them from the hope of mercy. Three captive princes were hanged at Ratisbon, the multitude of prisoners was slain or mutilated, and the fugitives, who presumed to appear in the face of their country, were condemned to everlasting poverty and disgrace. 39 Yet the spirit of the nation was humbled, and the most accessible passes of Hungary were fortified with a ditch and rampart. Adversity suggested the counsels of moderation and peace, the robbers of the West acquiesced in a sedentary life and the next generation was taught, by a discerning prince, that far more might be gained by multiplying and exchanging the produce of a fruitful soil. The native race, the Turkish or Fennec blood, was mingled with new colonies of Scythian or Sclavonian origin, forty many thousands of robust and industrious Captives had been imported from all the countries of Europe, 41. And after the marriage of Gysa with a Bavarian princess, he bestowed honors and estates on the nobles of Germany. 42. The son of Gysa was invested with the regal title, and the house of Arpad reigned 300 years in the kingdom of Hungary. But, the freeborn barbarians were not dazzled by the luster of the diadem, and the people asserted their indefeasible right of choosing, deposing, and punishing the hereditary servant of the state. 36. Return, they are amply and critically discussed by Katona. Historiticum, p. 360-368. 427 to 470. Lyud Prand, L. 2C89, is the best evidence for the former, and Witty Schind, 
Annal Saxon L. 3. Of the latter, but the critical historian will not even overlook the horn of a warrior, which is said to be preserved at Jasperid. 37. Return, Hunk Vero Triumphum, Tam Laud Quam Memoria Dignum. Admiris Bergam Rex in Super Iori Sinaculo Domus Persus, Idest. Picturum, Notari Precipit, Adio Ut Rembaram Potius Quam. Verisimilum Bithaeos, A High Encomium, Liud Prand, L. 2C9. Another palace in Germany had been painted with holy subjects by the Order of Charlemagne, and Muratori may justly affirm, nulla. Secula Fiora in Kibus Pictures Desideratii Fiorent, Antiquitat. Italian Medii Evi, Tom. 2 Dessert. XXIV P. 360, 361. R. Domestic Claims to Antiquity of Ignorance and Original Imperfection, Mr. Walpole's lively words, are of a much more Recent date, Anecdotes of Painting, Vol. I. P. 2, and C. 38, Return, C. Barrow News, Annal Ecclesiastes A.D. 929, No. 2-5 The Lance of Christ is taken from the best evidence, Lyud Prand, L. 4C, 12, Sigebert, and the Acts of Street. Gerard, but the other. Military relics depend on the faith of the Gusta Anglerum post. Badam, L. 2. C, 8. 39, Return, Katona, History. Tukum Hungary, p. 500, and c. 40, return, among these colonies we may distinguish, 1. The Shazars, or Kaberi, who joined the Hungarians on their march. Constant d. Admin, important c. 39, 40, p. 108, 109. 2. The Jazyges, Moravians, and Siculi, whom they found in the land, they last were perhaps a remnant of the Huns of Attila, and were entrusted with the guard of the borders. 3. The Russians, who, like the Swiss in France, imparted a general name to the royal porters. 4. The Bulgarians, whose chiefs, A.D. 956, were invited. Cum magna multitudine his mahelitarum. Had any of those Sclavonians embraced the Mahometan religion? 5. The Bissini and Cumans, a mixed multitude of Pats and Assites, Uzi, Shazars, and C, who had spread to the lower Danube. The last colony of 40,000 Cumans, A.D. 1239, was received and converted by the kings of Hungary, who derived from that tribe a new regal appellation, Prey. Dessert. 67. p. 109 to 173. Katona, History. Tukum, p. 95 to 99. 259 to 264, 476, 479 to 483, and c. 41, return, Christiani Autumn, Quorum Pars Major Populi Est, Key. Ex Omni Part Mundi Illuc Tracti Sunt Captivi, and c. Such was they. Language of Pilegrinus the first missionary who entered Hungary. A.D. 973 Pars Major is strong. History Tukum, p. 517 
42, Return, the Fidelis to Tanisai of Gaisa are authenticated in Old Charters, and Katona, with his usual industry, has made a fair estimate of these colonies, which had been so loosely magnified by the Italian Ranzanus, history critic. Tukum. p. 667-681. 3. The name of Russians 43 was first divulged, in the 9th century, by an embassy of Theophilus, Emperor of the East, to the Emperor of the West, Louis, the son of Charlemagne. The Greeks were accompanied by the envoys of the great duke, or Chagan, or Tsar, of the Russians. In their journey to Constantinople, they had traversed many hostile nations, and they hoped to escape the dangers of their return, by requesting the French monarch to transport them by sea to their native country. A closer examination detected their origin, they were the brethren of the Swedes and Normans, whose name was already odious and formidable. In France, and it might justly be apprehended, that these Russian Strangers were not the messengers of peace, but the emissaries of war. They were detained, while the Greeks were dismissed, and Louis expected a more satisfactory account, that he might obey the laws of hospitality or prudence, according to the interest of both empires. 44 This Scandinavian origin of the people, or at least the princes, of Russia, may be confirmed and illustrated by the National Annals 45 and the general history of the North. The Normans, who had so long been concealed by a veil of impenetrable darkness, suddenly burst forth in the spirit of naval and military enterprise. The vast, and, as it is said, the populous regions of Denmark, Sweden and Norway, were crowded with independent chieftains and desperate adventurers, who sighed in the laziness of peace, and smiled in the agonies of death. Piracy was the exercise, the trade, the glory and the virtue, of the Scandinavian youth. Impatient of a bleak climate and narrow limits, they started from the banquet, grasped their arms, sounded their horn, ascended their vessels, and explored every coast that promised either spoil or settlement. The Baltic was the first scene of their naval achievements they visited the eastern shores, the silent residence of Fennec and Sklavonic tribes, and the primitive Russians of the Lake Ladoga paid a tribute, the skins of white squirrels, to these strangers, whom they saluted with the title of Varangians 46 or Corsairs. Their superiority in arms, discipline and renown, commanded the fear and reverence of the natives in their wars against the Moor. Inland savages, the Varangians condescended to serve as friends and auxiliaries, and gradually, by choice or conquest, obtained the dominion of a people whom they were qualified to protect. Their tyranny was expelled, their valor was again recalled, till at length Ruhik, a Scandinavian chief, became the father of a dynasty which reigned above 700 years. His brothers extended his influence, the example of service and usurpation was imitated by his companions in the southern provinces of Russia and their establishments, by the usual methods of war and assassination, 
were cemented into the fabric of a powerful monarchy. 43. Return, among the Greeks, this national appellation has a singular form, as an undeclinable word, of which many fanciful etymologies have been suggested. I have perused, with pleasure and profit, a dissertation de origine rus orum, comment. Academy. Petropolitani, Tom. 8p 388-436, by Theophilus Sigifred. Bayer, a learned German, who spent his life and labors in the service of Russia. A Geographical Tract of Danville, de l'Empire. De Russie, Sun Origine, ETSES Acroismans, Paris, 1772, in. 1 2 MO, has likewise been of use. Asterisk note, the later antiquarians of Russia and Germany appear to acquiesce in the authority of the monk Nestor, the earliest on a list of Russia, who derives the Russians, or Veyrquess, from Scandinavia. The names of the first founders of the Russian monarchy are Scandinavian or Norman. Their language, according to Constant Porphyrog de Administrat. Imper. C. 9, differed essentially from the Sclavonian. The author of the Annals of Street. Burden, who first names the Russians, Rose. In the year 839 of his Annals, assigns them Sweden for their country. So Prand calls the Russians the same people as the Normans. The Finns, Laplanders, and Estonians call the Swedes. To the present day, Roots, Rootsi, Ruotsi, Roots Law. C. Thunman, under such an gen uber der Geschicht des Eslichen. Europaeischen Volker, p. 374. Gatterer, Community. Societ. Regpsient. Gotting. 13 p. 126. Schoolauser, in his Nestor. Cock. Revelo. D. Europe, Vol. I. P. 60. Multibrun, Geograph. Vol. 6 p. 378 m. 44, Return, See the entire passage, Dignum, says Bayer, U.T. Ores in tabulis regator, in the Annals Burdeniani Francorum. In Scripture Italian Muratori, Tom 2 Pars I P 525, A.D. 839. 22 years before the era of Rehik. In the XTH century. Lyud Prand, History L. V. C. 6, speaks of the Russians and Normans. As the same Aquilonis hominis of a red complexion. 45, Return, My knowledge of these annals is drawn from M. Levesque, Histoire de Russie. Nestor, the first and best of these. Ancient Annalists, was a monk of Cayo, who died in the beginning of the Zeeth century, but his chronicle was obscure, till it was published at Petersburg, 1767, in Fortio. Levesque, History de Russie. Tom. I. P. 16. Cox's Travels, Vol. 2 p. 184. Asterisk note, the late M. Schoolauser has translated and added a commentary to the Annals of Nestor, and his work is the mine from which henceforth a history of the North must be drawn. G. 46. Return, Theophil. Signature.
Bayer de Varages, for the name is differently spelt, in comment. Academy Petropolitani, Tom 4 p. 275-311 As long as the descendants of Rick were considered as aliens and conquerors, they ruled by the sword of the Varangians, distributed estates and subjects to their faithful captains, and supplied their numbers with fresh streams of adventurers from the Baltic coast. 47 But when the Scandinavian chiefs had struck a deep and permanent root into the soil, they mingled with the Russians in blood, religion, and language, and the first Weyladimir had the merit of delivering his country from these foreign mercenaries. They had seated him on the throne, his riches were insufficient to satisfy their demands, but they listened to his pleasing advice, that they should seek, not a more grateful, but a more wealthy, master, that they should embark for Greece, where, instead of the skins of squirrels, silk and gold would be the recompense of their service. At the same time, the Russian prince admonished his Byzantine ally to disperse and employ, to recompense and restrain, these impetuous children of the North. Contemporary writers have recorded the introduction, name and character of the Varangians each day. They rose in confidence and esteem, the whole body was assembled at Constantinople to perform the duty of guards, and there strength was recruited by a numerous band of their countrymen from the island of Thule. On this occasion, the vague appellation of Thule is applied to England, and the new Varangians were a colony of English and Danes who fled from the yoke of the Norman conqueror. The habits of pilgrimage and piracy had approximated the countries of the earth, these exiles were entertained in the Byzantine court, and they preserved, till the last age of the empire, the inheritance of spotless loyalty, and the use of the Danish or English tongue, with their broad and double-edged battle axes on their shoulders, they attended the Greek emperor to the temple, the senate, and the hippodrome, he slept and feasted under their trusty guard, and the keys of the palace, the treasury, and the capital, were held by the firm and faithful hands of the Varangians. 48. 47. Return, yet, as late as the year 1018, Kyle and Russia were still guarded ex fugitivorum servorum robbery, confluentium et. Maxim Danorum. Bayer, who quotes, p. 292, the Chronicle of Dithmar of Merseburg, observes, that it was unusual for the Germans to enlist in a foreign service. 48. Return. Duckenge has collected from the original authors the State and History of the Varangi at Constantinople, Glosser. Med. et infamy Grisididus, sub voci. Med. et infamy. Latinitatis, sub voci vagri. Not. Ad Alexiad. Annie Comney, p. 256. 257, 258. Notes Sir Vilharduin, p. 296 to 299. See likewise. The annotations of Ryski to the Ceremony Ali Ali Byzant. Of. Constantine, Tom. 2 p. 149, 150. Saxo Grammaticus affirms that 
They spoke Danish, but Codinus maintains them till the 15th century in the use of their native English. In the 10th century, the geography of Scythia was extended far beyond the limits of ancient knowledge, and the monarchy of the Russians obtains a vast and conspicuous place in the map of Constantine. 49 The sons of Rik were masters of the spacious province of Volodymyr, or Moscow, and, if they were confined on that side by the hordes of the east, their western frontier in those early days was enlarged to the Baltic Sea and the country of the Prussians. Their northern reign ascended above the 60th degree of latitude over the Hyperborean regions, which fancy had peopled with monsters, or clouded with eternal darkness. To the south they followed the course of the Boris thence, and approached with that river the neighborhood of the Euxine Sea. The tribes that dwelt, or wandered, in this ample circuit were obedient to the same conqueror, and insensibly blended into the same nation. The language of Russia is a dialect of the Sclavonian, but in the 10th century, these two modes of speech were different from each other, and, as the Sclavonian prevailed in the south, it may be presumed that the original Russians of the north, the primitive subjects of the Varangian chief, were a portion of the Fennec race. With the emigration, union, or dissolution, of the wandering tribes, the loose end. Indefinite picture of the Scythian desert has continually shifted. But the most ancient map of Russia affords some places which still retain their name and position, and the two capitals Novogorod 50 and Kyo 51 are coeval with the first age of the monarchy. Novogorod had not yet deserved the epithet of great nor the alliance of the Hanseatic League, which diffused the streams of opulence and the principles of freedom. Kyo could not yet boast of three hundred churches, an innumerable people, and a degree of greatness and splendor which was compared with Constantinople by those who had never seen the residence of the Caesars. In their origin, the two cities were no more than camps or fairs, the most convenient stations in which the barbarians might assemble for the occasional business of war or trade. Yet, even these assemblies announce some progress in the arts of society, a new breed of cattle was imported from the southern provinces, and the spirit of commercial enterprise pervaded the sea and land, from the Baltic to the Euxine, from the mouth of the Oder to the port of Constantinople. In the days of idolatry and barbarism, the Sclavonic city of Julin was frequented and enriched by the Normans, who had prudently secured a free mart of purchase and exchange. 52 From this harbor at the entrance of the Oder, the Corsair, or Merchant, sailed in 43 days to the eastern shores of the Baltic, the most distant nations were intermingled and the holy groves of Kurland are said to have been decorated with Grecian and Spanish gold. 53 Between the sea and Novogorod an easy intercourse was discovered, in the summer, through a gulf, a lake, and a navigable river, in the winter season, over the hard and level surface of boundless snows. From the neighborhood of that city, the Russians descended the streams that fall into the Boris thence, their canoes, of a single tree, 
were laden with slaves of every age, furs of every species, the spoil of their beehives, and the hides of their cattle, and the whole produce of the north was collected and discharged in the magazines of Cayo. The month of June was the ordinary season of the departure of the fleet, the timber of the canoes was framed into the oars and benches of more solid and capacious boats, and they proceeded without obstacle down the Boris thence, as far as the seven or thirteen ridges of rocks, which traverse the bed and precipitate the waters of the river. At the more shallow falls it was sufficient to lighten the vessels, but the deeper cataracts were impassable, and the mariners, who dragged their vessels and their slaves six miles over land, were exposed in this toilsome journey to the robbers of the desert. 54 At the first island below the falls, the Russians celebrated the festival of their escape, at a second, near the mouth of the river, they repaired their shattered vessels for the longer end more perilous voyage of the Black Sea. If they steered along the coast, the Danube was accessible, with a fair wind they could reach in thirty-six or forty hours the opposite shores of Anatolia, and Constantinople admitted the annual visit of the strangers of the north. They returned at the stated season with a Rich cargo of corn, wine, and oil, the manufactures of Greece and the spices of India. Some of their countrymen resided in the capital and provinces, and the national treaties protected the persons, effects, and privileges of the Russian merchant. 55. 49. Return the original record of the geography and trade of Russia is produced by the Emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus. De Administrat. Imperii, c. 2, p. 55, 56, c. 9, p. 59-61, c. 13, p. 63-67, c. 37, p. 106, C. 42, p. 112, 113, and illustrated by The Diligence of Bayer, D. Geographia Russia Vicina Rumk. Regionum Sursitor AC 948, in comment. Academy. Petropol. Tom. 9p 367 422, Tom. XP 371 to 421 with the aid of the Chronicles and Traditions of Russia, Scandinavia, and C. 50 Return the haughty proverb who can resist God and the Great Novogorod is applied by M. Lavec, History de Russie, Tom. IP 60 even to the times that preceded the reign of Rehik. In the course of his history he frequently celebrates this republic, which was suppressed A.D. 1475, Tom 2 p. 252-266. That accurate traveler Adam Oliarius describes, in 1635, the remains of Novogorod, and the route by sea and land of the Holstein. Ambassadors, Tom. I.P. 123-129. 51. Return, in H.A.C. Magna Civitat, Quae E.S.T. Caput Regnat, plus. Trecenti Ecclesiae Habenter E.T. Nundinia Octo, Populi Entium. Ignotomanus, Eghardus at AD 1018, Apud Bayer, Tom 9p. 412, he likewise quotes, 
Tom XP 397, The Words of the Saxon Onalist, Kujus, Russio, Metropolis EST Chive, Emula Septri Constantinopolitani, Que EST Clarissimum Decus Grisei The Fame of Cayo, especially in the 5th century, had reached the German and Arabian geographers. 52. Return, in Odori Osteo Quasithicazuluid Palliads. Nobilissima Civitas Jolinum, Celebarum Am, Barbaris et Grisus. Qui sunt in circuitu, pras tan stationum, est sane maxima omnium. Quas Europa Claudet Civitatum, Adam Bremensis, History Ecclesiastes p. 19, a strange exaggeration even in the 5th century. The trade of the Baltic and the Hansa Attic League are carefully treated in Anderson's historical deduction of commerce, at least, in our language. I am not acquainted with any books so satisfactory. Asterisk. Note, the book of authority is the Geschichte de Hansa Attiscan. Buns, by George Sartorius, Gottingen, 1803, or rather the later edition of that work by M. Lappenberg, 2 Vol. 40. Hamburg, 1830 M. 1845. 53. Return, according to Adam of Bremen, de situ Danii, p. 58. The old Kurland extended eight days' journey along the coast, and by Peter Tudobergicus, p. 68, a.d. 1326, Memel is defined as the common frontier of Russia, Kurland, and Prussia. Orum ibi i plurimum says Adam, divinus auguribus udg. Necromanticus omnes domus sunt plini. A toto or by bi. Responsa patun ter, maxima hispanis, forsens opanis, idest. Regulis let avie, et grisus. The name of Greeks was applied to the Russians even before their conversion, an imperfect Conversion, if they still consulted the wizards of Kurland. Bayer, Tom XP 378, 402, and C. Grotius, Prolegomen ad History. Goth p. 99. 54. Return, Constantine only reckons seven cataracts, of which he gives the Russian and Sclavonic names, but thirteen are enumerated by the Sieur de Beauplan, a French engineer, who had surveyed the course and navigation of the Dnieper, or Boris thence, description de l'Ukraine, Rouen, 1660, a thin quarto, but the map is unluckily wanting in my copy. 55, Return, Nestor, Apudlovec, History de Russie, Tom I. P. 78-80 From the Dnieper, or Boris thence, the Russians went to Black Bulgaria, Chazaria, and Syria. To Syria, how? Where? When? The alteration is slight, the position of Swania, between Chazaria and Lazica, is perfectly suitable, and the name was still used in the 5th century, Cedron, Tom 2 p. 770. Chapter LV, The Bulgarians, The Hungarians, and The Russians, Part 3. But the same communication which had been opened for the benefit was soon abused for the injury of mankind. In a period of one, 190 years, the Russians made four attempts to plunder the treasures of Constantinople, the event was various. But the motive, the means, and the object, were the same in these 
Naval Expeditions 56 The Russian traders had seen the magnificence, and tasted the luxury of the city of the Caesars. A marvelous tale, and a scanty supply, excited the desires of their savage countrymen, they envied the gifts of nature which their climate denied, they coveted the works of art, which they were too lazy to imitate and too indigent to purchase, they Varangian princes unfurled the banners of piratical adventure, and their bravest soldiers were drawn from the nations that dwelt in the northern isles of the ocean. 57 The image of their naval armaments was revived in the last century, in the fleets of the Cossacks, which issued from the Boris thence, to navigate the same seas for a similar purpose. 58 The Greek appellation of Minoxila or single canoes, might justly be applied to the bottom of their vessels. It was scooped out of the long stem of a beech or willow, but the slight and narrow foundation was raised and continued on either side with planks, till it attained the length of sixty, and the height of about twelve feet. These boats were built without a deck, but with two rudders and a mast, to move with sails and oars, and to contain from forty to seventy men with their arms, and provisions of fresh water and salt fish. The first trial of the Russians was made with two hundred boats, but when the national force was exerted, they might arm against Constantinople a thousand or twelve hundred vessels. Their fleet was not much inferior to the Royal Navy of Agamemnon, but it was magnified in the eyes of fear to ten or fifteen times the real proportion of its strength and numbers. Had the Greek emperors been endowed with foresight to discern, and vigor to prevent, perhaps they might have sealed with a maritime force the mouth of the Boris thence, their indolence abandoned the coast of Anatolia to the calamities of a piratical war, which, after an interval of six hundred years, again infested the Euxine, but as long as the capital was respected, the sufferings of a distant province escaped the notice both of the prince and the historian. They storm which had swept along from the Phasis and Trebizond, at length burst on the Bosphorus of Thrace, a strait of fifteen miles, in which the rude vessels of the Russians might have been stopped and destroyed by a more skillful adversary. In their first enterprise, fifty-nine under the princes of Cayo, they passed without opposition, and occupied the port of Constantinople in the absence of the Emperor Michael, the son of Theophilus. Through a crowd of perils, he landed at the palace stairs, and immediately repaired to a church of the Virgin Mary. 60 By the advice of the patriarch, her garment, a precious relic, was drawn from the sanctuary and dipped in the sea, and a seasonable tempest, which determined the retreat of the Russians, was devoutly ascribed to the Mother of God. 61 The silence of the Greeks may inspire some doubt of the truth, or at least of the importance, of the second attempt by Oleg, the guardian of the sons of Rehik. 62 A strong Barrier of arms and fortifications defended the Bosphorus, they were eluded by the usual expedient of drawing the boats over the isthmus, and this simple operation is described in the National Chronicles, as if the Russian fleet had sailed over dry land with 
a brisk and favorable gale. The leader of the third armament, Igor, the son of Rehik, had chosen a moment of weakness and decay, when the naval powers of the empire were employed against the Saracens. But if courage be not wanting, the instruments of defense are seldom deficient. Fifteen broken and decayed galleys were boldly launched against the enemy, but instead of the single tube of Greek fire usually planted on the prow, the sides and stern of each vessel were abundantly supplied with that liquid combustible. The engineers were dexterous, the weather was propitious, many thousand Russians, who chose rather to be drowned than burnt, leaped into the sea, and those who escaped to the Thracian shore were inhumanly slaughtered by the peasants and soldiers. Yet one third of the canoes escaped into shallow water. And the next spring Igor was again prepared to retrieve his disgrace and claim his revenge. 63 After a long peace, Yaros Laos, the great-grandson of Igor, resumed the same project of a naval invasion. A fleet, under the command of his son, was repulsed at the entrance of the Bosphorus by the same artificial flames. But, in the rashness of pursuit, the vanguard of the Greeks was Encompassed by an irresistible multitude of boats and men, their provision of fire was probably exhausted, and twenty-four galleys were either taken, sunk, or destroyed. 64. 56. Return, the wars of the Russians and Greeks in the Ixth. Xth, and Zith centuries, are related in the Byzantine annals especially those of Zonaras and Cedrinus, and all their testimonies are collected in the Russica of Stri Tte or Tom. 2. Pars 2. p. 939-1044. 57. Return, Cedrinus in Compend p. 758. 58. Return, Sibo Plan. Description de l'Ukraine, p. 54 to 61. His descriptions are lively, his plans accurate, and except the circumstances of firearms, we may read old Russians for modern Cossacks. 59. Return, it is to be lamented, that Bayer has only given a Dissertation de Russorum Prima Expedition Constantinopolitana Comment Academy Petropol Tom 6p 265-391 After Disentangling some chronological intricacies, he fixes it in the Years 864 or 865 a date which might have smoothed some doubts and difficulties in the beginning of M. Levick's history. 60. Return, when Photius wrote his encyclic epistle on the conversion of the Russians, the miracle was not yet sufficiently ripe. 61. Return, Leo Grammaticus, p. 463-464. Constantini. Continuator in Scripture post Theophanem, p. 121, 122. Simeon. Logothet. p. 445, 446. George. Monarch. p. 535, 536. Cedrinus. Tom. 2 p. 551. Zonaras, Tom. 2 p. 162. 62. 
Return, C. Nestor and Nikon, in Levix History de Russi. Tom. I. P. 74-80. Katona, History Dukum, P. 75-79, uses his advantage to disprove this Russian victory, which would cloud the siege of Kyo by the Hungarians. 63, Return, Leo Grammaticus, p. 506, 507. Insert. Conton. p. 263, 264 Simeon Logothet. p. 490, 491. George. Monarch. p. 588. 589. Cedron Tom. 2 p. 629. Zonaras, Tom. 2 p. 190, 191, and. Lyud Prand, LVC 6, who writes from the narratives of his. Father in law, then ambassador at Constantinople, and corrects. The vain exaggeration of the Greeks. 64. Return, I can only appeal to Cedrinus, Tom 2 p. 758. 759, and Zonaras, Tom 2 p. 253, 254, but they grow more. Weighty and credible as they draw near to their own times. Yet the threats or calamities of a Russian war were more frequently diverted by treaty than by arms. In these naval hostilities, every disadvantage was on the side of the Greeks. Their savage enemy afforded no mercy, his poverty promised no spoil, his impenetrable retreat deprived the conqueror of the hopes of revenge and the pride or weakness of empire indulged in opinion, that no honor could be gained or lost in the intercourse with barbarians. At first their demands were high and inadmissible, three pounds of gold for each soldier or mariner of the fleet, the Russian youth adhered to the design of conquest and glory but the counsels of moderation were recommended by the hoary sages. Be content, they said, with the liberal offers of Caesar, is it not far better to obtain without a combat the possession of gold, silver, silks and all the objects of our desires? Are we sure of victory? Can we conclude a treaty with the sea? We do not tread on the land, we float on the abyss of water, and a common death hangs over our heads. 65 The memory of these Arctic fleets that seemed to descend from the polar circle left deep impression of terror on the imperial city. By the vulgar of every rank, it was asserted and believed, that an Equestrian statue in the square of Taurus was secretly inscribed with a prophecy, how the Russians, in the last days, should become masters of Constantinople. 66 In our own time, a Russian armament, instead of sailing from the Boris thence, has circumnavigated the continent of Europe, and the Turkish capital has been threatened by a squadron of strong and lofty ships of war, each of which, with its naval science and thundering artillery, could have sunk or scattered a hundred canoes, such as those of their ancestors. Perhaps the present generation may yet behold the accomplishment of the prediction, of a rare prediction, of which the style is unambiguous and the date unquestionable. 65. Return, Nestor, Apodlovec, History de Russie, 
Tom I P. 87. 66. Return, this brazen statue, which had been brought from Antioch, and was melted down by the Latins, was supposed to represent either Joshua or Bellerophon, an odd dilemma. C. Nystus Chon Iates, p. 413, 414, Codinus, de originibus C. P. P. 24, and the anonymous writer De Antiquitat. C. P. Bandurai. Important Orient. Tom. I. P. 17, 18, who lived about the year 1100. They witness the belief of the prophecy the rest is immaterial. By land the Russians were less formidable than by sea, and as they fought for the most part on foot, their irregular legions must often have been broken and overthrown by the cavalry of the Scythian hordes. Yet their growing towns, however slight and imperfect, presented a shelter to the subject, and a barrier to the enemy, the monarchy of Cayo, till a fatal partition, assumed the dominion of the north, and the nations from the Volga to the Danube were subdued or repelled by the arms of Swatislaus, 67 the son of Igor, the son of Oleg, the son of Rehik. The vigor of his Mind and body was fortified by the hardships of a military and savage life. Wrapped in a bearskin, Swatislaus usually slept on the ground, his head reclining on a saddle, his diet was coarse and frugal, and, like the heroes of Homer, 68 his meat, it was often horse flesh, was broiled or roasted on the coals. The exercise of war gave stability and discipline to his army, and it may be presumed that no soldier was permitted to transcend the luxury of his chief. By an embassy from Nisphorus, the Greek emperor, he was moved to undertake the conquest of Bulgaria, and a gift of 1500 pounds of gold was laid at his feet to defray the expense, or reward the toils, of the expedition. An army of 60,000 men was assembled and embarked, they sailed from the Boris thence to the Danube, their landing was effected on the Mysian shore, and, after a sharp encounter, the swords of the Russians prevailed against the arrows of the Bulgarian horse. The vanquished king sunk into the grave, his children were made captive, and his dominions, as far as Mount Hemus, were subdued or ravaged by the northern invaders. But, instead of relinquishing his prey, and performing his engagements, the Varangian prince was more disposed to advance than to retire, and, had his ambition been crowned with success. The seat of empire in that early period might have been transferred to a more temperate and fruitful climate. Swatislaus enjoyed and acknowledged the advantages of his new position, in which he could unite, by exchange or rapine, the various productions of the earth. By an easy navigation he might draw from Russia the native commodities of furs, wax and hide roamed. Hungary supplied him with a breed of horses and the spoils of the West, and Greece abounded with gold, silver and the foreign luxuries, which his poverty had affected to disdain. The bands of Patsanassites, Khazars and Turks repaired to the standard of victory, and the ambassador of Nice Forest betrayed his trust, assumed the purple, 
and promised to share with his new allies the treasures of the Eastern world. From the banks of the Danube the Russian prince pursued his march as far as Adrianople, a formal summons to evacuate the Roman province was dismissed with contempt, and Swatislaus fiercely replied, that Constantinople might soon expect the presence of an enemy and a master. 67. Return, the life of Swatislaus, or Svyatislav, or Svendoslavus, is extracted from the Russian chronicles by M. Levesque, History de Russie, Tom I. P. 94-107. 68. Return, this resemblance may be clearly seen in the ninth book of the Iliad, 205-221, in the minute detail of the cookery of Achilles. By such a picture, a modern epic poet would disgrace his work, and disgust his reader, but the Greek verses are harmonious a dead language can seldom appear low or familiar, and at the distance of 2,700 years, we are amused with the primitive manners of antiquity. Nisphorus could no longer expel the mischief which he had introduced, but his throne and wife were inherited by John Zemises, 69 who, in a diminutive body, possessed the spirit and abilities of a hero. The first victory of his lieutenants deprived the Russians of their foreign allies, 20,000 of whom were either destroyed by the sword, or provoked to revolt, or tempted to desert. Thrace was delivered, but 70,000 barbarians were still in arms, and the legions that had been recalled from the new conquests of Syria, prepared, with the return of the spring, to march under the banners of a warlike prince, who declared himself the friend and avenger of the injured Bulgaria. The passes of Mount Hemus had been left unguarded, they were instantly occupied, the Roman vanguard was formed of the immortals, a proud imitation of the Persian style, the emperor led the main body of 10,500 foot, and the rest of his forces followed in slow and cautious array, with the baggage and military engines. The first exploit of Zemises was the reduction of Martianopolis, or Paris Thlaba, 70 in two days, the trumpets sounded, the walls were scaled, 8,500 Russians were put to the sword, and the sons of the Bulgarian king were rescued from an ignominious prison, and invested with a nominal diadem. After these repeated losses, Swatislaus retired to the strong post of Drista, on the banks of the Danube, and was pursued by an enemy who alternately employed the arms of celerity and delay. The Byzantine galleys ascended the river, the legions completed a line of circumvallation, and the Russian prince was encompassed, assaulted, and famished, in the fortifications of the camp and city. Many deeds of valor were performed, several desperate Sallies were attempted, nor was it till after a siege of 65 days that Swatislaus yielded to his adverse fortune. The liberal terms which he obtained announced the prudence of the victor, who respected the valor, and apprehended the despair, of an unconquered mind. The great Duke of Russia bound himself, by solemn imprecations, to relinquish all hostile designs, a safe passage was opened for his return, the liberty of trade and navigation was restored, 
a measure of corn was distributed to each of his soldiers, and the allowance of twenty-two thousand measures attests the loss and the remnant of the barbarians. After a painful voyage, they again reached the mouth of the Boris thence, but their provisions were exhausted, the season was unfavorable, they passed the winter on the ice, and, before they could prosecute their march, Swatislaus was surprised and oppressed by the neighboring tribes with whom the Greeks entertained a perpetual and useful correspondence. 71 Far Different was the return of Zemises, who was received in his capital like Camillus or Marius, the saviors of ancient Rome. But the merit of the victory was attributed by the pious emperor to the mother of God, and the image of the Virgin Mary, with the divine infant in her arms, was placed on a triumphal car, adorned with the spoils of war, and the ensigns of Bulgarian royalty. Zemises made his public entry on horseback, the diadem on his head, a crown of laurel in his hand, and Constantinople was astonished to applaud the martial virtues of her sovereign. 72. 69. Return, this singular epithet is derived from the Armenian language. As I profess myself equally ignorant of these words, I may be indulged in the question in the play, pray, which of you is the interpreter? From the context, they seem to signify Adolescent Ulus, Leo Diakon L. 4. Ms. Apaduckenj, Glosser. Grisi. P. 1570. Asterisk note, Serbid. The learned Armenian, gives. Another derivation. There is a city called Chemiskezag. Which means a bright or purple sandal, such as women wear in the. East. He was called Chemiskai, for so his name is written. In Armenian, from this city, his native place. Hayes. Note to Leo. Diak. P. 454, in Niebuhr's Byzant. History M. 70, return, in the Sclavonic tongue, the name of Paris Thlaba. Implied the great or illustrious city, says Anacomna. Alexiad, L7 p. 194. From its position between Mount Hemius and the lower Danube, it appears to fill the ground, or at least the station, of Martianopolis. The situation of Duros de Luz, or Dristra, is well known and conspicuous. Comment Academy Petropol Tom 9p 415-416 Danville, Geography on Sien Tom I.P. 307-311 71, Return, The Political Management of the Greeks, More especially with the Patsanassites, is explained in the seven first chapters, De Administratione Imperii. 72, Return, in the narrative of this war, Leo the Deacon, Apud. Page I, Ktidika, Tom. 4 AD 968-973, is more authentic and Circumstantial than Cedrinus, Tom 2 p. 660 to 683, and Zonaras. Tom 2 p. 205 to 214. These declaimers have multiplied to 308,000 and 330,000 men, those Russian forces, of which they 
contemporary had given a moderate and consistent account. Photius of Constantinople, a patriarch, whose ambition was equal to his curiosity, congratulates himself and the Greek church on the conversion of the Russians. 73 Those fierce and bloody barbarians had been persuaded, by the voice of reason and religion, to acknowledge Jesus for their God, the Christian missionaries for their teachers, and the Romans for their friends and brethren. His triumph was transient and premature. In the various fortune of their piratical adventures, some Russian chiefs might allow themselves to be sprinkled with the waters of baptism, and a Greek bishop, with the name of Metropolitan, might administer the sacraments in the church of Cayo, to a congregation of slaves and natives. But the seed of the gospel was sown on a barren soil, many were the apostates, the converts were few, and the baptism of Olga may be fixed as the era of Russian Christianity. 74 A female, perhaps of the basest origin, who could revenge the death, and assume the scepter, of her husband Igor, must have been endowed with those active virtues, which command the fear and obedience of barbarians. In a moment, of foreign and domestic peace, she sailed from Cayo to Constantinople, and the Emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus has described, with minute diligence, the ceremonial of her reception in his capital and palace. The steps, the titles, the salutations, the banquet, the presents, were exquisitely adjusted to gratify the vanity of the stranger, with due reverence to the superior majesty of the purple. 75 In the sacrament of baptism, she received the venerable name of the Empress Helena, and her conversion might be preceded or followed by her uncle, too. Interpreters, 16 damsels of a higher, and 18 of a lower rank, 22 domestics or ministers, and 44 Russian merchants, who composed the retinue of the great princess Olga. After her return to Kyo and Novogorod, she firmly persisted in her new religion, but her labors in the propagation of the gospel were not crowned with success, and both her family and nation adhered with obstinacy or indifference to the gods of their fathers. Her son Swatislaus was apprehensive of the scorn and ridicule of his companions, and her grandson Wolodomir devoted his youthful zeal to multiply and decorate the monuments of ancient worship. The savage deities of the north were still propitiated with human sacrifices, in the choice of the victim, a citizen was preferred to a stranger, a Christian to an idolater, and the father, who defended his son from the sacerdotal knife, was involved in the same doom by the rage of a fanatic tumult. Yet the lessons and example of the pious Olga had made a deep, though secret, impression in the minds of the prince and people. The Greek missionaries continued to preach, to dispute, and to baptize, and the ambassadors or merchants of Russia compared the idolatry of the woods with the elegant superstition of Constantinople. They had gazed with admiration on the Dome of Street. Sophia, the lively pictures of saints and martyrs, the riches of the altar, the number and vestments of the priests, the pomp and order of the ceremonies, they were edified by the alternate succession of devout silence and harmonious song, 
nor was it difficult to persuade them that a choir of angels descended each day from heaven to join in the devotion of the Christians. 76 But the conversion of Woladamir was determined, or hastened, by his desire of a Roman bride. At the same time, and in the city of Chersen, the rites of baptism and marriage were celebrated by the Christian pontiff, the city he restored to the Emperor Basil, the brother of his spouse, but the brazen gates were transported, as it is said, to Novogorod and erected before the first church as a trophy of his victory and faith. 77 At his despotic command, Perround, the god of thunder, whom he had so long adored, was dragged through the streets of Cayo, and twelve sturdy barbarians battered with clubs the misshapen image, which was indignantly cast into the waters of the Boris thence. The Edict of Woladamir had proclaimed that all who should refuse the rites of baptism would be treated as the enemies of God and their prince, and they Rivers were instantly filled with many thousands of obedient Russians, who acquiesced in the truth and excellence of a doctrine which had been embraced by the great duke and his boyars. In the next generation, the relics of paganism were finally extirpated, but as the two brothers of Woladamir had died without baptism, their bones were taken from the grave, and sanctified by an irregular and posthumous sacrament. 73. Return, Fought Epistle 2. Number 35, p. 58, Edit Montacut It was unworthy of the learning of the editor to mistake the Russian nation for a war cry of the Bulgarians, nor did it become the enlightened patriarch to accuse the Sclavonian idolaters. They were neither Greeks nor atheists. 74. Return, M. Levesque has extracted, from old chronicles and modern researches, the most satisfactory account of the religion of the Slavi and the conversion of Russia, History de Russie. Tom. IP 35-54, 59, 92, 92, 113-121, 124-129, 148-149, and C. 75, Return. See the Ceremoniali Ali Byzant, Tom 2 C. 15. p. 343-345, the style of Olga, or Elga. For the chief of barbarians the Greeks whimsically borrowed the title of an Athenian magistrate, with a female termination, which would have astonished the ear of Demosthenes. 76. Return, see an anonymous fragment published by Bandurai. Imperium Orientale, Tom 2 p. 112, 113, de converse Ioni. Rus Orum. 77. Return, Chersen, or Corson, is mentioned by Herber Stein. Apud page I Tom 4 p. 56 as the place of Woladomir's baptism and marriage, and both the tradition and the gates are still preserved at Novogorod. Yet an observing traveler transports the brazen gates from Magdeburg in Germany, Cox's travels into Russia, and C. Vol. IP 452, and quotes an inscription, which seems to justify his opinion. The modern reader must not confound 
this old Chersen of the Tauric or Crimean Peninsula, with a new city of the same name, which has arisen near the mouth of the Boris thence, and was lately honored by the memorable interview of the Empress of Russia with the Emperor of the West. In the 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries of the Christian era, the reign of the Gospel and of the Church was extended over Bulgaria, Hungary, Bohemia, Saxony, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Poland, and Russia. 78 The triumphs of apostolic zeal were repeated in the Iron Age of Christianity, and the northern and eastern regions of Europe submitted to a religion, more different in theory than in practice, from the worship of their native idols. A laudable ambition excited the monks both of Germany and Greece, to visit the tents and huts of the barbarians, poverty, hardships, and dangers, were the lot of the first missionaries. Their courage was active and patient, their motive pure and meritorious, their present reward consisted in the testimony of their conscience and the respect of a grateful people, but they fruitful harvest of their toils was inherited and enjoyed by the proud and wealthy prelates of succeeding times. The first conversions were free and spontaneous, a holy life and an eloquent tongue were the only arms of the missionaries, but the domestic fables of the pagans were silenced by the miracles and visions of the strangers, and the favorable temper of the chiefs was accelerated by the dictates of vanity and interest. The leaders of nations, who were saluted with the titles of kings and saints, 79 held it lawful and pious to impose the Catholic faith on their subjects and neighbors, the coast of the Baltic, from Holstein to the Gulf of Finland, was invaded under the standard of the cross, and the reign of idolatry was closed by the conversion of Lithuania in the 14th century. Yet truth and candor must acknowledge that the conversion of the North imparted many temporal benefits both to the old and the new Christians. The rage of war, inherent to the human species, could not be healed by the evangelic precepts of charity and peace, and the ambition of Catholic princes has renewed in every age the calamities of hostile contention. But the admission of the barbarians into the pale of civil and ecclesiastical society delivered Europe from the depredations, by sea and land, of the Normans, the Hungarians, and the Russians, who learn to spare their brethren and cultivate their possessions. 80 The establishment of law and order was promoted by the influence of the clergy, and the rudiments of art and science were introduced into the savage countries of the globe. The liberal piety of the Russian princes engaged in their service the most skillful of the Greeks, to decorate the cities and instruct the inhabitants, the dome and the paintings of street. Sophia were rudely copied in the churches of Kyo and Novogorod, the writings of the fathers were translated into the Sclavonic idiom, and three hundred noble Youths were invited or compelled to attend the lessons of the College of Yaroslaus. It should appear that Russia might have derived an early and rapid improvement from her peculiar connection with the church and state of Constantinople, which at that age so justly despised the ignorance of the Latins. But they Byzantine nation was servile, solitary, and verging to a hasty 
decline, after the fall of Kyo, the navigation of the Boris thence was forgotten, the great princes of Volodymyr and Moscow were separated from the sea and Christendom, and the divided monarchy was oppressed by the ignominy and blindness of Tartar servitude. 81 The Sclavonic and Scandinavian kingdoms, which had been converted by the Latin missionaries, were exposed. It is true, to the spiritual jurisdiction and temporal claims of the popes, 82 but they were united in language and religious worship, with each other, and with Rome, they imbibed the free and generous spirit of the European Republic, and gradually shared the light of knowledge which arose on the Western world. 78. Return, consult the Latin text, or English version, of Mosheim's excellent history of the Church, under the first head or section of each of these centuries. 79. Return, in the year 1000, the ambassadors of Street. Stephen received from Pope Sylvester the title of King of Hungary, with a diadem of Greek workmanship. It had been designed for the Duke of Poland, but the Poles, by their own confession, were yet too barbarous to deserve an angelical and apostolical crown. Katona History Critic Regum Sturpus Arpadiani, Tom I.P. 1 to 20. 80. Return, listen to the exaltations of Adam of Bremen, A.D. 1080, of which the substance is agreeable to truth, Echiilla. Ferocissima Danorum, N.C., Natio. Jamjadam Navit in D.E.I. Laudibus Alleluia Riso Nair. Echi Populus Isle Pyridicus. Suis nunc finibus conti use establish. Echi patria horribilis semper. Inaccessa proter cultum idol orum, predicatoris veritatis. Ubique cert autim admiti, and c, and c, de situ danii, and c, p. 40. 41, edit. Elsevier, a curious and original prospect of the North of Europe, and the introduction of Christianity. 81, return, the great princes removed in 1156 from Cairo, which was ruined by the Tartars in 1240. Moscow became the seat of empire in the Zivth century. See the first and two D volumes of Levesque's history, and Mr. Cox's travels into the North. Tom. I. P. 241, and C. 82, Return, The Ambassadors of Street. Stephen had used the reverential expressions of Regnum Oblatum, Debitam Obedientium, and C, which were most rigorously interpreted by Gregory VII, and the Hungarian Catholics are distressed between the sanctity of the Pope and the Independence of the Crown, Katona, History. Ktitika, Tom. I. P. 20-25, Tom. 2 P. 304, 346, 360, and C. Chapter LVI, The Saracens, The Franks and the Normans, Part I. The Saracens, Franks, and Greeks, in Italy, First Adventures and Settlement of the Normans, Character and Conquest of Robert Giscar, Duke of Apulia Deliverance of Sicily by his brother Roger, Victories of Robert over the Emperors of the East and West, Roger, King of Sicily, Invades Africa and Greece, the Emperor Manuel Comnus, Wars of the Greeks and Normans, Extinction of the Normans The Three Great Nations of the World, the Greeks, the Saracens 
and the Franks, encountered each other on the theatre of Italy. 1. The southern provinces, which now compose the Kingdom of Naples, were subject, for the most part, to the Lombard dukes and princes of Beneventum, two so powerful in war, that they checked for a moment the genius of Charlemagne, so liberal in peace, that they maintained in their capital an academy of thirty-two philosophers and grammarians. The division of this flourishing state produced the rival principalities of Benevento, Salerno, and Capua, and the thoughtless ambition or revenge of the competitors invited the Saracens to the ruin of their common inheritance. During a calamitous period of two hundred years, Italy was exposed to a repetition of wounds, which the invaders were not capable of healing by the union and tranquility of a perfect conquest. Their frequent and almost annual squadrons issued from the port of Palermo, and were entertained with too much indulgence by the Christians of Naples, the more formidable fleets were prepared on the African coast, and even the Arabs of Andalusia were sometimes tempted to assist or oppose the Moslems of an adverse section. In the revolution of human events, a new ambuscade was concealed in the cotton forks, the fields of Cannae were bedewed a second time with the blood of the Africans, and the sovereign of Rome again attacked or defended the walls of Capua and Tarentum. A colony of Saracens had been planted at Bari, which commands the entrance of the Adriatic Gulf, and their impartial depredations provoked the resentment, and conciliated the union of the two emperors. An offensive alliance was concluded between Basil the Macedonian, the first of his race, and Louis the great-grandson of Charlemagne, three and each party supplied the deficiencies of his associate. It would have been imprudent in the Byzantine monarch to transport his stationary troops of Asia to an Italian campaign, and the Latin arms would have been insufficient if his superior navy had not occupied the mouth of the Gulf. The Fortress of Bari was invested by the infantry of the Franks, and by the cavalry and galleys of the Greeks, and, after a defense of four years, the Arabian emir submitted to the clemency of Louis, who commanded in person the operations of the siege. This important conquest had been achieved by the concord of the east and west, but their recent amity was soon embittered by the mutual complaints of jealousy and pride. The Greeks assumed as their own the merit of the conquest and the pomp of the triumph, extolled the greatness of their powers, and affected to deride the intemperance and sloth of the handful of barbarians who appeared under the banners of the Carlovingian prince. His reply is expressed with the eloquence of indignation and truth, we confess the magnitude of your preparation, says the great-grandson of Charlemagne. Your armies were indeed as numerous as a cloud of summer locusts, who darken the day, flap their wings, and, after a short flight, tumble weary and breathless to the ground. Like them, ye sunk after a feeble effort, ye were vanquished by your own cowardice, and withdrew from the scene of action to injure and despoil our Christian subjects of the Sclavonian coast. We were few in number, and why were we few? Because, 
after a tedious expectation of your arrival, I had dismissed my host, and retained only a chosen band of warriors to continue the blockade of the city. If they indulged their hospitable feasts in the face of danger and death, did these feasts abate the vigor of their enterprise? Is it by your fasting that the walls of Bari have been overturned? Did not these valiant Franks, diminished as they were by languor and fatigue, intercept and vanish the three most powerful emirs of the Saracens? And did not their defeat precipitate the fall of the city? Bari is now fallen, Tarentum trembles, Calabria will be delivered, and, if we command the sea, the island of Sicily may be rescued from the hands of the infidels. My brother, Accelerate, a name most offensive to the vanity of the Greek. Accelerate your naval succors, respect your allies, and distrust your flatterers. 4. 1. Return, for the general history of Italy in the Ixth and Xth centuries, I may properly refer to the Vth, Vth, and Aeth books of Sico Neus di Regno Italiae, in the second volume of his works. Milan, 1732, The Annals of Barrow News, with the criticism of Pagi. The Aeth and Aedith books of the Astoria Civile del Regno di Napoli of Giannoni, the Aeth and Aedith volumes, the Octavo edition, of the Annali di Italia of Muratori, and the 2D volume of the Abrae Chronologic of M. D. Street. Mark a work which, under a superficial title, contains much genuine learning and industry. But my long-accustomed reader will give me credit for saying that I myself have ascended to the fountain head, as often as such ascent could be either profitable or possible, and that I have diligently turned over the originals in the first Volumes of Muratori's Great Collection of the Scriptores Rerum Italicarum 2. Return, Camillo Pellegrino, a learned Capuan of the last century, has illustrated the history of the Duchy of Beneventum. In his two books Historia Principum Longobardorum, in the Scriptores of Muratori Tom. 2 Pars I P 221 to 345 and Tom V P 159 to 245 3 Return C Constantin Porphyrogen D Thematibus L 2 C 11 in VIT Basil C 55 P. 181. 4. Return, the Oriental Epistle of the Emperor Louis II to the Emperor Basil, a curious record of the age, was first published by Barrow News, Annal. Ecclesiastes AD 871, No. 51 to 71, from the Vatican Ms. of Ur Chempert, or rather of the anonymous historian of Salerno. These lofty hopes were soon extinguished by the death of Louis, and the decay of the Carlovingian house, and whoever might deserve the honor, the Greek emperors, Basil, and his son Leo, secured the advantage, of the reduction of Bari. The Italians of Apulia and Calabria were persuaded or compelled to Acknowledge their supremacy, and an ideal line from Mount Garganus to the Bay of Salerno, leaves the far greater part of the Kingdom of Naples under the dominion of the Eastern Empire. 
Beyond that line, the dukes or republics of Amalfi V and Naples, who had never forfeited their voluntary allegiance, rejoiced in the neighborhood of their lawful sovereign, and Amalfi was enriched by supplying Europe with the produce and manufactures of Asia. But the Lombard princes of Benevento, Salerno, and Capua, VI, were reluctantly torn from the communion of the Latin world, and too often violated their oaths of servitude and tribute. The city of Bari rose to dignity and wealth, as the metropolis of the new theme or province of Lombardy, the title of patrician, and afterwards the singular name of Catapan, seven was assigned to the supreme governor, and the policy both of the church and state was modeled in exact subordination to the throne of Constantinople. As long as the scepter was disputed by the princes of Italy, their efforts were feeble and adverse, and the Greeks resisted or eluded the forces of Germany, which descended from the Alps under the imperial standard of the Othos, the first and greatest of those Saxon princes was compelled to relinquish the siege of Bari, the second, after the loss of his stoutest bishops and barons, escaped with honor from the bloody field of Crotona. On that day the scale of war was turned against the Franks by the valor of the Saracens. Eight these corsairs had indeed been driven by the Byzantine fleets from the fortresses and coasts of Italy, but a sense of interest was more prevalent than superstition or resentment, and the Caliph of Egypt had transported forty thousand Moslems to the aid of his Christian ally. The successors of Basil amused themselves with the belief that the conquest of Lombardy had been achieved, and was still preserved by the justice of their laws, the virtues of their ministers, and the gratitude of a people whom they had rescued from anarchy and oppression. A series of rebellions might dart a ray of truth into the palace of Constantinople, and the illusions of flattery were dispelled by the easy and rapid success of the Norman Adventurers. 5. Return, see an excellent dissertation de Republica. Amalfitana, in the appendix, p. 1 to 42, of Henry Brentman's Historia Pandectarum, Trajecti Adrenum, 1722, in Fortio. 6. Return, your master, says Nisphorus, has given aid and Protection print minibus capuano et beneventino, service mice, quos. Apugnare dispono. Nova, potius nota, residential est quad eorum. Patra et avi nostro imperio tributa deed runt, liut prand, in. Legat. p. 484. Salerno is not mentioned yet the prince changed his party about the same time, and Camillo Pellegrino, scripture. Rare. Italian Tom. 2 Pars I P 285, has nicely discerned this. Change in the style of the anonymous chronicle. On the rational. Ground of history and language, Lyot Prand, P 480 had asserted the Latin claim to Apulia and Calabria. 7. Return, see the Greek and Latin glossaries of Ducange. Catapanus, and his notes on the Alexias, p. 275. Against the contemporary notion, which derives it from juxta omni, he treats it as a corruption of the Latin capit news. Yet M. D. Street. 
Mark has accurately observed, a break chronologic, Tom 2 p. 924. That in this age the Capitanii were not captains, but only nobles. Of the first rank, the great Valvasors of Italy. 8. Return, the Lombards, Leon. Tactic. C. 15. P. 741. The. Little Chronicle of Beneventum, Tom 2 Pars I P 280, gives a far different character of the Greeks during the five years, A.D. 891-896, that Leo was master of the city. The revolution of human affairs had produced in Apulia and Calabria a melancholy contrast between the age of Pythagoras and the 10th century of the Christian era. At the former period, the coast of Great Greece, as it was then styled, was planted. With free and opulent cities, these cities were peopled with soldiers, artists and philosophers, and the military strength of Tarentum, Sybaris, or Crotona, was not inferior to that of a powerful kingdom. At the Second Era, these once flourishing provinces were clouded with ignorance impoverished by tyranny and depopulated by barbarian war, nor can we severely accuse the exaggeration of a contemporary, that a fair and ample district was reduced to the same desolation which had covered the earth. After the general deluge, Nine among the hostilities of the Arabs, the Franks, and the Greeks, in the southern Italy, I shall select two or three anecdotes expressive of their national manners. 1. It was the amusement of the Saracens to profane, as well as to pillage, the monasteries and churches. At the siege of Salerno, a Musulman chief spread his couch on the communion table, and on that altar sacrificed each night the virginity of a Christian. None. As he wrestled with a reluctant maid, a beam in the roof was accidentally or dexterously thrown down on his head, and the death of the lustful emir was imputed to the wrath of Christ which was at length awakened to the defense of his faithful spouse. 10 2. The Saracens besieged the cities of Beneventum and Capua, after a vain appeal to the successors of Charlemagne, the Lombards implored the clemency and aid of the Greek emperor. 11 a. Fearless citizen dropped from the walls, past the Int arrangements, accomplished his commission, and fell into the hands of the barbarians as he was returning with the welcome news. They commanded him to assist their enterprise, and deceive his countrymen, with the assurance that wealth and honors should be the reward of his falsehood, and that his sincerity would be punished with immediate death. He affected to yield, but as soon as he was conducted within hearing of the Christians on the rampart, friends and brethren, he cried with a loud voice, Be bold and patient, maintain the city, your sovereign is informed of your distress, and your deliverers are at hand. I know my doom and commit my wife and children to your gratitude. The rage of the Arabs confirmed his evidence, and the self-devoted patriot was transpierced with a hundred spears. He deserves to live in the memory of the virtuous, but the repetition of the same story in ancient and modern times may sprinkle some doubts on the reality of this generous deed. 12.3. The recital of a 
Third incident may provoke a smile amidst the horrors of war. Theobald, Marquis of Camerino and Spoleto, 13 supported the rebels of Beneventum, and his wanton cruelty was not incompatible in that age with the character of a hero. His captives of the Greek nation or party were castrated without mercy, and they Outrage was aggravated by a cruel jest, that he wished to present the emperor with a supply of eunuchs, the most precious ornaments of the Byzantine court. The garrison of a castle had been defeated in a sally, and the prisoners were sentenced to the customary operation. But the sacrifice was disturbed by the Intrusion of a frantic female, who, with bleeding cheeks, disheveled hair, and importunate clamors, compelled the Marquis to listen to her complaint. Is it thus, she cried, yeah. Magnanimous heroes, that ye yeah wage war against women, against women, who have never injured ye, yeah, and whose only arms are the distaff and the loom. Theobald denied the charge, and protested that since the Amazons, he had never heard of a female war. And how? She furiously exclaimed, Can you attack us more directly, how? Can you wound us in a more vital part, than by robbing our husbands of what we most dearly cherish, the source of our joys, and the hope of our posterity? The plunder of our flocks and herds I have endured without a murmur, but this fatal injury, this irreparable loss, subdues my patience, and calls aloud on the justice of heaven and earth. A general laugh applauded her eloquence, the savage Franks, inaccessible to pity, were moved by her ridiculous, yet rational despair and with the deliverance of the captives, she obtained the restitution of her effects. As she returned in triumph to the castle, she was overtaken by a messenger, to inquire, in the name of Theobald, what punishment should be inflicted on her husband, were he again taken in arms. Should such, she answered without hesitation, be his guilt and misfortune, he has eyes, and a nose, and hands, and feet. These are his own, and these he may deserve to forfeit by his personal offenses. But let my lord be pleased to spare what his little handmaid presumes to claim as her peculiar and lawful property. 14. 9. Return. Calabriam adiant, imc inter se divisam. Reperience fundi t us depopulati sunt, or depopularunt, eta ut. Deserta sit violut in dilubio. Such is the text of her empert, or urchempert, according to the two editions of Caraxiali, rare. Italic. Scripture Tom. V. P. 23, and of Camillo Pellegrino, Tom. 2. Pars I. P. 246. Both were extremely scarce, when they were reprinted by Muratori. 10. Return, Baronius, Annal. Ecclesiastes A.D. 874, Number 2, has drawn this story from a Ms. of Urchempert, who died at Capua only 15 years after the event. But the cardinal was deceived by a false title, and we can only quote the anonymous chronicle of Salerno, Paralipomena, c. 110, composed towards the end of the XTH century, and published in the second volume of Muratori's collection. See the dissertations of Camillo Pellegrino, Tom.
2. Pars I P 231 to 281, and C. 11. Return, Constantine Porphyrogenitus, in VIT. Basil. C. 58. P. 183, is the original author of this story. He places it under the reigns of Basil and Louis II, yet the reduction of Beneventum by the Greeks is dated AD 891, after the decease of both of those princes. 12. Return, in the year 663, the same tragedy is described by Paul the Deacon, D. Justice Langobard, LVC, 7, 8, p. 870. 871, edit. Grot, under the walls of the same city of Beneventum. But the actors are different, and the guilt is imputed to the Greeks themselves, which in the Byzantine edition is applied to the Saracens. In the late war in Germany, M. Diasas, a French officer of the regiment of Auvergne, is said to have devoted himself in a similar manner. His behavior is the more heroic, as mere silence was required by the enemy who had made him prisoner, Voltaire, Siecle de Louis 15 c. 33, Tom 9. P. 172. 13. Return, Theobald, who is styled Heroes by Lyotprand, was properly Duke of Spoleto and Marquis of Camerino, from the year 926 to 935. The title and office of Marquis, commander of the March or Frontier, was introduced into Italy by the French. Emperors, a break chronologic, Tom 2 p. 545 to 732 nc. 14, Return, Lyot Prand, History L. 4 c. 4 in the Rerum Italic. Scripture Tom. I. Pars I p. 453, 454. Should the licentiousness of the tale be questioned, I may exclaim, with poor stern, that it is hard if I may not transcribe with caution what a bishop could write without scruple what if I had translated, ut virus cert etis, testiculos amputare, in quibus nostri corporis refossilatio. And c. The establishment of the Normans in the kingdoms of Naples and Sicily 15 is an event most romantic in its origin, and in its consequences most important both to Italy and the Eastern Empire. The broken provinces of the Greeks, Lombards and Saracens, were exposed to every invader, and every sea and land were invaded by the adventurous spirit of the Scandinavian pirates. After a long Indulgence of rapine and slaughter, a fair and ample territory was accepted, occupied, and named, by the Normans of France, they renounced their gods for the god of the Christians, 16 and they Dukes of Normandy acknowledged themselves the vassals of the successors of Charlemagne and Capet. The savage fierceness which they had brought from the snowy mountains of Norway was refined. Without being corrupted, in a warmer climate, the companions of Rollo insensibly mingled with the natives, they imbibed the manners, language, seventeen and gallantry, of the French nation, and in a martial age, the Normans might claim the palm of valor and glorious achievements. Of the fashionable superstitions, they embraced with ardor the pilgrimages of Rome, Italy, and the Holy Land. 
171 in this active devotion, the minds and bodies were invigorated by exercise, danger was the incentive, novelty the recompense, and the prospect of the world was decorated by wonder, credulity, and ambitious hope. They confederated for their mutual defense, and the robbers of the Alps, who had been allured by the garb of a pilgrim, were often chastised by the arm of a warrior. In one of these pious visits to the cavern of Mount Garganus in Apulia, which had been sanctified by the apparition of the Archangel Michael, 18 they were accosted by a stranger in the Greek habit, but who soon revealed himself as a rebel, a fugitive, and a mortal foe of the Greek Empire. His name was Melo, a noble citizen of Bari, who, after an unsuccessful revolt, was compelled to seek new allies and avengers of his country. The bold appearance of the Normans revived his hopes and solicited his confidence, they listened to the complaints, and still more, to the promises, of the patriot. The assurance of wealth demonstrated the justice of his cause, and they viewed, as the inheritance of the brave, the fruitful land which was oppressed by effeminate tyrants. On their return to Normandy, they kindled a spark of enterprise, and a small but intrepid band was freely associated for the deliverance of Apulia. They passed the Alps by separate roads, and in the disguise of pilgrims, but in the neighborhood of Rome they were saluted by the chief of Bari, who supplied the more indigent with arms and horses, and instantly led them to the field of action. In the first conflict, their valor prevailed, but in the second engagement they were overwhelmed by the numbers and military engines of the Greeks, and indignantly retreated with their faces to the enemy. 1811 The unfortunate Mello ended his life a suppliant at the court of Germany, his Norman followers, excluded from their native end. Their promised land, wandered among the hills and valleys of Italy, and earned their daily subsistence by the sword. To that formidable sword the princes of Capua, Beneventum, Salerno, and Naples, alternately appealed in their domestic quarrels, the superior spirit and discipline of the Normans gave victory to the side which they espoused, and their cautious policy observed the balance of power, lest the preponderance of any rival state should render their aid less important, and their service less profitable. Their first asylum was a strong camp in the depth of the marshes of Campania, but they were soon endowed by the liberality of the Duke of Naples with a more plentiful and permanent seat. Eight miles from his residence, as a bulwark. Against Capua, the town of Aversa was built and fortified for their use, and they enjoyed as their own the corn and fruits, the meadows and groves, of that fertile district. The report of their Success attracted every year new swarms of pilgrims and soldiers. The poor were urged by necessity, the rich were excited by hope, and the brave and active spirits of Normandy were impatient of ease and ambitious of renown. The independent standard of Aversa afforded shelter and encouragement to the outlaws of the province, to every fugitive who had escaped from the injustice or justice of his superiors, and these foreign associates were quickly assimilated in manners and language to the Gallic colony. 
The first leader of the Normans was Count Reynulf, and, in the origin of society, preeminence of rank is the reward and the proof of superior merit. 191911. 15. Return. The original monuments of the Normans in Italy are collected in the VTH volume of Muratori, and among these we may Distinguish the poems of William Apulus, p. 245-278, and the History of Gaffridus, Geoffrey, Malaterra, p. 537-607. Both were natives of France, but they wrote on the spot, in the age of the first conquerors, before AD 1100, and with the spirit of Freeman. It is needless to recapitulate the compilers and critics of Italian history, Sico News, Baro News, Pagi, Giannoni, Muratori. Street. Mark, N.C., whom I have always consulted, and never copied. Asterisk. Note, M. Gautier Dark has discovered a translation of the Chronicle of a May, Monk of Mont Cassino, a contemporary of the First Norman Invaders of Italy. He has made use of it in his Histoire de Conquest des Normans, and added a summary of its contents. This work was quoted by later writers, but was supposed to have been entirely lost. M. 16. Return. Some of the first converts were baptized ten or twelve times, for the sake of the white garment usually given it. This ceremony At the funeral of Rollo, the gifts to monasteries for the repose of his soul were accompanied by a sacrifice of one hundred captives. But in a generation or two, the national change was pure and general. 17. Return, the Danish language was still spoken by the Normans of Bayou on the sea coast, at a time, AD 940, when it was already forgotten at Rouen, in the court and capital. Quem. Richard I. Confistim Pater Biocosmitans Botani Militiae Sui. Principi nutriendum tradidit, ut, ibi lingua eruditis danica. Suis exteris hominibus siret apert der responsa, Wilhelm. Gemita sensis titosibus normanis, l. 3. c. 8, p. 623, edit. Camden. Of the vernacular and favorite idiom of William the Conqueror. A.D. 1035, Selden, Opera, Tom 2 p. 1640-1656, has given a specimen, obsolete and obscure even to antiquarians and lawyers. 171, Return, a band of Normans returning from the Holy Land had rescued the city of Salerno from the attack of a numerous fleet, of Saracens. Gainer, the Lombard prince of Salerno wished to retain them in his service and take them into his pay. They answered, We fight for our religion, and not for money. Gamer entreated them to send some Norman knights to his court. This seems to have been the origin of the connection of the Normans with Italy. See Histoire de Conquest de Normans par Gautier. Dark, L.I.C.I., Paris, 1830-M. 18, Return, see Leandro Alberti, Discrezion d'Italia, p. 250. And Barrow News, A.D. 493, number 43. If the Archangel inherited the Temple and Oracle, perhaps the cavern, 
of old cultures the soothsayer strab geograph l 6 p 435 436 the catholics on this occasion have surpassed the greeks in the elegance of their superstition 1811 return nine out of ten perished in the field chronique dma tom ip 21 quoted by m gaudier dark p 42 m 19 return see the first book of william Apulus. his words are applicable to every swarm of barbarians and freebooters si vicinorum quis perniciosus ad illos confugibit eum grat anter sisi pebant moribus et lingua quascumc veniri vidi bent informant propria gens officiator ut una and elsewhere of the native adventurers of normandy pars parrot exigui vel opes adderant chia nulli pars Kia de Magnus Majora sub Ire Vol Bent. 1911, return, this account is not accurate. After the retreat of the Emperor Henry II, the Normans, united under the command of Reynolf, had taken possession of Aversa, then a small castle in the Duchy of Naples. They had been masters of it a few years when Pandulf IV, Prince of Capua, found means to take Naples by surprise. Sergius, master of the soldiers, and head of the Republic, with the principal citizens, abandoned a city in which he could not behold, without horror, the establishment of a foreign dominion he retired to Aversa, and when, with the assistance of the Greeks and that of the citizens faithful to their country, he had collected money enough to satisfy the rapacity of the Norman adventurers, he advanced at their head to attack the garrison of the Prince of Capua, defeated it, and re-entered Naples. It was then that he confirmed the Normans in the possession of Aversa and its territory, which he raised into a count's fief, and granted the investiture to Reynolf. History Day Republic Italian Tom I.P. 267 Since the conquest of Sicily by the Arabs, the Grecian emperors had been anxious to regain that valuable possession, but there Efforts, however strenuous, had been opposed by the distance and the sea. Their costly armaments, after a gleam of success, added new pages of calamity and disgrace to the Byzantine annals. Twenty thousand of their best troops were lost in a single expedition, and the victorious Moslems derided the policy of a nation which entrusted eunuchs not only with the custody of their women, but with the command of their men twenty after a reign of two hundred years, the Saracens were ruined by their divisions. 21. The Emir disclaimed the authority of the King of Tunis, the people rose against the Emir, the cities were usurped by the chiefs, each meaner rebel was independent in his village or castle, and the weaker of two rival brothers implored the friendship of the Christians. In every service of danger they Normans were prompt and useful, and five hundred knights, or warriors on horseback, were enrolled by Arduin, the agent and interpreter of the Greeks under the standard of Manius's governor of Lombardy. Before their landing, the brothers were reconciled, the union of Sicily and Africa was restored, and they 
Island was guarded to the water's edge. The Normans led the van. And the Arabs of Messina felt the valor of an untried foe. In a second action the emir of Syracuse was unhorsed and transpierced by the iron arm of William of Hauteville. In a third engagement, his intrepid companions discomfited the host of sixty thousand Saracens, and left the Greeks no more than the labor of the pursuit, a splendid victory, but of which the pen of the historian may divide the merit with the lance of the Normans. It is, however, true, that they essentially promoted the success of Maniuses, who reduced thirteen cities, and the greater part of Sicily, under the obedience of the emperor. But his military fame was sullied by ingratitude and tyranny. In the division of the spoils, the deserts of his brave auxiliaries were forgotten, and neither their avarice nor their pride could brook this injurious treatment. They complained by the mouth of their interpreter. Their complaint was disregarded, their interpreter was scourged. The sufferings were his, the insult and resentment belonged to those whose sentiments he had delivered. Yet they dissembled till they had obtained, or stolen, a safe passage to the Italian continent, their brethren of Aversas sympathized in their indignation, and the province of Apulia was invaded as the forfeit of the debt. Twenty-two above twenty years after the first emigration, the Normans took the field with no more than seven hundred horse and five hundred foot, and after the recall of the Byzantine legions twenty-three from the Sicilian War, their numbers are magnified to the amount of threescore thousand men. Their herald proposed the option of battle or retreat, of battle, was the unanimous cry of the Normans, and one of their stoutest warriors. With a stroke of his fist, felled to the ground the horse of the Greek messenger. He was dismissed with a fresh horse, the insult was concealed from the imperial troops, but in two successive battles they were more fatally instructed of the prowess of their adversaries. In the plains of Cannae, the Asiatics fled before the adventurers of France, the Duke of Lombardy was made prisoner, the Apulians acquiesced in a new dominion, and the four places of Bari, Otranto, Brungisum and Tarentum, were alone, saved in the shipwreck of the Grecian fortunes. From this era we may date the establishment of the Norman power, which soon eclipsed the infant colony of Aversa. Twelve counts twenty-four were chosen by the popular suffrage, and age, birth and merit, were the motives of their choice. The tributes of their peculiar districts were appropriated to their use, and each count erected a fortress in the midst of his lands, and at the head of his vassals. In the center of the province, the common habitation of Melfi was reserved as the metropolis and citadel of the Republic, a house and separate quarter was allotted to each of the twelve counts, and the national concerns were regulated by this military senate. The first of his peers, their president and general, was entitled Count of Apulia, and this dignity was conferred on William of the Iron Arm, who, in the language of the age, is styled a lion in battle, a lamb in society, and an angel. In council, 25 the manners of his countrymen are fairly 
delineated by a contemporary and national historian. 26. The Normans, says Malaterra, are a cunning and revengeful people. Eloquence and dissimulation appear to be their hereditary qualities, they can stoop to flatter, but unless they are curbed by the restraint of law, they indulge the licentiousness of nature and passion. Their princes affect the praises of popular munificence, the people observe the medium, or rather blonde they extremes of avarice and prodigality, and in their eager thirst of wealth and dominion, they despise whatever they possess, and hope whatever they desire. Arms and horses, the luxury of dress, the exercises of hunting and hawking 27 are the delight of the Normans, but, on pressing occasions, they can endure with Incredible patience the inclemency of every climate, and the toil. An absence of a military life. 28. 20. Return, Lyud Prand, in Legatione, p. 485. Page I has illustrated this event from the Miss History of the Deacon Leo. Tom, 4. AD 965. No 17 to 19. 21. Return, see the Arabian Chronicle of Sicily, Apud Muratori. Scripture. Rerum Italian Tom. I. P. 253. 22. Return, Geoffrey Malaterra, who relates the Sicilian War. And the Conquest of Apulia, L.I.C. 7, 8. 9, 19. The same. Events are described by Cedrinus, Tom 2 p. 741 to 743, 755, 756. And Zonaras, Tom 2 p. 237, 238, and the Greeks are so hardened to disgrace that their narratives are impartial. Enough. 23. Return, Lydia, consult Constantine de Thematibus, I. 3, 4. With Delisle's map. 24. Return, omnes conveniant, et bis sex nobili ors. Quos genus et gravitas morum de corabat et itis. Elegira duces. Proof CTIs ad comitatum. His alii parent. Comitatus nomen honoris. Quo donin ter erat. Hi totas undicteris. Divisir sibi, nisors inimica repugnant. Singula proponent loca quae contingere sort. Quicque duci debent, et quic tributa locorum. And after speaking of Melfi, William Apulus adds, Pro numero comitum bis sex statuare platias. At domus comitum totidem fabricantur in ab. Leo Ostensis, L2C 67, enumerates the divisions of the Apulian cities, which it is needless to repeat. 25. Return, Gilliam. Apulus, L. 2. C. 12, according to the Reference of Giannoni, Historia Civile di Napoli, Tom 2 p. 31, which I cannot verify in the original. The Apulian praises. Indeed his Validas Vires, Probitas Animi, and Vivita Virtus, and declares that, had he lived, no poet could have equaled his merits, L.I.P. 258, L.2.P. 259. He was bewailed by the Normans, quip qui tanti concilii virum, says Malaterra, L.I. C. 12, P. 552, Tam armis strenuum, 
tem sibi munificum. Affabilum, marigeratum, ulterius se habira defi debant. 26. Return, the gens astutissima, injuriarum ultrix. Agilari. Sciences. Eloquentius inservines, of Malaterra, LIC 3, p. 550, are expressive of the popular and proverbial character of the Normans. 27. Return, the hunting and hawking more properly belong to the descendants of the Norwegian sailors, though they might import from Norway and Iceland the finest casts of falcons. 28. Return, we may compare this portrait with that of William of Malmesbury, D. Justice Anglerum, L. 3 p. 101, 102, who appreciates, like a philosophic historian, the vices and virtues of the Saxons and Normans. England was assuredly a gainer by the conquest. Chapter LVI the Saracens, the Franks and the Normans Part 2 The Normans of Apulia were seated on the verge of the two empires, and, according to the policy of the hour, they accepted the investiture of their lands, from the sovereigns of Germany or Constantinople. But the firmest title of these adventurers was the right of conquest, they neither loved nor trusted, they were neither trusted nor beloved, the contempt of the princes was mixed with fear, and the fear of the natives was mingled with hatred and resentment. Every object of desire, a horse, a woman, a garden, tempted and gratified the rapaciousness of the strangers, 29 and the avarice of their chiefs was only colored by the more specious names of ambition and glory. The twelve counts were sometimes joined in the League of Injustice, in their domestic quarrels they disputed the spoils of the people, the virtues of William were buried in his grave, and Drogo, his brother and successor, was better qualified to lead the valor than to restrain the violence of his peers. Under the reign of Constantine Monomachus, the policy, rather than benevolence, of the Byzantine court attempted to relieve Italy from this adherent mischief, more grievous than a flight of barbarians, 30. And Argyrus, the son of Melo, was invested for this purpose with the most lofty titles 31 and the most ample commission. The memory of his father might recommend him to the Normans, and he had already engaged their voluntary service to quell the revolt of maniuses, and to avenge their own and the public injury. It was the design of Constantine to transplant the warlike colony from the Italian provinces to the Persian War, and the son of Mello distributed among the chiefs the gold and manufactures of Greece, as the first fruits of the imperial bounty. But his arts were baffled by the sense and spirit of the conquerors of Apulia. His gifts, or at least his proposals, were rejected, and they unanimously refused to relinquish their possessions and their hopes for the distant prospect of Asiatic fortune. After the means of persuasion had failed, Argyrus resolved to compel or to destroy, the Latin powers were solicited against the common enemy and an offensive alliance was formed of the Pope and the two emperors of the East and West. The throne of Street Peter was occupied by Leo IX, a simple saint, 32 of a temper most apt to deceive himself and the world, 
and whose venerable character would consecrate with the name of piety the measures least compatible with the practice of religion. His humanity was affected by the complaints, perhaps the calumnies, of an injured people, the impious Normans had interrupted the payment of tithes, and the temporal sword might be lawfully unsheathed against the sacrilegious robbers, who were deaf to the censures of the church. As a German of noble birth and royal kindred, Leo had free access to the court and confidence of the Emperor Henry III, and in search of arms and allies, his ardent zeal transported him from Apulia to Saxony, from the Elbe to the Tiber. During these hostile preparations, Argyrus indulged himself in the use of secret and guilty weapons, a crowd of Normans became the victims of public or private revenge, and the valiant Drogo was murdered in a church. But his spirit survived in his brother Humphrey, the third count of Apulia. The assassins were chastised, and the son of Mello, overthrown and wounded, was driven from the field, to hide his shame behind the walls of Bari, and to await the tardy succor of his allies. 29. Return, the biographer of Street. Leo IX. Pours his holy venom on the Normans. Videns in disciplinatum et alienum gentum. Norman norum, crudely et in audit arabi, et plus quam pagana. Impiatate, adversus ecclesias dei in surgery, passim Christianos. Trucidere, and c. Wybert, c. 6. The Honest Apollyon, L2p. 259, says calmly of their accuser, varies commissions fallacia. 30, return, the policy of the Greeks, revolt of maniuses, and c. Must be collected from Cedrinus, Tom 2p, 757, 758, William. Apulus, LIP 257, 258, L2P 259, and the two. Chronicles of Bari, by Lupus Protos Bata, Muratori, Scripture Italian. Tom. V. P. 42, 43, 44, and an anonymous writer, Antiquitat. Italii Medii Evi, Tom. I. P. 31 to 35. This last is a fragment of some value. 31. Return, Argyrus received, says the anonymous chronicle of Bari, Imperial Letters. Fodor et us et patrici et us et catapani et vest et us. In his annals, Muratori, Tom 8 p. 426, very properly reads, or interprets, Seve status, the title of Sebastos, or Augustus. But in his antiquities, he was taught by Dukenge to make it a palatine office, master of the wardrobe. 32, Return, A Life of Street. Leo IX, deeply tinged with the passions and prejudices of the age, has been composed by Wybert. Printed at Paris, 1615, in octavo, and since inserted in the collections of the Bollandists of Mabillon and of Muratori. The public and private history of that pope is diligently treated by M. D. Street Mark Abrague, Tom 2 p. 140-210, and p. 25-95 Second Column But the power of Constantine was distracted by a Turkish war, they 
mind of Henry was feeble and irresolute, and the Pope, instead of repassing the Alps with a German army, was accompanied only by a guard of 700 Swabians and some volunteers of Lorraine. In his long progress from Mantua to Beneventum, a vile end, promiscuous multitude of Italians was enlisted under the Holy Standard, 33 the priest and the robber slept in the same tent. The pikes and crosses were intermingled in the front, and they Marshal Saint repeated the lessons of his youth in the order of March, of encampment, and of combat. The Normans of Apulia could muster in the field no more than three thousand horse, with a handful of infantry, the defection of the natives intercepted their provisions and retreat, and their spirit, incapable of fear was chilled for a moment by superstitious awe. On the hostile approach of Leo, they knelt without disgrace or reluctance before their spiritual father. But the Pope was inexorable, his lofty Germans affected to deride the diminutive stature of their adversaries, and the Normans were informed that death or exile was their only alternative flight they disdained. And, as many of them had been three days without tasting food, they embraced the assurance of a more easy and honorable death. They climbed the hill of Civitella, descended into the plain, and charged in three divisions the army of the Pope. On the left, and in the center, Richard Count of Aversa, and Robert the Famous. Giscar, attacked, broke, rooted, and pursued the Italian multitudes, who fought without discipline, and fled without shame. A harder trial was reserved for the valor of Count Humphrey, who led the cavalry of the right wing. The Germans 34 have been described as unskillful in the management of the horse and the lance, but on foot they formed a strong and impenetrable phalanx, and neither man, nor steed, nor armor, could resist the weight of their long and two-handed swords. After a severe conflict, they were encompassed by the squadrons returning from the pursuit, and died in the ranks with the esteem of their foes and the satisfaction of revenge. The gates of Civitella were shut against the flying Pope, and he was overtaken by the pious conquerors, who kissed his feet, to implore his blessing and the absolution of their sinful victory. The soldiers beheld in their enemy and captive the Vicar of Christ, and, though we may suppose, the policy of the chiefs, it is probable that they were infected by the popular superstition. In the calm of retirement, the well-meaning Pope deplored the effusion of Christian blood, which must be imputed to his account, he felt, that he had been the author of sin and scandal, and as his undertaking had failed, the Indecency of his military character was universally condemned. 35. With these dispositions, he listened to the offers of a beneficial treaty, deserted an alliance which he had preached as the cause of God, and ratified the past and future conquests of the Normans. By whatever hands they had been usurped, they Provinces of Apulia and Calabria were a part of the donation of Constantine and the patrimony of Street Peter, the Grant and the Acceptance confirmed the mutual claims of the Pontiff and the Adventurers They promised to support each other with spiritual and temporal arms, a tribute or quit rent of twelve pence was 
afterwards stipulated for every plough land, and since this memorable transaction, the Kingdom of Naples has remained above 700 years a fief of the Holy See. 36. 33. Return, see the expedition of Leo XI against the Normans. See William Apulus, L2P 259-261, and Geoffrey Malaterra, L. I, C 13, 14, 15, P 253. They are impartial, as the national is. Counterbalanced by the clerical prejudice. 34. Return, to Tonisai, Chiacaiseris et forma decoros. Fisarata grigi prasiri corporis illos. Corpora de redent norman nica quae brevura. Esiva debenter. The verses of the Apulian are commonly in this strain, though he heats himself a little in the battle. Two of his similes from Hawking and sorcery are descriptive of manners. 35. Return, several respectable censures or complaints are produced by M. D. Street. Mark, Tom 2p 200-204. As Peter Damianus, the oracle of the times, has denied the popes the right of making war, the hermit, Lugens Aramai in Cola, is arraigned by the Cardinal, and Baronius, Annal. Ecclesiastes AD 1053, No 10-17. Most strenuously asserts the two swords of street. Peter. 36, Return, the origin and nature of the papal investitures are Ably discussed by Giannoni, Historia Civile di Napoli, Tom, 2. p. 37-49, 57-66, as a lawyer and antiquarian. Yet he vainly strives to reconcile the duties of patriot and Catholic, adopts an empty distinction of Ecclesia Romana non didit, said except it and shrinks from an honest but dangerous confession of the truth. The pedigree of Robert of Giscar 37 is variously deduced from the peasants and the dukes of Normandy, from the peasants, by the pride and ignorance of a Grecian princess, 38 from the dukes, by the ignorance and flattery of the Italian subjects. 39 his Genuine descent may be ascribed to the second or middle order of private nobility. 40. He sprang from a race of Valvasers or Bannerets, of the Diocese of Coudences, in the Lower Normandy. The castle of Hauteville was their honorable seat, his father. Tancred was conspicuous in the court and army of the Duke, and his military service was furnished by ten soldiers or knights. Two marriages, of a rank not unworthy of his own, made him the father of twelve sons, who were educated at home by the impartial tenderness of his second wife. But a narrow patrimony was insufficient for this numerous and daring progeny, they saw around the neighborhood the mischiefs of poverty and discord, and resolved to seek in foreign wars a more glorious inheritance. 2. Only remained to perpetuate the race, and cherish their father's age, their ten brothers, as they successfully attained the vigor of manhood, departed from the castle, passed the Alps, and joined the Apulian camp of the Normans. The elder were prompted by native spirit, their success encouraged their younger brethren. And the three first in seniority, William, Drogo, and Humphrey, deserved to be the chiefs of their nation and the founders of the new republic. 
Robert was the eldest of the seven sons of the second marriage, and even the reluctant praise of his foes has endowed him with the heroic qualities of a soldier and a statesman. His lofty stature surpassed the tallest of his army. His limbs were cast in the true proportion of strength and gracefulness, and to the decline of life, he maintained the patient vigor of health and the commanding dignity of his form. His complexion was ruddy, his shoulders were broad, his hair and beard were long and of a flaxen color, his eyes sparkled with fire, and his voice, like that of Achilles, could impress obedience and terror amidst the tumult of battle. In the ruder ages of chivalry, such qualifications are not below the notice of the poet or historians, they may observe that Robert, at once, and with equal dexterity, could wield in the right hand his sword, his lance in the left, that in the battle of Civitella he was thrice unhorsed, and that in the close of that memorable day, he was adjudged to have borne away the prize of valor from the warriors of the two armies. 41 His boundless ambition was founded on the consciousness of superior worth, in the pursuit of greatness, he was never arrested by the scruples of justice, and seldom moved by the feelings of humanity, though not insensible. Of fame, the choice of open or clandestine means was determined only by his present advantage. The surname of Giscar 42 was applied to this master of political wisdom, which is too often confounded with the practice of dissimulation and deceit, and Robert is praised by the Apollyon poet for excelling the cunning of Ulysses and the eloquence of Cicero. Yet these arts were disguised by an appearance of military frankness, in his highest fortune, he was accessible and courteous to his fellow soldiers. And while he indulged the prejudices of his new subjects, he affected in his dress and manners to maintain the ancient fashion of his country. He grasped with a rapacious, that he might distribute with a liberal hand, his primitive indigence had taught the habits of frugality, the gain of a merchant was not below his attention, and his prisoners were tortured with slow and unfeeling cruelty, to force a discovery of their secret treasure. According to the Greeks, he departed from Normandy with only five followers on horseback and thirty on foot, yet even this allowance appears too bountiful, the sixth son of Tancred of Hauteville passed the Alps as a pilgrim, and his first military band was levied among the adventurers of Italy. His brothers and countrymen had divided the fertile lands of Apulia, but they guarded their shares with the jealousy of avarice, the aspiring youth was driven forwards to the mountains of Calabria, and in his first exploits against the Greeks and the natives, it is not easy to discriminate the hero from the robber. To surprise a castle or a convent, to ensnare a wealthy citizen, to plunder the adjacent villages for necessary food, were the obscure labors which formed and exercised the powers of his mind and body. The Volunteers of Normandy adhered to his standard, and, under his command, the peasants of Calabria assumed the name and character of Normans. 37. Return, the birth, character, and first actions of Robert Giscar, may be found in Geoffrey Malaterra, L.I.C. 3, 4, 11. 
16, 17, 18, 38, 39, 40, William Apulus, L2P 260-262. William Gemit Ascensus, or of Jumiegis, L11C 30, P 663-664. Edit. Camden, and Anacomna, Alexiad, LIP 23-27, L6. P 165, 166, with the annotations of Duckenge, not in Alexiad. P 230-232, 320, who has swept all the French and Latin. Chronicles for Supplemental Intelligence. 38, Return, A Greek Corruption, and Elsewhere, L4P. 84. Anacomna was born in the purple, yet her father was no more than a private though illustrious subject, who raised himself to the empire. 39, Return, Gianoni, Tom, 2P2, forgets all his original authors, and rests this princely descent on the credit of in Vagues, an Augustine monk of Palermo in the last century. They continue the succession of dukes from Rollo to William II. They bastard or conqueror, whom they hold, communement sitn, to be the father of Tancred of Hauteville, a most strange end. Stupendous blunder. The sons of Tancred fought in Apulia, before William II was three years old, AD 1037. 40. Return, the judgment of Duckange is just and moderate, cert. Humilis foot ac tenuis roberti familia, si docalum et regium. Spect emus apis em, ad quem postia pervenit, quae anestitum et. Praetor nobilium vulgarium statum et conditionum illustitis habita. Est. Quae nec humi reperit nec altum quid tumerit. Wilhelm. Momsper. De Justice Anglerum, L. 3. p. 107. Not. Ad Alexiad. p. 230. 41. Return, I shall quote with pleasure some of the best lines. Of the Apollyon. L2P 270. Pugnat utraki manu, nec lansa cassa, nec ensis. Cassus erat, quocant manu de dosura velet. Ter dejectus equo, ter viribus ipsi resumptus. Major in arma redit, stimulos furor ipsi ministrat. Ut leo cum friendens, and c. Nullus in hoc bello sicuti post bella probatum est. Victor vel vitus, tam magnos edidit ictus. 42. Return, the Norman writers and editors most conversant with their own idiom interpret Giscar or Whiskard, by Calidus, a cunning man. The root, wise, is familiar to our ear, and in the Old word wiseacre, I can discern something of a similar sense and termination. It is no bad translation of the surname and character of Robert. As the genius of Robert expanded with his fortune, he awakened the jealousy of his elder brother, by whom, in a transient quarrel, his life was threatened and his liberty restrained. After the death of Humphrey, the tender age of his sons excluded them from the command, they were reduced to a private estate, by the ambition of their guardian and uncle, and Giscar was exalted on a buckler, and saluted Count of Apulia and General of the Republic. With an increase of authority and of force, he 
resumed the conquest of Calabria, and soon aspired to a rank that should raise him forever above the heads of his equals. By some acts of rapine or sacrilege, he had incurred a papal excommunication, but Nicholas II was easily persuaded that the divisions of friends could terminate only in their mutual prejudice, that the Normans were the faithful champions of the Holy See, and it was safer to trust the alliance of a prince than the caprice of an aristocracy. A synod of 100 bishops was convened at Melfi, and the count interrupted an important enterprise to guard the person and execute the decrees of the Roman pontiff. His gratitude and policy conferred on Robert and his posterity the ducal title, 43 with the investiture of Apulia, Calabria and all the lands, both in Italy and Sicily, which his sword could rescue from the schismatic Greeks and the unbelieving Saracens. 44 This apostolic sanction might justify his arms, but the obedience of a free and victorious people could not be transferred without their consent, and Giscard dissembled his elevation till the ensuing campaign had been illustrated by the conquest of Consenza in Reggio. In the hour of triumph, he assembled his troops, and solicited the Normans to confirm by their suffrage the judgment of the Vicar of Christ, the soldiers hailed with joyful acclamations their valiant Duke, and they counts, his former equals, pronounced the oath of fidelity with hollow smiles and secret indignation. After this inauguration, Robert styled himself, by the grace of God and street, Peter, Duke of Apulia, Calabria and hereafter of Sicily, and it was the labor of twenty years to deserve and realize these lofty Appellations Such sardi progress, in a narrow space, may seem unworthy of the abilities of the chief and the spirit of the nation, but the Normans were few in number, their resources were scanty, their service was voluntary and precarious. The bravest designs of the Duke were sometimes opposed by the free voice of his Parliament of Barons, the Twelve Counts of Popular Election, conspired against his authority, and against their perfidious uncle, the sons of Humphrey demanded justice and revenge. By his policy and vigor, Giscard discovered their plots, suppressed their rebellions, and punished the guilty with death or exile. But in these domestic feuds, his years and the national strength were unprofitably consumed. After the defeat of his foreign enemies, the Greeks, Lombards and Saracens, their broken forces retreated to the strong and populous cities of the sea coast. They excelled in the arts of fortification and defense. The Normans were accustomed to serve on horseback in the field, and their rude attempts could only succeed by the efforts of persevering courage. The resistance of Salerno was maintained. Above eight months, the siege or blockade of Bari lasted near four years. In these actions the Norman duke was the foremost in every danger, in every fatigue the last and most patient. As he pressed the citadel of Salerno, a huge stone from the rampart shattered one of his military engines, and by a splinter he was wounded in the breast. Before the gates of Bari, he lodged in a miserable hut or barrack, composed of dry branches, and thatched with straw, 
a perilous station, on all sides open to the inclemency of the winter and the spears of the enemy. 45. 43. Return, the acquisition of the ducal title by Robert. Giscar is a nice and obscure business. With the good advice of Giannoni, Muratori, and Street. Mark, I have endeavored to form a consistent and probable narrative. 44. Return, Barrow News, Annal. Ecclesiastes AD 1059, number 69, has published the original act. He professes to have copied it from the Liber Sensum, a Vatican mis yet a Liber Sensum of the Zeeth. Century has been printed by Muratori, Antiquit. Medii Evi, Tom. V. P. 851 to 908, and the names of Vatican and Cardinal awaken the suspicions of a Protestant, and even of a philosopher. 45. Return, read the life of Giscar in the second and third books of the Apollyon, the first and second books of Malaterra. The Italian conquests of Robert correspond with the limits of the present kingdom of Naples, and the countries united by his arms have not been dissevered by the revolutions of 700 years. 46 The monarchy has been composed of the Greek provinces of Calabria and Apulia, of the Lombard Principality of Salerno, the Republic of Amalfi, and the inland dependencies of the large an ancient duchy of Beneventum. Three districts only were exempted from the common law of subjection, the first forever, the two last till the middle of the succeeding century. The city, an immediate territory of Benevento had been transferred, by gift or exchange, from the German emperor to the Roman pontiff. And although this holy land was sometimes invaded, the name of Street Peter was finally more potent than the sword of the Normans. Their first colony of Aversa subdued and held the state of Capua. And her princes were reduced to beg their bread before the palace of their fathers. The Dukes of Naples, the present metropolis maintained the popular freedom, under the shadow of the Byzantine Empire. Among the new acquisitions of Giscar, the science of Salerno, 47 and the trade of Amalfi, 48 may detain for a moment the curiosity of the reader, I of the learned faculties. Jurisprudence implies the previous establishment of laws and property, and theology may perhaps be superseded by the full light of religion and reason. But the savage and the sage must alike implore the assistance of physic, and, if our diseases are inflamed by luxury, the mischiefs of blows and wounds would be more frequent in the ruder ages of society. The treasures of Grecian medicine had been communicated to the Arabian colonies of Africa, Spain, and Sicily, and in the intercourse of peace and war, a spark of knowledge had been kindled and cherished at Salerno, an illustrious city, in which the men were honest and the women beautiful. 49A School, the first that arose in the darkness of Europe, was consecrated to the healing art, the conscience of monks and bishops was reconciled to that salutary and lucrative profession, and a crowd of patients, of the most eminent rank, and most distant climates, invited or visited the physicians of Salerno. They were protected by the Norman conquerors, and Giscar, though bred in arms, could discern the 
Merit and Value of a Philosopher After a Pilgrimage of 39 Years, Constantine, an African Christian, Returned From Baghdad, a master of the language and learning of the Arabians, and Salerno was enriched by the practice, the lessons and the writings of the pupil of Avicenna. The School of Medicine has long slept in the name of a university, but her precepts are abridged in a string of aphorisms, bound together in the Leonine verses, or Latin rhymes, of the 12th century. 52. 7. Miles to the west of Salerno, and 30 to the south of Naples. The obscure town of Amalfi displayed the power and rewards of industry. The land, however fertile, was of narrow extent, but the sea was accessible and open, the inhabitants first assumed the office of supplying the western world with the manufactures and productions of the east, and this useful traffic was the source of their opulence and freedom. The government was popular under the administration of a duke and the supremacy of the Greek emperor. Fifty thousand citizens were numbered in the walls of Amalfi, nor was any city more abundantly provided with gold, silver, and the objects of precious luxury. The mariners who swarmed in her port, excelled in the theory and practice of navigation and astronomy, and the discovery of the compass, which has opened the globe, is owing to their ingenuity or good fortune. Their trade was extended to the coasts, or at least to the commodities of Africa, Arabia, and India, and their settlements in Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria, acquired the privileges of independent colonies. 51. After 300 years of prosperity, Amalfi was oppressed by the arms of the Normans, and sacked by the jealousy of Pisa, but the poverty of 1051 eleven fishermen is yet dignified by the remains of an arsenal, a cathedral, and the palaces of royal merchants. 46. Return, the conquests of Robert Giscar and Roger I. The Exemption of Benevento and the Twelve Provinces of the Kingdom, are fairly exposed by Giannone in the second volume of his Historia. Seville, L. 9. X. 11 and L. 17. p. 460-470. This modern division was not established before the time of Frederick II. 47, Return, Giannone, Tom 2 p. 119-127, Muratori. Antiquitat. Mediaevi, Tom. 3 Dessert. Sliv p. 935-936. And Tyraboski, Historia della Letteratura Italiana, have given. An historical account of these physicians, their medical knowledge and practice must be left to our physicians. 48. Return, at the end of the Historia Pandectarum of Henry Brinkman, Trajecti Adrenum, 1722, in Fortio, the indefatigable author has inserted two dissertations, De Republica Amalfitana, and de Amalfi Epizonis Direpta, which are built on the testimonies of 140 writers. Yet he has forgotten two most important passages of the Embassy of Lyudprand, A.D. 939, which compare the trade and navigation of Amalfi with that of Venice. 49. 
return, urbis latai non esthac delicio gerib. Frugibus, arboribus, vinici redundat, et unde. Non tibi poma, nuces, non pulcra palatia decent. Non species mulibris abest provit asc virorum. Guliolem musipulus, L. 3. P. 367. 50. Return, Muratori carries their antiquity above the year. 1066, of the death of Edward the Confessor, the Rex Anglerum to whom they are addressed. Nor is this date affected by the opinion, or rather mistake, of Pasquier, Recherches de la France. L. 7. C. 2. In Duckenge, Glosser. Latin. The practice of rhyming, as early as the 8th century, was borrowed from the Languages of the North and East, Muratori, Antiquitat, Tom, 3. Dessert. XL, P. 686 to 708. 51. Return, The Description of Amalfi, by William the Apollyon. L. 3 P. 267, contains much truth and some poetry, and they third line may be applied to the sailor's compass. Nulla magus locupils argento, vestibus, oro. Partibus in ameris, hac plurimus of moratur. Not ameris saelic vias of barrier peritus. Huc et alexandri diversiferun turabab. Regis, et antiochi. Gens hec freda plurum a transit. His autobase, Indi, Siculi nasc unter et afri. Hec gens est totem prur nobili tata per orbum. Et mercando forens, et amens mercata refer. 5111, return, Amalfi had only 1,000 inhabitants at the commencement of the 18th century, when it was visited by Brinkman. Brinkman de Representative Amulf. Dissertations I. C. 23. Et. Present it has six or eight thousand History de Republic Tom. I. P. 304. G. Chapter LVI, The Saracens, the Franks and the Normans, Part 3. Roger, the twelfth and last of the sons of Tancred, had been long detained in Normandy by his own and his father's age. He accepted. The welcome summons, hastened to the Apollyon camp, and deserved. At first the esteem, and afterwards the envy, of his elder. Brother. Their valor and ambition were equal, but the youth, the beauty, the elegant manners, of Roger engaged the disinterested, Love of the soldiers and people. So scanty was his allowance for himself and forty followers, that he descended from conquest to robbery, and from robbery to domestic theft, and so loose were the notions of property, that, by his own historian, at his special command, he is accused of stealing horses from a stable. At Melfi. 52 His spirit emerged from poverty and disgrace, from these base practices he rose to the merit and glory of a holy war, and the invasion of Sicily was seconded by the zeal and policy of his brother Giscar. After the retreat of the Greeks, the idolaters, a most audacious reproach of the Catholics, had retrieved their losses and possessions, but the deliverance of the island, so vainly undertaken by the forces of the Eastern Empire, was achieved by a small and private band of adventurers. 53 In the first attempt, Roger braved, in an open boat, the real 
and fabulous dangers of Scylla and Charybdis, landed with only 60 soldiers on a hostile shore, drove the Saracens to the gates of Messina and safely returned with the spoils of the adjacent country. In the fortress of Trani, his active and patient courage were equally conspicuous. In his old age he related with pleasure, that, by the distress of the siege, himself, and the countess his wife, had been reduced to a single cloak or mantle, which they wore alternately, that in a sally his horse had been slain, and he was dragged away by the Saracens. But that he owed his rescue to his good sword, and had retreated with his saddle on his back, lest the meanest trophy might be left in the hands of the miscreants. In the siege of Trani, three hundred Normans withstood and repulsed the forces of the island. In the field of Ceramio, fifty thousand horse and foot were overthrown by one hundred and thirty-six Christian soldiers. Without reckoning street, George, who fought on horseback in the foremost ranks. The captive banners, with four camels, were reserved for the successor of Street, Peter, and had these barbaric spoils been exposed, not in the Vatican, but in the capital, they might have revived the memory of the Punic triumphs. These Insufficient numbers of the Normans most probably denote their knights, the soldiers of honorable and equestrian rank, each of whom was attended by five or six followers in the field, fifty-four yet. With the aid of this interpretation, and after every fair allowance on the side of valor, arms, and reputation, they discomfiture of so many myriads will reduce the prudent reader to the alternative of a miracle or a fable. The Arabs of Sicily derived a frequent and powerful succor from their countrymen of Africa, in the siege of Palermo, the Norman cavalry was assisted by the galleys of Pisa, and, in the hour of action, the envy of the two brothers was sublimed to a generous and invincible emulation. After a war of thirty years, fifty-five Roger, with the title of Great Count, obtained the sovereignty of the largest and most fruitful island of the Mediterranean, and his administration displays a liberal and enlightened mind, above the limits of his age and education. The Moslems were maintained in the free enjoyment of their religion and property, 56 a philosopher and physician of Mazara, of the race of Muhammad, harangued the conqueror, and was invited to court, his geography of the seven climates was translated into Latin, and Roger, after a diligent perusal, preferred the work of the Arabian to the writings of the Grecian Ptolemy. 57A remnant of Christian natives had promoted the success of the Normans, they were rewarded by the triumph of the cross. The island was restored to the jurisdiction of the Roman Pontiff, new bishops were planted in the principal cities and the clergy was satisfied by a liberal endowment of churches and monasteries. Yet the Catholic hero asserted the rights of the civil magistrate. Instead of resigning the investiture of benefices, he dexterously applied to his own prophet the papal claims, the supremacy of the crown was secured and enlarged, by the singular bull, which declares the princes of Sicily hereditary and perpetual legates of the Holy See. 58. 52. Return, 
Latrocinio armiger orum suorum in multis. Sustentabator, quat quitem ad egis ignominiam non decimus, said. Ipso eta precipient ad huc viliura et reprehensibiliura dictury. Sumus ut pluribus pate scat, quam laborios et cum quanta angustia. A profunda paupertate ad simum culmin divisurum vel honoris. A tigerate. Such is the preface of Malatera, LIC 25, to the horse stealing. From the moment, LIC 19, that he has mentioned his patron Roger, the elder brother sinks into the second character. Something similar in Velius Paterculus may be observed of Augustus and Tiberius. 53. Return, duo sibi proficua deputans animi silicet et. Corporis si teren, idolis deditam ad cultum divinum revocarit. Gafford Malatera, L. 2 c 1. The conquest of Sicily is related in the three last books, and he himself has given an accurate summary of the chapters, p. 544-546. 54. Return, see the word Melitas in the Latin glossary of Duckenge. 55. Return, of odd particulars, I learn from Malatera, that the Arabs had introduced into Sicily the use of camels, LIC. 33, and of carrier pigeons, C. 42, and that the bite of the tarantula provokes a windy disposition, quae perinum in honest. Crepitando emergit, a symptom most ridiculously felt by the whole Norman army in their camp near Palermo, C. 36. I shall add an etymology not unworthy of the Zith century, Messana is divided from Messes, the place from whence the harvests of the isle were sent in tribute to Rome, L. 2 C. 1. 56. Return, see the capitulation of Palermo in Malaterra, L. 2 C. 45, and Giannoni who remarks the general toleration of the Saracens, Tom 2 p. 72. 57. Return, John Leo A. Effer, de Medicis et Philosophis Arabibus. c. 14. Apud Fabric. Bibliot. Grice. Tom. 13 p. 278, 279. This philosopher is named Esarif Esa Chali, and he died in Africa. A.H. 516, A.D. 1122. Yet this story bears a strange resemblance to the Sharif al Edrisi, who presented his book, Geographia. Nubian Essays, see Preface p. 88, 90, 170, to Roger. King of Sicily. A.H. 541, A.D. 1153, D. Herbalis, Bibliotheca Rental, p. 786, Prito's Life of Muhammad, p. 188. Petit de la Croix, History. De Gengiscan, p. 535-536. Kassiri, Bibliot. Arab. Hispan. Tom. 2 p. 9 to 13, and I am afraid of some mistake. 58. Return, Malaterra remarks the foundation of the bishoprics. L. 4 c. 7, and produces the original of the bull, L. 4 c. 29. Giannoni gives a rational idea of this privilege, and they Tribunal of the Monarchy of Sicily, Tom 2 p. 95-102, and Street. Mark, Abrague, 
Tom 3P 217-301, to first column, labors the case. With the diligence of a Sicilian lawyer. To Robert Giscar, the conquest of Sicily was more glorious than beneficial, the possession of Apulia and Calabria was inadequate to his ambition, and he resolved to embrace or create the first occasion of invading, perhaps of subduing, the Roman Empire of the East. 59 From his first wife, the partner of his humble fortune, he had been divorced under the pretense of consanguinity, and her son Bohemond was destined to imitate, rather than to succeed, his illustrious father. The second wife of Giscar was the daughter of the princes of Salerno, the Lombards acquiesced in the lineal succession of their son Roger. Their five daughters were given in honorable nuptials, sixty and one. Of them was betrothed, in a tender age, to Constantine, a beautiful youth, the son and heir of the Emperor Michael. Sixty-one but the throne of Constantinople was shaken by a revolution, the imperial family of Ducas was confined to the palace or the cloister, and Robert deplored, and resented, the disgrace of his daughter and the expulsion of his ally, a Greek, who styled himself the father of Constantine, soon appeared at Salerno, and related the adventures of his fall and flight. That unfortunate friend was acknowledged by the Duke, and adorned with the pomp and titles of imperial dignity, in his triumphal progress through Apulia and Calabria, Michael 62 was saluted with the tears and acclamations of the people, and Pope Gregory VII exhorted the bishops to preach, and the Catholics to fight, in the pious work of his restoration. His conversations with Robert were frequent and familiar, and their mutual promises were justified by the valor of the Normans and the treasures of the East. Yet, this Michael, by the confession of the Greeks and Latins, was a pageant and an impostor, a monk who had fled from his convent, or a domestic who had served in the palace. The fraud had been contrived by the subtle Giscar, and he trusted, that after this pretender had given a decent color to his arms, he would sink, at the nod of the conqueror, into his primitive obscurity. But, victory was the only argument that could determine the belief of the Greeks, and the ardor of the Latins was much inferior to their credulity, the Norman veterans wished to enjoy the harvest of their toils, and the unwarlike Italians trembled at the known and unknown dangers of a transmarine expedition. In his new levies, Robert exerted the influence of gifts and promises, the terrors of civil and ecclesiastical authority, and some acts of violence might justify the reproach that age and infancy were pressed without distinction into the service of their unrelenting prince. After two years' incessant preparations the land end Naval forces were assembled at Otranto, at the heel, or extreme promontory, of Italy, and Robert was accompanied by his wife, who fought by his side, his son Bohemond, and the representative of the Emperor Michael. 1300 Knights 63 of Norman race, or discipline, formed the sinews of the army, which might be swelled to 30,064 followers of every denomination. The men, the horses, the arms, the engines, the wooden towers, 
covered with raw hides, were embarked on board 100 and 50 vessels, the transports had been built in the ports of Italy, and the galleys were supplied by the alliance of the Republic of Ragusa. 59. Return, in the first expedition of Robert against the Greeks, I follow Anacomna, the Ist, Thurid, Ivith, and Vth. Books of the Alexiad, William Apulus, L. Ivith and Vth, p. 270-275, and Geoffrey Malaterra, L. 3C 13, 14, 24-29, 39. Their information is contemporary and authentic, but none of them were eyewitnesses of the war. 60. Return, one of them was married to Hugh, the son of Azo. Or Axo, a Marquis of Lombardy, rich, powerful, and noble. Gilliam. A Pole. L. 3. P. 267 in the Zith century, and whose ancestors in the XTH and Ixth are explored by the critical industry of Leibniz and Muratori. From the two elder sons of the Marquis Azo are derived the illustrious lines of Brunswick and Este. See Muratori, Anticita Estense. 61. Return, Anacomna somewhat too wantonly, praises and bewails that handsome boy, who, after the rupture of his barbaric nuptials, L.I.P. 23, was betrothed as her husband. P. 27. Elsewhere, she describes the red and white of his skin, his hawks, eyes, and C. L. 3. P. 71. 62, Return, Anacomna, L.I.P. 28, 29. Gilliam. A Pole. L. 4 P. 271. Gafford Malaterra, L. 3. C. 13, P. 579, 580. Malaterra is more cautious in his style but the Apulian is bold and positive meant it use se micha elem venerated in is quidem seductor ad illum as Gregory seven had believed Barrow news almost alone recognizes the Emperor Michael AD number 44 63 return ipsi armati militiae non plus quam mccc militas Secum habis, a bis key item negotio interfuerunt atntes tata. Malaterra, L3C 24, P583. These are the same whom they. Apollyon, L4P 273, styles the e kestis gens duces, equites. Degente duces. 64, return. Anacomna, Alexias, L.I.P. 37, and her account tallies with the number and lading of the ships. Ivat in Dyrrachium cum 15. Milibus hominum, says the chronicon breve. Normanicum, Muratori, Scriptores, Tom V.P. 278. I have endeavored to reconcile these reckonings. At the mouth of the Adriatic Gulf, the shores of Italy and Epirus incline towards each other. The space between Brungisum and Durazzo, the Roman passage, is no more than 100 miles, 65. At the last station of Otranto, it is contracted to 50, 66 and this narrow distance had suggested to Pyrrhus and Pompey the sublime or extravagant idea of a bridge before the general 
Embarkation, the Norman Duke dispatched Bohemond with fifteen galleys to seize or threaten the Isle of Corfu, to survey the opposite coast, and to secure a harbour in the neighbourhood of Valina for the landing of the troops. They passed and landed. Without perceiving an enemy, and this successful experiment displayed the neglect and decay of the naval power of the Greeks. The islands of Epirus and the maritime towns were subdued by the arms or the name of Robert, who led his fleet and army from Corfu. I use the modern appellation, to the siege of Durazzo. That city, the western key of the empire, was guarded by ancient renown, and recent fortifications, by George Paleologus, a patrician, victorious in the Oriental Wars, and a numerous garrison of Albanians and Macedonians, who, in every age, have maintained the character of soldiers in the prosecution of his enterprise, the courage of Giscar was assailed by every form of danger and mischance. In the most propitious season of the year, as his fleet passed along the coast, a storm of wind and snow unexpectedly arose, the Adriatic was swelled by the raging blast of the south, and a new shipwreck confirmed the old infamy of the Acrosironian rocks. 67 The sails, the masts, and the oars, were shattered or torn away, the sea and shore were covered with the fragments of vessels, with arms and dead bodies, and the greatest part of the provisions were either drowned or damaged. The Ducal Galley was laboriously rescued from the waves, and Robert halted seven days on the adjacent cape, to collect the relics of his loss, and revive the drooping spirits of his soldiers. The Normans were no longer the bold and experienced mariners who had explored the ocean from Greenland to Mount Atlas, and who smiled at the petty dangers of the Mediterranean. They had wept during the tempest, they were alarmed by the hostile approach of the Venetians, who had been solicited by the prayers and promises of the Byzantine court. The first day's action was not disadvantageous to Bohemond, a beardless youth, sixty-eight who led the naval powers of his father. All night the galleys of the Republic lay on their anchors in the form of a crescent, and the victory of the second day was decided by the dexterity of their evolutions, the station of their archers, the weight of their javelins, and the borrowed aid of the Greek fire. The Apollyon end. Ragushion vessels fled to the shore, several were cut from their cables, and dragged away by the conqueror, and a sally from the town carried slaughter and dismay to the tents of the Norman Duke. A seasonable relief was poured into Durazzo, and as soon as the besiegers had lost the command of the sea, the islands and maritime towns withdrew from the camp the supply of tribute and provision. That camp was soon afflicted with a pestilential disease, five hundred knights perished by an inglorious death. And the list of burials, if all could obtain a decent burial, amounted to ten thousand persons. Under these calamities, the mind of Giscar alone was firm and invincible, and while he collected new forces from Apulia and Sicily, he battered, or scaled, or sapped, the walls of Durazzo. But his industry and valor were encountered by equal valor and more perfect industry. A movable turret, 
of a size and capacity to contain 500 soldiers, had been rolled forwards to the foot of the rampart. But the descent of the door or drawbridge was checked by an enormous beam, and the wooden structure was constantly consumed by artificial flames. 65. Return, the Itinerary of Jerusalem, p. 609, Edit. Wesseling, gives a true and reasonable space of a thousand stadia, or one hundred miles, which is strangely doubled by Strabo, L. 6. p. 433, and Pliny, History Natur, 3. 16. 66. Return, Pliny, History National 36, 16, allows Queen Quajan Tap. Milia for this brevissimus cursus, and agrees with the real distance from Atranto to La Valina, or Alon, Danville. Analyze DSA card de Cotes de Lagras, and C, P, 3 to 6. Hermo Laus Barbaris, who substitutes Centum. Harduin, not Luxi. In Plin. L. 3, might have been corrected by every Venetian pilot who had sailed out of the Gulf. 67, return, infame Scopulos Acrosirania, Horat, Carmi 3. The Precipitum Africum de Certantum Aquilonibus, et Rabium Noti and the Monstra Nata Ntia of the Adriatic, are somewhat enlarged. But Horace trembling for the life of Virgil, is an interesting moment in the history of poetry and friendship. 68, Return, Alexias, L4P 106. Yet the Normans shaved, and the Venetians wore, their beards, they must have derided the no beard of Bohemond, a harsh interpretation. Dunkang Gaad. Alexiad. p. 283. While the Roman Empire was attacked by the Turks in the east, east, and the Normans in the west, the aged successor of Michael surrendered the scepter to the hands of Alexius, an illustrious captain and the founder of the Comnian dynasty. The princess Anne, his daughter and historian, observes, in her affected style, that even Hercules was unequal to a double combat, and, on this principle, she approves a hasty peace with the Turks, which allowed her father to undertake in person the relief of Durazzo. On his accession, Alexius found the camp without soldiers, and the treasury without money, yet such were the vigor and activity of his measures, that in six months he assembled an army of 70,000 men, 69 and performed a march of 500 miles. His troops were levied in Europe and Asia, from Peloponnesus to the Black Sea, His Majesty was displayed in the silver arms and rich trappings of the companies of horse guards, and the Emperor was attended by a train of nobles and princes, some of whom, in rapid succession, had been clothed with the purple, and were indulged by the lenity of the times in a life of affluence and dignity. Their youthful ardor might animate the multitude, but their love of pleasure and contempt of subordination were pregnant with disorder and mischief, and their importunate clamors for speedy and decisive action disconcerted the prudence of Alexius, who might have surrounded and starved the besieging army. The enumeration of provinces recalls a sad Comparison of the past and present limits of the Roman world, the raw levies were drawn together in haste and terror, and the garrisons of Anatolia, or Asia Minor, 
had been purchased by the evacuation of the cities which were immediately occupied by the Turks. The strength of the Greek army consisted in the Varangians, the Scandinavian guards, whose numbers were recently augmented by a colony of exiles and volunteers from the British island of Thule. Under the yoke of the Norman conqueror, the Danes and English were oppressed and united, a band of adventurous youths resolved to desert a land of slavery, the sea was open to their escape, and, in their long pilgrimage, they visited every coast that afforded any hope of liberty and revenge. They were entertained in the service of the Greek emperor, and their first station was in a new city on the Asiatic shore, but Alexius soon recalled them to the defense of his person and palace, and bequeathed to his successors the inheritance of their faith and valor. 70 The name of a Norman invader revived the memory of their wrongs, they marched with alacrity against the national foe, and panted to regain in Epirus the glory which they had lost in the Battle of Hastings. The Varangians were supported by some companies of Franks or Latins, and the rebels, who had fled to Constantinople from the tyranny of Giscar, were eager to signalize their zeal and gratify their revenge. In this emergency, the emperor had not disdained the impurate of the Polychians or Manichaeans of Thrace and Bulgaria, and these heretics united with the patience of martyrdom the spirit and discipline of active valor. 71 They treaty with the Sultan had procured a supply of some thousand Turks, and the arrows of the Scythian horse were opposed to the lances of the Norman cavalry. On the report and distant prospect of these formidable numbers, Robert assembled a council of his principal officers. You behold, said he, your danger, it is urgent and inevitable. The hills are covered with arms and standards, and the emperor of the Greeks is accustomed to wars and triumphs. Obedience and union are our only safety, and I am ready to yield the command to a more worthy leader. The vote and acclamation even of his secret enemies, assured him, in that perilous moment, of their esteem and confidence, and the Duke. Thus continued, let us trust in the rewards of victory, and deprive cowardice of the means of escape. Let us burn our vessels and our baggage, and give battle on this spot, as if it were the place of our nativity and our burial. The resolution was unanimously approved, and, without confining himself to his lines, Giscar awaited in battle array the nearer approach of the enemy. His rear was covered by a small river, his right wing extended to the sea, his left to the hills, nor was he conscious. Perhaps, that on the same ground Caesar and Pompey had formerly disputed the empire of the world. 72. 69. Return, Muratori, Annali d'Italia, Tom 9p 136, 137. Observes, that some authors, Petrus Diakon, Chronicles Cassinan, L. 3c 49, compose the Greek army of 170,000 men, but that they hundred may be struck off, and that Malaterra reckons only 70,000, a slight inattention. The passage to which he alludes is in the Chronicle of Lupus Protospata, 
Scripture Italian Tom VP 45 Malaterra L4C 27 speaks in high but indefinite terms of the emperor cum copies innumerabilbus like the apollyon poet l4p 272 more locus terum montes et piana tegentur 70 return c william of malmesbury de justice anglorum l 2p 92 Alexius Fidem Anglorum Suspicions Precipuus Familiaritatibus Suis Eos Application Abat, Amorum Eorum Filio Transcribens Odor IC Us Vitalis, History Ecclesiastes L. 4p. 508, L. 7p. 641, relates their emigration from England, and their service in Greece. 71, Return, see the Apollyon, LIP 256. The Character End The story of these Manichaeans has been the subject of the Live. Chapter 72, Return, see the simple and masterly narrative of Caesar. Himself, Comment de Bell. Civil, 3. 41 to 75, it is a pity that Quintus Isolius, M. Gishard, did not live to analyze these operations, as he has done the campaigns of Africa and Spain. Against the advice of his wisest captains, Alexius resolved to risk the event of a general action, and exhorted the garrison of Durazzo to assist their own deliverance by a well-timed sally. From the town, he marched in two columns to surprise the Normans. Before daybreak on two different sides, his light cavalry was scattered over the plain, the archers formed the second line, and the Varangians claimed the honors of the vanguard. In the first onset, the battle axes of the strangers made a deep and bloody impression on the army of Giscar, which was now reduced to 15,000 men. The Lombards and Calabrians ignominiously turned their backs, they fled towards the river and the sea, but the bridge had been broken down to check the sally of the garrison, and the coast was lined with the Venetian galleys who played their engines among the disorderly throng. On the verge of ruin, they were saved by the spirit and conduct of their chiefs. Gaeta, the wife of Robert, is painted by the Greeks as a warlike Amazon, a second palace, less skillful in arts, but not less terrible in arms, than the Athenian goddess. 73 Though wounded by an arrow, she stood her ground, and strove, by her exhortation, an example, to rally the flying troops. 74 Her female voice was seconded by the more powerful voice and arm of the Norman Duke. As calm in action as he was magnanimous in counsel, whither, he cried aloud, Whither do ye fly? Your enemy is implacable, and death is less grievous than servitude. The moment was decisive. As the Varangians advanced before the line, they discovered the nakedness of their flanks, the main battle of the Duke, of eight hundred knights, stood firm and entire, they couched their lances, and the Greeks bore the furious and irresistible shock of the French cavalry. 75 Alexius was not deficient in the duties of a soldier or a general, but he no sooner beheld the slaughter of the Varangians and the flight of the Turks, than he despised his subjects, and despaired of his fortune. The Princess Anne, who 
drops a tear on this melancholy event, is reduced to praise the strength and swiftness of her father's horse, and his vigorous struggle when he was almost overthrown by the stroke of a lance which had shivered the imperial helmet. His desperate valor broke through a squadron of Franks who opposed his flight, and after wandering two days and as many nights in the mountains, he found some repose, of body, though not of mind, in the walls of Lichnitis. The victorious Robert reproached the tardy and feeble pursuit which had suffered the escape of so illustrious a prize. But he consoled his disappointment by the trophies and standards of the field, the wealth and luxury of the Byzantine camp, and the glory of defeating an army five times more numerous than his own. A multitude of Italians had been the victims of their own fears, but only thirty of his knights were slain in this memorable day. In the Roman host, the loss of Greeks, Turks, and English, amounted to five or six thousand, seventy-six, the plain of Durazzo was stained with noble and royal blood, and the end of the impostor Michael was more honorable than his life. 73. Return, it is very properly translated by the President. Cousin, History di Constantinople, Tom 4p 131, in 1 2 mo, key. Combatoit cum un palace, quoic lne feud pa aussi savant. Cute cella di Athenes. The Grecian goddess was composed of two discordant characters, of Nyth, the workwoman of Sais in Egypt, and of a virgin Amazon of the Tritonian lake in Libya, Bonnier. Mythology, Tom. 4p 1-31, in 1-2mo. 74, Return, Anacomna, L4p 116, Admires with some degree of terror, her masculine virtues. They were more familiar to the Latins and though the Apollyon, L4P 273, mentions her presence in her wound, he represents her as far less intrepid. Uxor in hoc bella roberti forte sagitta. Quadum lace afoot, quo vulnerata nolam. Dum sprebat opem, se pon subagerat hosti. The last is an unlucky word for a female prisoner. 75. Return, Anna, LVP 133, and elsewhere, P 140. The pedantry of the princess in the choice of classic appellations encouraged Dukange to apply to his countrymen the characters of the Ancient Gauls. 76, Return, Lupus Protos Bata, Tom 3p 45, says 6,000. William the Apollyon more than 5,000, L4p 273. There. Modesty is singular and laudable, they might with so little. Trouble have slain two or three myriads of schismatics and Infidels. It is more than probable that Giscar was not afflicted by the loss of a costly pageant, which had merited only the contempt and derision of the Greeks. After their defeat, they still persevered. In the defense of Durazzo, and a Venetian commander supplied the place of George Paleologus, who had been imprudently called away. From his station, the tents of the besiegers were converted into barracks, to sustain the inclemency of the winter, and in answer to the defiance of the garrison, Robert insinuated, that his patience was at least equal to their obstinacy. 77 Perhaps he 
already trusted to his secret correspondence with a Venetian. Noble, who sold the city for a rich and honorable marriage. At the dead of night, several rope ladders were dropped from the walls, the light Calabrians ascended in silence, and the Greeks were awakened by the name and trumpets of the conqueror. Yet they defended the streets three days against an enemy already master of the rampart, and near seven months elapsed between the first investment and the final surrender of the place. From Durazzo, the Norman duke advanced into the heart of Epirus or Albania, traversed the first mountains of Thessaly, surprised three hundred English in the city of Castoria, approached Thessalonica, and made Constantinople tremble. A more pressing duty suspended the prosecution of his ambitious designs by shipwreck, pestilence, and the sword, his army was reduced to a third of the original numbers, and instead of being recruited from Italy, he was informed, by plaintive epistles, of the mischiefs and dangers which had been produced by his absence, the revolt of the cities and barons of Apulia, the distress of the Pope, and the approach or invasion of Henry King of Germany, highly presuming that his person was sufficient for the public safety, he repassed the sea in a single brigantine, and left the remains of the army under the command of his son and the Norman counts, exhorting Bohemond to respect the freedom of his peers, and the counts to obey the authority of their leader. The son of Giscard trod in the footsteps of his father, and the two destroyers are compared, by the Greeks, to the caterpillar and the locust, the last of whom devours whatever has escaped the teeth of the former. 78 After winning two battles against the emperor, he descended into the plain of Thessaly, and besieged Larissa, the fabulous realm of Achilles, 79 which contained the treasure and magazines of the Byzantine camp. Yet a just praise must not be refused to the fortitude and prudence of Alexius, who bravely struggled with the calamities of the times. In the poverty of the state, he presumed to borrow the superfluous ornaments of the churches, the desertion of the Manichaeans was supplied by some tribes of Moldavia, a reinforcement of 7,000 Turks replaced and revenged the loss of their brethren, and the Greek soldiers were exercised to ride, to draw the bow, and to the daily practice of ambuscades and evolutions. Alexius had been taught by experience that the formidable cavalry of the Franks on foot was unfit for action, and almost incapable of motion, eighty his archers were directed to aim their arrows at the horse rather than the man, and a variety of spikes and snares were scattered over the ground, on which he might expect an attack. In the neighborhood of Larissa the events of war were protracted and balanced. The courage of Bohemond was always conspicuous, and often successful. But his camp was pillaged by a stratagem of the Greeks, the city was impregnable, and the venal or discontented counts deserted. His standard betrayed their trusts, and enlisted in the service of the emperor. Alexius returned to Constantinople with the advantage, rather than the honor, of victory. After evacuating the conquests which he could no longer defend, the son of Giscar embarked for Italy, and was embraced by a father who esteemed his merit, 
and sympathized in his misfortune. 77. Return, the Romans had changed the inauspicious name of Epidamnus to Dyrrhachium, Plin 326, and the Vulgar. Corruption of Duracium, C. Malaterra, bore some affinity to Hardness. One of Robert's names was Durand, a Durando, poor wit. Alberic. Monarch. In Chronicles Apud Muratori, Annali d'Italia, Tom. 9p 137. 78. Return, Anna, Lip. 35. By these similes, so different. From those of Homer, she wishes to inspire contempt as well as horror for the little noxious animal, a conqueror. Most unfortunately, the common sense, or common nonsense, of mankind resists her laudable design. 79. Return, Prodiat Hac Octor Troyani Cladus Achilles. The Supposition of the Apollyon, LVP 275, may be excused by the more classic poetry of Virgil, Aeneid 2197, Larisius. Achilles, but it is not justified by the geography of Homer. 80. Return, the items which encumbered the knights on foot have been ignorantly translated spurs, Anacomna, Alexius, L. V. P. 140. Duckenge has explained the true sense by a ridiculous and inconvenient fashion, which lasted from the Zith to the XVTH century. These peaks, in the form of a scorpion, were sometimes two feet and fastened to the knee with a silver chain. Chapter LVI, The Saracens, The Franks and the Normans, Part 4 Of the Latin Princes, the allies of Alexius and enemies of Robert, the most prompt and powerful was Henry III or Fourth, King of Germany and Italy, and future Emperor of the West. The Epistle of the Greek Monarch 81 to his brother is filled with the warmest professions of friendship, and the most lively desire of strengthening their alliance by every public and private tie. He congratulates Henry on his success in a just and pious war, and complains that the prosperity of his own empire is disturbed by the audacious enterprises of the Norman Robert. They Lists of his presence expresses the manners of the age irradiated. Crown of gold, a cross set with pearls to hang on the breast, a case of relics, with the names and titles of the saints, a vase of crystal, a vase of sardonyx, some bomb, most probably of Mecca, and one hundred pieces of purple. To these he added a more Solid present, of 144,000 Byzantines. Of gold, with a further assurance of 216,000, so soon as Henry should have entered in arms the Apollyon territories, and confirmed by an oath the league against the common enemy. The German, 82 who was already in Lombardy at the head of an army and a faction, accepted these liberal offers, and marched towards the south, his speed was checked by the sound of the Battle of Durazzo, but the influence of his arms, or name, in the hasty return of Robert, was a full equivalent for the Grecian bribe. Henry was the severe adversary of the Normans, the Allies and vassals of Gregory VII, his implacable foe. The long quarrel of the throne and mitre had been recently kindled by the zeal and ambition of that haughty priest, 83 the 
king and the pope had degraded each other, and each had seated a rival on the temporal or spiritual throne of his antagonist. After the defeat and death of his Swabian rebel, Henry descended into Italy, to assume the imperial crown, and to drive from the Vatican the tyrant of the church. 84 But the Roman people adhered to the cause of Gregory, their resolution was fortified by supplies of men and money from Apulia, and the city was thrice ineffectually besieged by the king of Germany. In the fourth year, he corrupted, as it is said, with Byzantine gold, the nobles of Rome, whose estates and castles had been ruined by the war. The gates, the bridges, and fifty hostages, were delivered into his hands, the anti-pope, Clement III, was consecrated in the Lateran, the grateful pontiff crowned his protector in the Vatican, and the Emperor Henry fixed his residence in the capital, as the lawful successor of Augustus and Charlemagne. The ruins of the Septizonium were still defended by the nephew of Gregory, the Pope himself was invested in the castle of Street. Angelo, and his last hope was in the courage and fidelity of his Norman vassal. Their friendship had been interrupted by some reciprocal injuries and complaints, but, on this pressing occasion, Giscar was urged by the obligation of his oath, by his interest, more potent than oaths, by the love of fame, and his enmity to the two emperors. Unfurling the holy banner, he resolved to fly to the relief of the Prince of the Apostles, the most numerous of his armies, six thousand horse, and thirty thousand foot, was instantly assembled, and his march from Salerno to Rome was animated by the public applause and the promise of the divine favor. Henry, invincible in sixty-six battles, trembled at his approach, recollected some indispensable affairs that required his presence in Lombardy, exhorted the Romans to persevere in their allegiance, and hastily retreated three days before the entrance of the Normans. In less than three years, the son of Tancred of Hauteville enjoyed the glory of delivering the Pope, and of compelling the two emperors, of the East and West, to fly before his victorious arms. 85 But the triumph of Robert was clouded by the calamities of Rome. By the aid of the friends of Gregory, the walls had been perforated or scaled, but the imperial faction was still powerful and active. On the third day, the people rose in a furious tumult, and a hasty word of the conqueror, in his defense or revenge, was the signal of fire and pillage. 86 The Saracens of Sicily, the subjects of Roger, and auxiliaries of his brother, embraced this fair occasion of rifling and profaning the holy city of the Christians, many thousands of the citizens, in the sight, and by the allies, of their spiritual father were exposed to violation, captivity, or death, in a spacious quarter of the city, from the Lateran to the Colosseum, was consumed by the flames, and devoted to perpetual solitude. 87 From a city, where he was now hated, and might be no longer feared, Gregory retired to end his days in the palace of Salerno. The artful pontiff might flatter the vanity of Giscar with the hope of a Roman or imperial crown. But this dangerous measure, which would have inflamed the 
ambition of the Norman, must forever have alienated the most faithful princes of Germany. 81. Return, the epistle itself, Alexius, L3 p. 93, 94, 95. Well deserves to be read. There is one expression which Duckenge does not understand. I have endeavored to grow about a tolerable meaning, the first word is a golden crown, the second is explained by Simon Porteous, in Lexico Greco Barber, by a flash of lightning. 82. Return, for these general events I must refer to the General Historian Seco News, Barrow News, Muratori, Mosheim, Street. Mark, N.C. 83. Return, The Lives of Gregory Seven are either legends or invectives, St. Mark, Abrague, Tom 3p 235, N.C., and his miraculous or magical performances are alike incredible to a Modern reader. He will, as usual, find some instruction in L.E. Clerk, V. D. Hildebrand, Bibliot, Ancien et Moderne, Tom. 8. And much amusement in Bell, Dictionnaire Critique. Gregoire 7. That Pope was undoubtedly a great man, a second. Athanasius in a more fortunate age of the Church. May I presume to add, that the portrait of Athanasius is one of the passages of My History, Vol. 2 p. 332, and C, with which I am the least dissatisfied? Asterisk note, there is a fair life of Gregory VII. By Void, Weimar, 1815 which has been translated into French. M. Ville East Maine, it is understood, has devoted much time to the study of this remarkable character, to whom his eloquence may do justice. There is much valuable information on the subject in the accurate work of Stenzel, Geschichte Deutschlands unter den Frankie's Chen Kaiser and the History of Germany under the Emperors of the Franconian Race M. 84, Return, Anna, with the rancor of a Greek schismatic, calls him, L.I.P. 32, a pope, or priest, worthy to be spit upon and accuses him of scourging, shaving, and perhaps of castrating the Ambassadors of Henry, p. 31, 33. But this outrage is improbable and doubtful, see the sensible preface of Cousin. 85. Return. Siguno tempor victi. Sunt terri domini duo, rex alemon nicusiste. Imperii rector Romani Maximus Isle. Altar ad arma ruins armis super ada, et altar. Nominis auditi sola formidine cessit. It is singular enough, that the Apollyon, a Latin, should distinguish the Greek as the ruler of the Roman Empire, L. 4. p. 274. 86. Return, the narrative of Melatera, L. 3 c. 37. P. 587. 588, is authentic, circumstantial, and fair. Dux ignum exclamens. Abincensa, and C. The Apulian softens the mischief, and Quae bus dam adibus exustus, which is again exaggerated in some partial chronicles, Muratori, Annali, Tom 9 p. 147. 87. Return, after mentioning this devastation, the Jesuit. Donatus, de Roma Veteri et Nova, L. 4 c. 8, p. 489, prettily. 
Ads, Dararit Hodik in Coelio Monti, Interc Ipsum et. Capitalium, Miserabilis facies prostratesibus, Nisi in Hort Orum. Vintorum Camoanitatum Roma Reser Existit, Ut Perpetua. Viriditate Contagorit Vulnera et Ruinus Suas. The deliverer and scourge of Rome might have indulged himself in a season of repose, but in the same year of the flight of the German Emperor, the indefatigable Robert resumed the design of his eastern conquests. The zeal or gratitude of Gregory had promised to his valour the kingdoms of Greece and Asia, 88 his troops were assembled in arms, flushed with success, and eager for action. Their numbers, in the language of Homer, are compared by Anna to a swarm of bees, 89 yet the utmost and moderate limits of the powers of Giscar have been already defined, they were contained on this second occasion in 120 vessels, and as the season was far advanced, the harbour of Brungesum 90 was preferred to the open road of Otranto. Alexius, apprehensive of a second attack, had assiduously laboured to restore the naval forces of the empire, and obtained from the Republic of Venice an important succor of 36 transports, 14 galleys, and 9 galeots or ships of extraordinary strength and magnitude. Their services were liberally paid by the license or monopoly of trade, a profitable gift of many shops and houses in the port of Constantinople, and a tribute to street. Mark. The more acceptable, as it was the produce of a tax on their rivals at Amalfi. By the union of the Greeks and Venetians, the Adriatic was covered with a hostile fleet, but their own neglect, or the vigilance of Robert, the change of a wind, or the shelter of a mist, opened a free passage, and the Norman troops were safely disembarked on the coast of Epirus, with twenty strong and well-appointed galleys, their intrepid duke immediately sought the enemy and though more accustomed to fight on horseback, he trusted his own life, and the lives of his brother and two sons, to the event of a naval combat. The dominion of the sea was disputed in three engagements, in sight of the Isle of Corfu, in the two former, the skill and numbers of the Allies were superior, but in the third, the Normans obtained a final end. Complete victory. 91. The light brigantines of the Greeks were scattered in ignominious flight, the nine castles of the Venetians maintained a more obstinate conflict, seven were sunk. Two were taken, 2,500 captives implored in vain the mercy of the victor, and the daughter of Alexius deplores the loss of 13,000 of his subjects or allies. The want of experience had been supplied by the genius of Giscar, and each evening, when he had sounded a retreat, he calmly explored the causes of his repulse, and invented new methods how to remedy his own defects, and to baffle the advantages of the enemy. The winter season suspended his progress, with the return of spring he again aspired to the conquest of Constantinople, but, instead of traversing the hills of Epirus, he turned his arms against Greece and the islands, where the spoils would repay the labor, and where the land and sea forces might pursue their joint operations with vigor and effect. But, in the Isle of Cephalonia, his projects were fatally 
blasted by an epidemical disease, Robert himself, in the 70th year of his age, expired in his tent, and a suspicion of poison was imputed, by public rumor, to his wife, or to the Greek emperor. 92 This premature death might allow a boundless scope for the imagination of his future exploits, and the event sufficiently declares that the Norman greatness was founded on his life. 93 Without the appearance of an enemy, a victorious army dispersed or retreated in disorder and consternation, and Alexius, who had trembled for his empire, rejoiced in his deliverance. The galley which transported the remains of Giscar was shipwrecked on the Italian shore, but the duke's body was recovered from the sea, and deposited in the sepulchre of Benusia, 94 A place more illustrious for the birth of Horus 95 than for the burial of the Norman heroes. Roger, his second son and successor, immediately sunk to the humble station of a duke of Apulia, the esteem or partiality of his father left the valiant Bohemond to the inheritance of his sword. The national tranquility was disturbed by his claims, till the first crusade against the infidels of the East opened a more splendid field of glory and conquest. 96. 88. Return, the royalty of Robert, either promised or bestowed by the Pope, Anna, LIP 32, is sufficiently confirmed by the Apollyon, L4P 270, Romani Regna Sibi Promisissa. Coronum Papa Firbatut. Nor can I understand why Gretzer, and they other papal advocates, should be displeased with this new instance of apostolic jurisdiction. 89. Return, see Homer, Iliad, b. I hate this pedantic mode of quotation by letters of the Greek alphabet, 87, and c. His b's are the image of a disorderly crowd, their discipline and public Works seem to be the ideas of a later age, Virgil. Aeneid. L. I. 90, Return, Gilliam. Apulus, LVP 276. The admirable port of Brungisum was double, the outward harbour was a gulf covered by an island, and narrowing by degrees, till it communicated by a small gullet with the inner harbour, which embraced the city on both sides. Caesar and nature have laboured for its ruin, and against such agents what are the feeble efforts of the Neapolitan government? Swinburne's Travels in the Two Sicilies, Vol. I.P. 384-390 91. Return, William of Apulia, LVP 276, describes the victory of the Normans, and forgets the two previous defeats, which are diligently recorded by Anna Comna, L6P 159, 160, 161. In her turn, she invents or magnifies a fourth action to give the Venetians revenge and rewards. Their own feelings were far different, since they deposed their doge, Proter. Exidium Stoli, Dandulus in Cron in Muratori, Scripture Rerum. Italicarum, Tom. 12 p. 249. 92. Return, the most authentic writers, William of Apulia. L. V. 277, Geoffrey Malaterra, 
L3C41, P589, and Rome Wald. Of Salerno, Chronicles and Muratori, Scripture Rerum Italian Tom 7. Are ignorant of this crime, so apparent to our countryman William. Of Malmesbury, L3P107, and Roger de Hoveden, P710, in Scripture Post Badam, and the latter can tell, how the just Alexius married, crowned, and burnt alive, his female accomplice. The English historian is indeed so blind, that he ranks Robert Giscar, or Whiskered, among the knights of Henry I, who ascended the throne fifteen years after the Duke of Apulia's death. 93. Return, the joyful Anacomna scatters some flowers over the grave of an enemy, Alexiad, LVP 162-166, and his best. Praise is the esteem and envy of William the Conqueror, the sovereign of his family Grisia, says Malatera, Hostibius. Recedentibus libera laetiqui evit, Apulia totus of Calabria. Turbata. 94. Return, U urbis benu sina ni tet tantis de corata sepulchris, is. One of the last lines of the Apulian's poems, LVP 278. William of Malmesbury, L3P 107, inserts an epitaph on. Giscar, which is not worth transcribing. 95. Return, yet Horace had few obligations to Benusia, he was. Carried to Rome in his childhood, Sermai 6, and his repeated. Allusions to the doubtful limit of Apulia and Lucania, Carm 3. 4. Serm. 2i, are unworthy of his age and genius. 96. Return, C. Gianoni, Tom 2p 88-93, and the historians. Of the Fire Crusade. Of human life, the most glorious or humble prospects are alike. And soon bounded by the sepulchre. The male line of Robert. Giscar was extinguished, both in Apulia and at Antioch, in the second generation, but his younger brother became the father of a line of kings, and the son of the great count was endowed with the name, the conquests, and the spirit, of the first Roger. 97. The heir of that Norman adventurer was born in Sicily, and, at the age of only four years, he succeeded to the sovereignty of the island, a lot which reason might envy, could she indulge for a moment the visionary, though virtuous wish of dominion. Had Roger been content with his fruitful patrimony, a happy end, grateful people might have blessed their benefactor, and if a wise administration could have restored the prosperous times of the Greek colonies, 98 The opulence and power of Sicily alone might have equaled the widest scope that could be acquired and desolated by the sword of war. But the ambition of the great Count was ignorant of these noble pursuits, it was gratified by the vulgar means of violence and artifice. He sought to obtain the undivided possession of Palermo, of which one moiety had been ceded to the elder branch, struggled to enlarge his Calabrian limits beyond the measure of former treaties, and impatiently watched the declining health of his cousin William of Apulia, the grandson of Robert. On the first intelligence of his premature death, Roger sailed from Palermo with seven galleys, cast anchor in the Bay of Salerno, received, after ten days' negotiation, an 
oath of fidelity from the Norman capital, commanded the submission of the barons, and extorted a legal investiture from the reluctant popes, who could not long endure either the friendship or enmity of a powerful vassal. The sacred spot of Benevento was respectfully spared, as the patrimony of Street Peter. But the reduction of Capua and Naples completed the design of his uncle Giscar, and the sole inheritance of the Norman conquests was possessed by the victorious Roger. A conscious superiority of power and merit prompted him to disdain the titles of Duke and of Count, and the Isle of Sicily, with a third perhaps of the continent of Italy, might form the basis of a kingdom 99 which would only yield to the monarchies of France and England. The chiefs of the nation who attended his coronation at Palermo might doubtless pronounce under what name he should reign over them. But the example of a Greek tyrant or a Saracen emir was insufficient to justify his regal character, and the nine kings of the Latin world 100 might disclaim their new associate, unless he were consecrated by the authority of the supreme pontiff. The pride of Anacletus was pleased to confer a title, which the pride of the Norman had stooped to solicit, 101 but his own legitimacy was attacked by the adverse election of Innocent II, and while Anacletus sat in the Vatican, the successful fugitive was acknowledged by the nations of Europe. The infant monarchy of Roger was shaken, and almost overthrown, by the unlucky choice of an ecclesiastical patron, and the sword of Lothair II of Germany, the excommunications of Innocent, the fleets of Pisa, and the zeal of Street. Bernard, were united for the ruin of the Sicilian robber. After a gallant resistance, the Norman prince was driven from the continent of Italy, a new duke of Apulia was Invested by the Pope and the Emperor, each of whom held one end of the Gonfanon, or flagstaff, as a token that they asserted their right, and suspended their quarrel. But such jealous friendship was of short and precarious duration, the German armies soon vanished in disease and desertion, 102 the Apollyon Duke with all his adherents, was exterminated by a conqueror who seldom forgave either the dead or the living, like his predecessor Leo IX, the feeble though haughty pontiff, became the captive and friend of the Normans, and their reconciliation was celebrated by the eloquence of Bernard, who now revered the title and virtues of the King of Sicily. 97. Return, the reign of Roger, and the Norman kings of Sicily. Phil's Books of the Historia Civile of Giannoni, Tom 2 L. 11, XIV P. 136-340, and is spread over the Ixth and XTH volumes of the Italian Annals of Muratori. In the Bibliotheca Italici. Tom, I.P. 175-122, I find a useful abstract of Capace Latro, a modern Neapolitan, who has composed, in two volumes, the history of his country from Roger Frederick II. Inclusive. 98. Return, according to the testimony of Felistus and Diodorus, the tyrant Dionysius of Syracuse could maintain a standing force of 10,000 horse, 100,000 foot, and 400 galleys. Compare Hume, Essays, Vol. I. P. 268, 
435, and his adversary. Wallace, Numbers of Mankind, p. 306, 307. The Ruins of Agregentum are the theme of every traveler, D. Orville, Reidisal. Swinburne, N.C. 99, Return, a contemporary historian of the Acts of Roger Fromm. The year 1127-1135, founds his title on merit and power, the consent of the barons, and the ancient royalty of Sicily and Palermo, without introducing Pope Anacletus, Alexander Cinebii. Telesini Abatis de Rebus Gestus Regis Rogerii, Lib. 4. In. Muratori, Scripture. Rerum Italian Tom. V. P. 607 645. 100. Return, The Kings of France, England, Scotland, Castile. Aragon, Navarre, Sweden, Denmark, and Hungary. The three first were more ancient than Charlemagne, the three next were created by their sword, the three last by their baptism, and of these they King of Hungary alone was honored or debased by a papal crown. 101, return, face Jews, and a crowd of Sicilians, had imagined a more early and independent coronation, A.D. 1130, May 1st, which Giannone unwillingly rejects, Tom 2 p. 137-144. This fiction is disproved by the silence of contemporaries, nor can it be restored by a spurious character of Messina, Muratori, Annali d. Italia, Tom. 9p 340. Page I, Ktidika, Tom. 4p 467, 468. 102, Return, Roger corrupted the second person of Lothair's army, who sounded, or rather cried, a retreat, for the Germans. Cessin Amos, L3C, IP 51 are ignorant of the use of trumpets. Most ignorant himself. Asterisk note, Sin Amos says nothing of their ignorance M. As a penance for his impious war against the successor of Street. Peter, that monarch might have promised to display the banner of the cross, and he accomplished with ardor a vow so propitious to his interest in revenge. The recent injuries of Sicily might provoke a just retaliation on the heads of the Saracens, the Normans, whose blood had been mingled with so many subject streams, were encouraged to remember and emulate the naval trophies of their fathers, and in the maturity of their strength. They contended with the decline of an African power. When the Fatimite Caliph departed for the conquest of Egypt, he rewarded the real merit and apparent fidelity of his servant Joseph with a gift of his royal mantle, and forty Arabian horses, his palace, with its sumptuous furniture, and the government of the kingdoms of Tunis and Algiers. The Zyrides, 103 The Descendants of Joseph, forgot their allegiance and gratitude to a distant benefactor, grasped and abused the fruits of prosperity, and after running the little course of an oriental dynasty, were now fainting in their own weakness. On the side of the land, they were pressed by the al Mohades, the fanatic princes of Morocco. While the sea coast was open to the enterprises of the Greeks and Franks, who, before the close of the 11th century, had 
extorted a ransom of 200,000 pieces of gold. By the first arms of Roger, the island, or Rock of Malta, which has been since ennobled by a military and religious colony, was inseparably annexed to the crown of Sicily. Tripoli, 104 a strong and maritime city, was the next object of his attack, and the slaughter of the males, the captivity of the females, might be justified by the frequent practice of the Moslems themselves. The capital of the Zyredes was named Africa from the country, and Mahadiya 105 from the Arabian founder, it is strongly built on a neck of land, but the imperfection of the harbour is not compensated by the fertility of the adjacent plain. Mahadiya was besieged by George the Sicilian admiral, with a fleet of one hundred and fifty galleys, amply provided with men and the instruments of mischief, the sovereign had fled, the Moorish governor refused to capitulate, declined the last end, irresistible assault, and secretly escaping with the Moslem. Inhabitants abandoned the place and its treasures to the rapacious Franks. In successive expeditions, the king of Sicily or his lieutenants reduced the cities of Tunis, Safax, Capsia, Bona, and a long tract of the sea coast, 106 the fortresses were garrisoned, the country was tributary, and a boast that it held. Africa in subjection might be inscribed with some flattery on the sword of Roger. 107 after his death, that sword was broken, and these transmarine possessions were neglected, evacuated, or lost under the troubled reign of his successor. 108 The triumphs of Scipio and Belisarius have proved that the African continent is neither inaccessible nor invincible, yet the great princes and powers of Christendom have repeatedly failed in their armaments against the Moors, who may still glory in the easy conquest and long servitude of Spain. 103. Return, C. D. Gaines, History. Generate de Huns, Tom. I. P. 369-373 and Cardin, History de l'Afrique, and C. Su La. Domination de Autaves Tom. 2 p. 70-144. Their common original. Appears to be no very. 104. Return, Tripoli, says the Nubian geographer, or more. Properly the Sharif al Adrisi, Urbis Fortis, Sacchio Muro Vallada. Sita pro blitis maris hank expugnavit roach rias, qui muli aribus. Captivus ductis, veros per mit. 105, return, see the geography of Leo Africanus, in Remugio. Tom. I, following 74 verso. Following 75, recto, and chasse travels, p. 110, the Aeth Book of Thuanus, and the Zith of the Abbey D. Verto. The possession and defense of the place was offered by Charles V. and wisely declined by the Knights of Malta. 106, return, page I has accurately marked the African conquests. Of Roger and his criticism was supplied by his friend the Abbe D. Longueru with some Arabic memorials, A.D. 1147, number 26, 27. A.D. 1148, number 16, A.D. 1153, number 16. 107, return, Apilus E.T. Calabar, 
Siculus mihi servit etafer. A. Proud inscription, which denotes that the Norman conquerors were still discriminated from their Christian and Muslim subjects. 108. Return, Hugo Falcandus, History Sicula, in Muratori, Scripture. Tom. 7 p. 270, 271, ascribes these losses to the neglect or treachery of the Admiral Majo. Since the decease of Robert Giscar, the Normans had relinquished, above sixty years, their hostile designs against the Empire of the East. The policy of Roger solicited a public and private union with the Greek princes, whose alliance would dignify his regal character, he demanded in marriage a daughter of the Comnian family, and the first steps of the treaty seemed to promise a favorable event. But the contemptuous treatment of his ambassadors exasperated the vanity of the new monarch, and the insolence of the Byzantine court was expiated, according to the laws of nations, by the sufferings of a guiltless people. 109. With the fleet of seventy galleys, George, the Admiral of Sicily, appeared before Corfu, and both the island and city were delivered into his hands by the disaffected inhabitants, who had Yet to learn that a siege is still more calamitous than a tribute. In this invasion, of some moment in the annals of commerce, the Normans spread themselves by sea, and over the provinces of Greece, and the venerable age of Athens, Thebes, and Corinth, was violated by rapine and cruelty. Of the wrongs of Athens, no memorial remains. The ancient walls, which encompassed, without guarding, the opulence of Thebes, were scaled by the Latin Christians, but their sole use of the gospel was to sanctify an oath that the lawful owners had not secreted any relic of their inheritance or industry. On the approach of the Normans, the lower town of Corinth was evacuated, the Greeks retired to the citadel, which was seated on a lofty eminence, abundantly watered by the classic fountain of Pyrene, an impregnable fortress, if the want of courage could be balanced by any advantages of art or nature. As soon as the besiegers had surmounted the labor, their sole labor, of climbing the hill. Their general, from the commanding eminence, admired his own victory, and testified his gratitude to heaven, by tearing from the altar the precious image of Theodore, the tutelary saint. The silk weavers of both sexes, whom George transported to Sicily, composed the most valuable part of the spoil, and in comparing the skillful industry of the mechanic with the sloth and cowardice of the soldier, he was heard to exclaim that the distaff and loom were the only weapons which the Greeks were capable of using. The progress of this naval armament was marked by two conspicuous events, the rescue of the King of France, and the insult of the Byzantine capital. In his return by sea from an unfortunate crusade, Louis VII was intercepted by the Greeks, who basely violated the laws of honor and religion. The fortunate encounter of the Norman fleet delivered the royal captive, and after a free and honorable entertainment in the court of Sicily, Louis continued his journey to Rome and Paris. 110 In the absence of the emperor, Constantinople and the Hellespont were left 
without defense and without the suspicion of danger. The clergy and people, for the soldiers had followed the standard of Manuel, were astonished and dismayed at the hostile appearance of a line of galleys, which boldly cast anchor in the front of the imperial city. The forces of the Sicilian admiral were inadequate to the siege or assault of an immense and populous metropolis, but George enjoyed the glory of humbling the Greek arrogance, and of marking the path of conquest to the navies of the West. He landed some soldiers to rifle the fruits of the royal gardens, and pointed with silver, or most probably with fire, the arrows which he discharged against the palace of the Caesars. 111 This playful outrage of the pirates of Sicily, who had surprised an unguarded moment, Manuel affected to despise, while his martial spirit, and the forces of the empire, were awakened to revenge. The archipelago and Ionian Sea were covered with his squadrons and those of Venice, but I know not by what favorable allowance of transports, vittlers, and pinnaces, our reason, or even our fancy, can be reconciled to the stupendous account of fifteen hundred vessels, which is proposed by a Byzantine historian. These operations were directed with prudence and energy, in his homeward voyage George lost nineteen of his galleys, which were separated and taken, after an obstinate defense, Corfu implored the clemency of her lawful sovereign, nor could a ship, a soldier, of the Norman prince, be found, unless as a captive within the limits of the Eastern Empire. The prosperity and the health of Roger were already in a declining state, while he listened in his palace of Palermo to the messengers of victory or defeat, the invincible Manuel, the foremost in every assault, was celebrated by the Greeks and Latins as the Alexander or the Hercules of the age. 109, Return, The Silence of the Sicilian Historians, Who End Too Soon, or Begin Too Late, Must Be Supplied by Otho of Friday's Ingen, a German, D. Justice Fredericii I. L. I. C. 33, in Muratori, Scripture Tom. 6 p. 668, The Venetian Andrew Dandulus. I.D. Tom, 12 p. 282, 283, and the Greek writers Sin Amos, L. 3 c. 2 to 5, and Nystus, in Manuel, L. 3 c. 1 to 6. 110, Return, to this imperfect capture and speedy rescue I. Apply Sin Amos, L. 2. c. 19, p. 49. Muratori, Intolerable Evidence, Annali Detalia, Tom 9p, 420, 421, laughs at the delicacy of the French, who maintain, Marisk nullo impdiente, periculo ad regnum proprium reversum esse, yet I observe that their advocate, Duckenge, is less positive as the commentator on Sin Amos, then as the editor of Joinville. 111, Return, in Palladium Regium Sagittas Ignaeus Ingesit, says. Dandulus, but Nystus, L. 2c8, p. 66, transforms them, and adds, that Manuel styled this insult. These arrows, by the compiler, Vincent de Beauvais, are again transmuted into gold. Chapter LVI, The Saracens, The Franks and the Normans, Part V. 
a prince of such a temper could not be satisfied with having repelled the insolence of a barbarian. It was the right and duty. It might be the interest and glory of Manuel to restore the ancient majesty of the empire, to recover the provinces of Italy and Sicily, and to chastise this pretended king, the grandson of a Norman vassal. 112 The natives of Calabria were still attached to the Greek language and worship, which had been inexorably proscribed by the Latin clergy, after the loss of her dukes. Apulia was chained as a servile appendage to the crown of Sicily. The founder of the monarchy had ruled by the sword, and his death had abetted the fear, without healing the discontent, of his subjects. The feudal government was always pregnant with the seeds of rebellion, and a nephew of Roger himself invited the enemies of his family and nation. The Majesty of the Purple, and a series of Hungarian and Turkish wars, prevented Manuel from embarking his person in the Italian expedition. To the brave end, noble Paleologus, his lieutenant, the Greek monarch entrusted a fleet and army, the siege of Bari was his first exploit, and, in every operation, gold as well as steel was the instrument of victory. Salerno, and some places along the western coast, maintained their fidelity to the Norman king, but he lost in two campaigns the greater part of his continental possessions, and the modest emperor, disdaining all flattery and falsehood, was content with the reduction of three hundred cities or villages of Apulia and Calabria, whose names and titles were inscribed on all the walls of the palace. The prejudices of the Latins were gratified by a genuine or fictitious donation under the seal of the German Caesars, 113 but the successor of Constantine soon renounced this ignominious pretense, claimed the indefeasible dominion of Italy, and professed his design of chasing the barbarians beyond the Alps. By the artful speeches, liberal gifts, and unbounded promises, of their eastern ally, the free cities were encouraged to persevere in their generous struggle. Against the despotism of Frederick Barbarossa, the walls of Milan were rebuilt by the contributions of Manuel, and he poured, says the historian, a river of gold into the bosom of Ancona, whose attachment to the Greeks was fortified by the jealous enmity of the Venetians. 114 The situation and trade of Ancona rendered it an important garrison in the heart of Italy, it was twice besieged by the arms of Frederick, the imperial forces were twice repulsed by the spirit of freedom, that spirit was animated by the ambassador of Constantinople, and the most intrepid patriots, the most faithful servants, were rewarded by the wealth and honors of the Byzantine court. 115 The pride of Manuel disdained and rejected a barbarian colleague, his ambition was excited by the hope of stripping the purple from the German usurpers, and of establishing, in the West, as in the East, his lawful title of sole emperor of the Romans. With this view, he solicited the alliance of the people and the Bishop of Rome. Several of the nobles embraced the cause of the Greek monarch, the splendid nuptials of his niece with Odo Frangipani secured the support of that powerful family, 116 and his royal standard or image was 
entertained with due reverence in the ancient metropolis. 117. During the quarrel between Frederick and Alexander III, the Pope twice received in the Vatican the ambassadors of Constantinople. They flattered his piety by the long promised union of the two churches, tempted the avarice of his venal court, and exhorted the Roman pontiff to seize the just provocation, the favorable moment, to humble the savage insolence of the Alemanni and to acknowledge the true representative of Constantine and Augustus. 118. 112. Return, for the invasion of Italy, which is almost overlooked by Nystus. See the more polite history of Sinamus. L. 4 C. 1 to 15, p. 78 to 101 who introduces a diffuse narrative by a lofty profession, 3. 5. 113, Return, the Latin, Otho, de Justice Fredericii I L2C. 30, p. 734, attests the forgery, the Greek, Sinamus, L4C. 1, p. 78 claims a promise of restitution from Conrad and Frederick. An act of fraud is always credible when it is told of the Greeks. 114, return, quot ancontiani Graecum imperium nimis diligerent, venity speciali odio ancanum aderent. The cause of love, perhaps of envy, were the beneficia. Flaminorium of the Emperor, and the Latin narrative is confirmed by Sinamus, L. 4c. 14, p. 98. 115. Return, Muratori mentions the two sieges of Ancona, the first, in 1167, against Frederick I. in person, Annally, Tom X. p. 39. And C. The second, in 1173, against his lieutenant Christian. Archbishop of Mentz, a man unworthy of his name and office, p. 76, and C. It is of the second siege that we possess an original narrative, which he has published in his great collection, Tom. 6p 921 to 946 116 return we derive this anecdote from an anonymous chronicle of fossa nova published by muratori scripture italian tom 7p 874 117 return sinamus l 4c 14 p. 99, is susceptible of this double sense. A standard is more Latin, an image more Greek. 118, return, nihila minus quoque put bat, utichia occasio justa. Et tempos opportunum et acceptabile se obtolerant, Romani corona. Imperii Sancto Apostolo Sibi Rhetoriter, Quanium non ad. Frederici Alemanni, sed ad suum us as root pretty near, vit. Alexandri III. A Cardinal. Aragonia, in Scripture. Rerum Italian. Tom. 3 PARIP 458. His second embassy was accompanied cum immensa multitudine pecuniarum. But these Italian conquests, this universal reign, soon escaped from the hand of the Greek emperor. His first demands were eluded by the prudence of Alexander III, who passed on this deep and momentous revolution. 119 Nor could the Pope be seduced by a 
personal dispute to renounce the perpetual inheritance of the Latin name. After the reunion with Frederick, he spoke a more peremptory language, confirmed the acts of his predecessors, excommunicated the adherents of Manuel, and pronounced the final separation of the churches, or at least the empires, of Constantinople and Rome. 120 The free cities of Lombardy no longer remembered their foreign benefactor, and without preserving the friendship of Ancona, he soon incurred the enmity of Venice. 121 By his own avarice, or the complaints of his subjects, the Greek emperor was provoked to arrest the persons and confiscate the effects of the Venetian merchants. This violation of the public faith exasperated a free and commercial people, 100 galleys were launched and armed in as many days, they swept the coasts of Dalmatia and Greece, but after some mutual wounds, the war was terminated by an agreement. Inglorious to the empire, insufficient for the republic, and a complete vengeance of these and of fresh injuries was reserved for the succeeding generation. The lieutenant of Manuel had informed his sovereign that he was strong enough to quell any domestic revolt of Apulia and Calabria, but that his forces were inadequate to resist the impending attack of the king of Sicily. His prophecy was soon verified, the death of Paleologus devolved. The command on several chiefs, alike eminent in rank, alike defective in military talents, the Greeks were oppressed by land and sea, and a captive remnant that escaped the swords of the Normans and Saracens, abjured all future hostility against the person or dominions of their conqueror. 122 Yet the king of Sicily esteemed the courage and constancy of Manuel, who had landed a second army on the Italian shore, he respectfully addressed the new Justinian, solicited a peace or truce of thirty years, accepted as a gift the regal title, and acknowledged himself the military vassal of the Roman Empire. 123 The Byzantine Caesars acquiesced in this shadow of dominion, without expecting, perhaps without desiring, the service of a Norman army, and the truce of thirty years was not disturbed by any hostilities between Sicily and Constantinople. About the end of that period, the throne of Manuel was usurped by an inhuman tyrant, who had deserved the abhorrence of his country and mankind, the sword of William II, the grandson of Roger, was drawn by a fugitive of the Comnian race, and the subjects of Andronicus might salute the strangers as friends, since they detested their sovereign as the worst of enemies. The Latin Historians 124 expatiate on the rapid progress of the four counts who invaded Romania with a fleet and army, and reduced many castles and cities to the obedience of the king of Sicily. The Greeks 125 accuse and magnify the wanton and sacrilegious cruelties that were perpetrated in the sack of Thessalonica, the second city of the empire. The former deplore the fate of those invincible but unsuspecting warriors who were destroyed by the arts of a vanquished foe. The latter applaud, in songs of triumph, the repeated victories of their countrymen on the sea of Marmora or Propontis, on the banks of the Strymon, and under the walls of Durazzo. 
a revolution which punished the crimes of Andronicus, had united against the Franks the zeal and courage of the successful insurgents, ten thousand were slain in battle, and Isaac Angelus, the new emperor, might indulge his vanity or vengeance in the treatment of four thousand captives. Such was the event of the last contest between the Greeks and Normans. Before the expiration of twenty years, the rival nations were lost or degraded in foreign servitude, and the successors of Constantine did not long survive to insult the fall of the Sicilian monarchy. 119, Return, Nimes Alta et Perplexa Sunt, V.I.T. Alexandri 3 p. 460, 461, says the cautious Pope. 120, Return, Sin Amos, L. 4c 14, p. 99. 121, Return, in his fifth book, Sin Amos describes the Venetian War, which Nystas has not thought worthy of his attention. The Italian accounts, which do not satisfy our curiosity, are reported by the Analyst Muratori, under the years 1171, and c. 122, return, this victory is mentioned by Romwald of Salerno. In Muratori, Scripture Italian Tom 7 p. 198. It is whimsical. Enough that in the praise of the king of Sicily, Sin Amos, L. 4 c. 13, p. 97, 98, is much warmer and copious than Falcandus. p. 268, 270. But the Greek is fond of description, and the Latin historian is not fond of William the Bad. 123, Return for the epistle of William I. C. Sin Amos, L. 4. C. 15, p. 101, 102, and Nystus, L. 2 C. 8. It is difficult to affirm whether these Greeks deceived themselves, or they public, in these flattering portraits of the grandeur of the empire. 124. Return, I can only quote, of original evidence, the poor. Chronicles of Sicard of Cremona, p. 603, and of Fossa Nova, p. 875, as they are published in the eighth tome of Muratori's. Historians. The king of Sicily sent his troops contra Nequisham. Andronisi. At Aquirendum Imperium C. P. They were. Decepti. Capta Key, by Isaac. 125, Return, by the failure of Sin Amos to Nystus, in. Antonico, L. C. 7, 8, 9, L. 2. C. 1, in Isaac Angelo, L. I. C. 1 to 4 who now becomes a respectable contemporary. As he survived the emperor and the empire, he is above flattery, but the fall of Constantinople exasperated his prejudices against the Latins. 4. The honor of learning I shall observe that Homer's great commentator, Eustathius Archbishop of Thessalonica, refused to Desert his flock. The scepter of Roger successively devolved to his son and grandson, they might be confounded under the name of William. They are strongly discriminated by the epithets of the bad end. The good, but these epithets, which appear to describe the perfection of vice and virtue, cannot strictly be applied to either of the Norman princes. When he was roused to arms by 
Danger and shame, the first William did not degenerate from the valor of his race, but his temper was slothful, his manners were dissolute, his passions headstrong and mischievous, and the monarch is responsible, not only for his personal vices, but for those of Majo, the great admiral, who abused the confidence, and conspired against the life, of his benefactor. From the Arabian conquest, Sicily had imbibed a deep tincture of oriental manners. The despotism, the pomp, and even the harem, of a sultan, and a Christian people was oppressed and insulted by the ascendant of the eunuchs, who openly professed, or secretly cherished, the religion of Muhammad. An eloquent historian of the times 126 has delineated the misfortunes of his country, 127 the ambition and fall of the ungrateful Majo, the revolt and punishment of his assassins, the imprisonment and deliverance of the king himself, the private feuds that arose from the public confusion, and the various forms of calamity and discord which afflicted Palermo, the island, and the continent, during the reign of William the First, and the minority of his son, the youth, innocence, and beauty of William the Second, 128 endeared him to the nation, the factions were reconciled, the laws were revived, and from the manhood to the premature death of that amiable prince, Sicily, enjoyed a short season of peace, justice and happiness, whose value was enhanced by the remembrance of the past and the dread of futurity. The legitimate male posterity of Tancred of Hauteville was extinct in the person of the second William, but his aunt, the daughter of Roger, had married the most powerful prince of the age, and Henry VI, the son of Frederick. Barbarossa, descended from the Alps to claim the imperial crown and the inheritance of his wife. Against the unanimous wish of a free people, this inheritance could only be acquired by arms, and I am pleased to transcribe the style and sense of the historian Falcandus, who writes at the moment, and on the spot, with the feelings of a patriot, and the prophetic eye of a statesman. Constantia, the daughter of Sicily, nursed from her cradle in the pleasures and plenty, and educated in the arts and manners of this fortunate isle, departed long since to enrich the barbarians with our treasures, and now returns, with her savage allies, to contaminate the beauties of her venerable parent. Already I behold the swarms of angry barbarians, our opulent cities, the places flourishing in a long peace, are shaken with fear, desolated by slaughter, consumed by rapine, and polluted by intemperance and lust. I see the massacre or captivity of our citizens, the rapes of our virgins and matrons. 129 In this extremity, he interrogates a friend, how must the Sicilians act? By the unanimous election of a king of valor and experience, Sicily and Calabria might yet be preserved, 130 for in the levity of the Apollians, ever eager for new revolutions, I can repose neither confidence nor hope. 131 Should Calabria be lost, they lofty towers, the numerous youth, and the naval strength, of Messina, 132, might guard the passage against a foreign invader. If the savage Germans coalesce with the pirates of Messina, if 
they destroy with fire the fruitful region, so often wasted by the fires of Mount Etna, 133 What resource will be left for the interior parts of the island, these noble cities which should Never be violated by the hostile footsteps of a barbarian? 134. Katana has again been overwhelmed by an earthquake, the ancient virtue of Syracuse expires in poverty and solitude, 135. But Palermo is still crowned with a diadem, and her triple walls enclose the active multitudes of Christians and Saracens. If they two nations, under one king, can unite for their common safety, they may rush on the barbarians with invincible arms. But if they Saracens, fatigued by a repetition of injuries, should now retire and rebel, if they should occupy the castles of the mountains and seacoast, the unfortunate Christians, exposed to a double attack, and placed as it were between the hammer and the anvil, must resign themselves to hopeless and inevitable servitude. 136. We must not forget, that a priest here prefers his country to his religion, and that the Moslems, whose alliance he seeks, were still numerous and powerful in the state of Sicily. 126, Return, the Historia Sicula of Hugo Falcandus, which properly extends from 1154 to 1169, is inserted in the 8th volume of Muratori's collection, Tom 7p 259-344, and preceded by an eloquent preface or epistle, p. 251-258, d. Calamitatibus Sicilii. Falcandus has been styled the Tacitus of Sicily, and, after a just, but immense, abatement, from the East to the Zeeth century, from a senator to a monk, I would not strip him of his title, his narrative is rapid and perspicuous, his style bold and elegant, his observation keen, he had studied mankind, and feels like a man. I can only regret the narrow end, barren field on which his labors have been cast. 127, Return, the Laborious Benedictines, Lard de Verifier Lay. Dates, p. 896, are of opinion that the true name of Falcandus is Falcandus, or Foucault. According to them, Hugues Foucault, a Frenchman by birth, and at length abbot of Street, Denis, had followed into Sicily his patron Stephen de la Perche, uncle to the mother of William II, Archbishop of Palermo, and great Chancellor of the Kingdom. Yet Falcandus has all the feelings of a Sicilian, and the title of alumnus, which he bestows on himself, appears to indicate that he was born, or at least educated, in the island. 128, Return, Falcand p. 303. Richard D. Street. Germano begins his history from the death and praises of William II. After some unmeaning epithets, he thus continues, Carolina legislative et justicii cultus. Tempor suo vigebat in regno, sua erat quilibet sort conti Were they mortals, abici pax, ubique securitas, nec latrinum. Machue baviator insidias, nec maris nata offendicula piraterum. Scripture rerum Italian Tom, 7p 939. 129. Return, 
Constantia, Primus Acunabulis in Delicia Run. Tuarum Affluentia Diodius Educata, Tuisk Institutis, Doctrinus. Et Moribus Informata, Tandem Apibus Tuyas Barbaros Delatura. Decessit, Et Nunc Cum Imgentibus Copius Revertitur, Ut. Pulcher Rima Nutrisis Ornamenta Barbarica Fetitate Contaminate. Intuari mihi jam vidiar turbulentis barbarum aces. Civit aids opalantis et loca dioturna pace florentia, metu. Concutera, seed vast air, rapinus adorari, et fetar luxuria. Hin sives autorud gladius intercepti, autorud servitude depressi. Virgins constaprati, matroni, and c. 130, return, cert si regem non dubie ver utis elegerent, nec. A Saracenis Christiani disentiant, poterit rex credus rebus. Lysit quasi desper atis et perditis subveniri, et incursus. Hostium, si prudentur agerit, propulsar. 131, return, in Apulis, Key, Semper Novitate God Ents, Novarum. Rerum Studius Agunter, Nihil Arbitrae Spi Autorud Fiducia. Reponendum. 132, Return, Si Civium Tuorum Vertitum et Audacium Attendas. Muriorum Encium Ambitum Densis Turibus Circumceptum. 133, Return, Cum erudelitate piratica the utanum confligate. Atrocitas, et inter osbustus lapides, et ethni flagrants. Incendia, NC. 134, return, impartum, quam nobilis immerum civit autum fulgur. Illustrat, quae et todi regno singulari miruit privilegio. Primi near, Nefarium esset. Val barber orum ingressipului. I. Wish to transcribe his florid, but curious, description, of the palace, city, and luxuriant plain of Palermo. 135, return, vires non supitunt, et conatus tuas taminopia. Civium, quam positus bellatora militunt. 136, return, the Normans and Sicilians appear to be confounded. The hopes, or at least the wishes, of Falcandus were at first gratified by the free and unanimous election of Tancred, the grandson of the first king, whose birth was illegitimate, but whose civil and military virtues shone without a blemish. During four years, the term of his life and reign, he stood in arms on the farthest verge of the Apulian frontier, against the powers of Germany, and the restitution of a royal captive, of Constantia. Herself, without injury or ransom, may appear to surpass the most liberal measure of policy or reason. After his decease, the kingdom of his widow and infant son fell without a struggle, and Henry pursued his victorious march from Capua to Palermo. The political balance of Italy was destroyed by his success, and if the Pope and the free cities had consulted their obvious and real interest, they would have combined the powers of earth and heaven to prevent the dangerous union of the German Empire with the Kingdom of Sicily. But the subtle policy, for which the Vatican has so often been praised or arraigned, was on this occasion blind and inactive, and if it were true that Celestine III had kicked away the imperial crown from the head of the prostrate Henry, 137 such an act of impotent pride could serve only to 
cancel an obligation and provoke an enemy. The Genoese, who enjoyed a beneficial trade and establishment in Sicily, listened to the promise of his boundless gratitude and speedy departure. 138 Their fleet commanded the Straits of Messina, and opened the harbour of Palermo, and the first act of his government was to abolish the privileges, and to seize the property, of these imprudent allies. The last hope of Falcandus was defeated by the discord of the Christians and Mahometans, they fought in the capital, several thousands of the latter were slain, but their surviving brethren fortified the mountains, and disturbed above. Thirty years the peace of the island. By the policy of Frederick the second, sixty thousand Saracens were transplanted to Nasera in Apulia. In their wars against the Roman Church, the Emperor and his son Mainfroy were strengthened and disgraced by the service of the enemies of Christ, and this national colony maintained their religion and manners in the heart of Italy, till they were extirpated, at the end of the 13th century, by the zeal and revenge of the House of Anjou. 139 All they Calamities which the prophetic orator had deplored were surpassed by the cruelty and avarice of the German conqueror. He violated the royal sepulchres, 1391 and explored the secret treasures of the palace, Palermo, and the whole kingdom, the pearls and jewels, however precious, might be easily removed, but one. Hundred and sixty horses were laden with the gold and silver of Sicily. One hundred forty the young king, his mother, and sisters, and they nobles of both sexes, were separately confined in the fortresses of the Alps, and, on the slightest rumor of rebellion, they captives were deprived of life, of their eyes, or of the hope of Posterity. Constantia herself was touched with sympathy for the miseries of her country, and the heiress of the Norman line might struggle to check her despotic husband, and to save the patrimony of her newborn son, of an emperor so famous in the next age. Under the name of Frederick II. Ten years after this revolution, the French monarchs annexed to their crown the Duchy of Normandy, the scepter of her ancient dukes had been transmitted, by a granddaughter of William the Conqueror, to the House of Plantagenet, and the adventurous Normans, who had raised so many trophies in France, England, and Ireland, in Apulia, Sicily, and the East, were lost either in victory or servitude among the vanquished nations. 137. Return, the testimony of an Englishman, of Roger D. Hoveden, p. 689, will lightly weigh against the silence of German and Italian history, Muratori, Annali d'Italia, Tom X. p. 156. The priests and pilgrims, who returned from Rome, exalted, by every tale, the omnipotence of the Holy Father. 138. Return, ego enim in eo cum tut in ICI's manor and non debio. Kafari, Anal. Genuenses, in Muratori, Scripture rerum. Italicarum, Tom 6. P. 367, 368. 139, Return, for the Saracens of Sicily and Nasera, see they. Annals of Muratori, Tom X. P. 149, and A.D. 1223, 
1247. Giannoni, Tom 2p 385, and of the originals, in Muratori's collection, Richard D. Street. Germano, Tom 7p 996, Matteo. Spinelli di Giovinazzo, Tom 7p 1064, Nicholas D. Jamzilla, Tom XP 494, and Matrio Villani, Tom 14L 7. P 103. The last of these insinuates that, in reducing the Saracens of Nasera, Charles II. Of Anjou employed rather artifice. Then violence. 1391, return, it is remarkable that at the same time the tombs of the Roman emperors, even of Constantine himself, were violated and ransacked by their degenerate successor Alexius Comnus, in order to enable him to pay the German tribute exacted by the menaces of the Emperor Henry. See the end of the first book of The Life of Alexius, in Nystus, p. 632, edit m. 140, return, Muratori quotes a passage from Arnold of Lübeck. L. 4C. 20. Reparat thesoros absconditios, et omum lapidum. Preciosorum et gemarum gloriam, et a ut 1 or atis 160 somaris. Glorios ad terum suum retiarit. Roger de Hoveden, who mentions the violation of the royal tombs and corpses, computes the spoil of Salerno at 200,000 ounces of gold, p. 746. On these occasions, I am almost tempted to exclaim with the listening maid. In La Fontaine, J. E. Vaudroy Biavuar C. E. Key Monk. Chapter LVII, The Turks Part I. The Turks of the House of Seljuk, their revolt against Mahmud. Conqueror of Hindostan, Tagral subdues Persia, and protects the Caliph's defeat and captivity of the Emperor Romanus Diogenes by Alp Arslan, power and magnificence of Malik Shah, conquest of Asia, Minor and Syria, state and oppression of Jerusalem, pilgrimages to the Holy Sepulchre. From the Isle of Sicily, the reader must transport himself beyond the Caspian Sea, to the original seat of the Turks or Turkmens, against whom the First Crusade was principally directed. There, Scythian Empire of the 6th century was long since dissolved, but the name was still famous among the Greeks and Orientals, and the fragments of the nation, each a powerful and independent people, were scattered over the desert from China to the Oxus and the Danube, the colony of Hungarians was admitted into the Republic of Europe, and the thrones of Asia were occupied by slaves and soldiers of Turkish extraction, while Apulia and Sicily were subdued by the Norman lands, a swarm of these Northern shepherds overspread the kingdoms of Persia, there. Princes of the race of Seljuk erected a splendid and solid empire. From Samarkand to the confines of Greece and Egypt, and the Turks have maintained their dominion in Asia Minor, till the victorious crescent has been planted on the Dome of Street. Sophia one of the greatest of the Turkish princes was Mahmud or Mahmud. One the Ghaznavide, who reigned in the eastern provinces of Persia. One thousand years after the birth of Christ. His father, Sebektaji was the slave of the slave of the slave of the commander of the faithful. But in this descent of servitude, the first degree was merely titular 
since it was filled by the sovereign of Transoxiana and Chaasan, who still paid a nominal allegiance to the Caliph of Baghdad. The second rank was that of a minister of state, a lieutenant of the Samanides, too who broke, by his revolt, the bonds of political slavery. But the third step was a state of real and domestic servitude in the family of that rebel, from which Sebektaji, by his courage and dexterity, ascended to the supreme command of the city and provinces of Ghazna, three as the son-in-law and successor of his grateful master. The falling dynasty of the Samanides was at first protected, and at last overthrown, by their servants, and, in the public disorders, the fortune of Mahmud continually increased. From him, the title of Sultan IV was first invented, and his kingdom was enlarged from Transoxiana to the neighborhood of Ispahan, from the shores of the Caspian to the mouth of the industry. But they principal source of his fame and riches was the holy war which he waged against the Gentus of Hindostan. In this foreign narrative, I may not consume a page, and a volume would scarcely suffice to recapitulate the battles and sieges of his twelve expeditions. Never was the Musulman hero dismayed by the inclemency of the seasons, the height of the mountains, the breadth of the rivers, the barrenness of the desert, the multitudes of the enemy, or the formidable array of their elephants of war. 5. The Sultan of Ghazna surpassed the limits of the conquests of Alexander, after a march of three months, over the hills of Kashmir and Thibet, he reached the famous city of Kinaj, six on the upper Ganges, and, in a naval combat on one of the branches of the Indus, he fought and vanquished four thousand boats of the natives. Delhi, Lahir, and Multan, were compelled to open their gates, the fertile kingdom of Guzarat attracted his ambition and tempted his stay, and his Avarice indulged the fruitless project of discovering the golden and aromatic isles of the southern ocean. On the payment of a tribute, the Rajas preserved their dominions, the people, their lives and fortunes, but to the religion of Hindostan the zealous. Musulman was cruel and inexorable, many hundred temples, or pagodas, were leveled with the ground, many thousand idols were demolished, and the servants of the Prophet were stimulated and rewarded by the precious materials of which they were composed. The pagoda of Sumnat was situate on the promontory of Guzarat, in the neighborhood of Dio, one of the last remaining possessions of the Portuguese. 7. It was endowed with the revenue of 2,000 villages, 2,000 Brahmins were consecrated to the service of the deity, whom they washed each morning and evening in water. From the distant Ganges, the subordinate ministers consisted of 300 musicians, 300 barbers, and 500 dancing girls, conspicuous for their birth or beauty. Three sides of the temple were protected by the ocean, the narrow isthmus was fortified by a natural or artificial precipice, and the city and adjacent country were peopled by a nation of fanatics. They confessed the sins and the punishment of Kinnage and Delhi, but if the impious stranger should presume to approach their holy precincts, he would surely be overwhelmed by a blast of the divine vengeance. By this challenge, the faith of Mahmud was 
animated to a personal trial of the strength of this Indian deity. Fifty thousand of his worshippers were pierced by the spear of the Moslems, the walls were scaled, the sanctuary was profaned, and the conqueror aimed a blow of his iron mace at the head of the idol. The trembling Brahmins are said to have offered 10,711 sterling for his ransom, and it was urged by the wisest counselors that the destruction of a stone image would not change the hearts of the Gentus, and that such a sum might be dedicated to the relief of the true believers. Your reasons, replied the Sultan, are specious and strong, but never in the eyes of posterity shall Mahmud appear as a merchant of idols. 712 He repeated his blows, and a treasure of pearls and rubies. Concealed in the belly of the statue, explained in some degree the devout prodigality of the Brahmins. The fragments of the idol were distributed to Ghazna, Mecca, and Medina. Baghdad listened to the edifying tale, and Mahmud was saluted by the Caliph with the title of Guardian of the Fortune and Faith of Muhammad. 1. Return, I am indebted for his character and history to Deherbalus. Bibliotheca Rental, Mahmud, p. 533-537, M.D. Geens, Histoire des Huns, Tom 3 p. 155-173, and R. Countryman Colonel Alexander Dow, Vol. I. p. 23-83. In the two first volumes of his History of Hindostan, he styles himself the translator of the Persian Farishta, but in his florid text, it is not easy to distinguish the version and the original. Asterisk note, the European reader now possesses a more accurate version of Farishta, that of Colonel Briggs. Of Colonel Dow's work, Colonel Briggs observes that the author's name will be handed down to posterity as one of the earliest and most indefatigable of our Oriental scholars. Instead of confining himself, however, to mere translation, he has filled his work with his own observations, which have been so embodied in the text that Gibbon declares it. Impossible to distinguish the translator from the original author. Preface P. 7 M. 2. Return, the dynasty of the Samanites continued 125 years. AD 847 to 999, under ten princes. See their succession and ruin. In the tables of M. D. Geens. History de Huns, Tom I. P. 404-406, they were followed by the Ghaznavids, A.D. 999-1183. See Tom I. P. 239-240. His divisions of nations often disturbs the series of time and place. 3. Return Gaznaotos non habet, est emporium et domicilium. Mercaturi indicai. A bulf digeograph. Ryski, tab. XXIIIP. 349. Deherbalus, p. 364. It has not been visited by any modern traveler. 4. Return, by the ambassador of the Caliph of Baghdad, who employed an Arabian or Chalde word that signifies Lord and Master, Deherbalus, p. 825. It is interpreted by the Byzantine writers of the 11th century, and the name, 
sold anus, is familiarly employed in the Greek and Latin languages, after it had passed from the Ghaznavids to the Seljukides and other emirs of Asia and Egypt. Dukenj, Dissertation 16 Sir Join Vili, p. 238-240. Gloss. Grisi. E.T. Latin, labors to find the title of Sultan in the ancient kingdom of Persia, but his proofs are mere Shadows, a proper name in the themes of Constantine, 211, an Anticipation of Zonaras and C and a medal of K. Kosro, not, as He believes, the Sassanite of the Vith, but the Seljukid of Iconium of the Zeeth century, D. Geens, History de Huns, Tom. I. P. 246. 5. Return, Farishta, Apud Dao, History of Hindustan, Vol. I. P. 49, mentions the report of a gun in the Indian Army. But as I am slow in believing this premature, A.D. 1008, use of artillery, I must desire to scrutinize first the text, and then the authority of Farishta, who lived in the Mughal court in the last century. Asterisk. Note, this passage is differently written in the various manuscripts I have seen, and in some the word tope, gun, has been written for Nupth, Naptha, and Tufung, musket, for Kudung, arrow. But no Persian or Arabic history speaks of gunpowder. Before the time usually assigned for its invention, A.D. 1317, long after which, it was first applied to the purposes of war. Briggs's Farishta, Vol. I. P. 47, Note M. 6. Return, Kinoch, or Kanuj, the old Palimbathra, is marked in latitude 27 degrees 3 minutes, longitude 80 degrees 13 minutes. See Danville, Antiquite D. L. End, p. 60 to 62. Corrected by the local knowledge of Major Rennell, in his excellent memoir on his map of Hindostan, p. 37 to 43, 300. Jewelers, 30,000 shops for the Arikanut, 60,000 bands of musicians, and C. A bulfed geograph. Tab. 15 p. 274. Dow, Vol. I. P. 16, will allow an ample deduction. Asterisk note, Mr. Wilson, Hindu. Drama, Vol. 3 p. 12, and Schlegel, Indisk Bibliothek, Vol. 2 p. 394, concur in identifying Palimbathra with the Patalipara. Of the Indians, the Putna of the Moderns, M. 7. Return, the Idolaters of Europe, says Farishta, Dow, Vol. I. P. 66. Consult a Bullfeather, P. 272, and Reynolds' map of Hindostan. 711. Return, Farishta says, some crores of gold. Dow says, in a note at the bottom of the page, 10 millions, which is the explanation of the word crore. Mr. Gibbon says rashly that the sum offered by the Brahmins was 10 million sterling. Note 2. Mills India, Vol. 2p. 222. Colonel. Briggs's translation is a quantity of gold. The treasure found in the temple, perhaps in the image, according to major prices authorities, 
was 20 millions of dinars of gold, above 9 million sterling, but this was a hundredfold the ransom offered by the Brahmins. Price, Vol. 2p 290m. 712, return, rather than the idol broker, he chose to be called. Mahmud the idol breaker. Price, Vol. 2p 289m. From the paths of blood, and such is the history of nations, I cannot refuse to turn aside to gather some flowers of science or virtue. The name of Mahmud the Ghaznavide is still venerable in the East, his subjects enjoyed the blessings of prosperity and peace, his vices were concealed by the veil of religion, and two Familiar examples will testify his justice and magnanimity. I, as he sat in the divan, an unhappy subject bowed before the throne to accuse the insolence of a Turkish soldier who had driven him from his house and bed. Suspend your clamors, said Mahmud, inform me of his next visit, and ourself in person will judge and punish the offender. The Sultan followed his guide, invested the house with his guards, and extinguishing the torches, pronounced the death of the criminal, who had been seized in the act of rapine and adultery. After the execution of his sentence, the lights were rekindled, Mahmud fell prostrate in prayer, and rising from the ground, demanded some homely fare, which he devoured with the voraciousness of hunger. The poor man, whose injury he had avenged, was unable to suppress his astonishment and curiosity, and the courteous monarch condescended to explain the motives of this singular behavior. I had reason to suspect that none, except one of my sons, could dare to perpetrate such an outrage, and I extinguished the lights, that my justice might be blind and inexorable. My prayer was a thanksgiving on the discovery of the offender, and so painful was my anxiety, that I had passed three days without food. Since the first moment of your complaint, 2. The Sultan of Ghazna had declared war against the dynasty of the Boides, the sovereigns of the western Persia, he was disarmed by an epistle of the Sultana mother, and delayed his invasion till the manhood of her son. 8. During the life of my husband, said the artful regent, I was ever apprehensive of your ambition, he was a prince and a soldier worthy of your arms. He is now no more, his scepter has passed to a woman and a child. And you dare not attack their infancy and weakness. How inglorious would be your conquest, how shameful your defeat! And yet the event of war is in the hand of the Almighty. Avarice was the only defect that tarnished the illustrious character of Mahmud, and never has that passion been more richly satiated. 811. The Orientals exceed the measure of credibility in the account of millions of gold and silver, such as the avidity of man has never accumulated, in the magnitude of pearls, diamonds, and rubies such as have never been produced by the workmanship of nature. 9. Yet the soil of Hindostan is impregnated with precious minerals. Her trade, in every age, has attracted the gold and silver of the world, and her virgin spoils were rifled by the first of the Mohammedan conquerors. His behavior, in the last days of his life, evinces the vanity of these possessions, so laboriously won, 
so dangerously held, and so inevitably lost. He surveyed the vast and various chambers of the treasury of Ghazna, burst into tears, and again closed the doors, without bestowing any portion of the wealth which he could no longer hope to preserve. The following day he reviewed the state of his military force, 100 thousand foot, 55 thousand horse, and 1300 elephants of battle. 10 he again wept the instability of human greatness, and his grief was embittered by the hostile progress of the Turkmen's whom he had introduced into the heart of his Persian kingdom. 8. Return, Deherbalus, Bibliotheca Oriental, p. 527. Yet, these letters apothems, and c, are rarely the language of the heart, or the motives of public action. 811. Return, Compare Price. Vol 2 p. 295 m. 9. Return, for instance, a ruby of 450. Miscals, Dow, Vol I p. 53, or 6 pounds 3 ounces, the largest in the treasury of Delhi weighed 17 Miscals. Voyages de Tavernier, Party 2 p. 280. It is true that in the east all colored stones are Kalid rubies, p. 355, and that Tavernier saw three larger and more precious among the jewels d. Notre Grand Roi, le plus puissant et plus magnifique de Thule. Royce de Lauter, p. 376. 10. Return, Dao. Vol IP 65. The sovereign of Kainaj is said to have possessed 2,500 elephants, a bulfed geograph. Tab 15 p. 274. From these Indian stories, the reader may correct a note in my first volume, p. 245 or from that note he may correct these stories. In the modern depopulation of Asia, the regular operation of government and agriculture is confined to the neighborhood of cities, and the distant country is abandoned to the pastoral tribes of Arabs, Kurds, and Turkmens. Eleven of the last mentioned people Two considerable branches extend on either side of the Caspian Sea, the western colony can muster 40,000 soldiers, the eastern, less obvious to the traveler, but more strong and populous, has increased to the number of 100,000 families. In the midst of civilized nations, they Preserve the manners of the Scythian desert, remove their encampments with a change of seasons, and feed their cattle among the ruins of palaces and temples. Their flocks and herds are their only riches, their tents, either black or white, according to the color of the banner, are covered with felt, and of a circular form. Their winter apparel is a sheepskin, a robe of cloth or cotton their summer garment, the features of the men are harsh and ferocious, the countenance of their women is soft and pleasing. Their wandering life maintains the spirit and exercise of arms, they fight on horseback, and their courage is displayed in frequent contests with each other and with their neighbors. For the license of pasture they pay a slight tribute to the sovereign of the land, but the domestic jurisdiction is in the hands of the chiefs and elders. The first emigration of the Eastern Turkmens, the most ancient of the race, 
may be ascribed to the 10th century of the Christian era. 12 In the decline of the caliphs, and the weakness of their lieutenants, the barrier of the Jaxarts was often violated, in each invasion, after they victory or retreat of their countrymen, some wandering tribe. Embracing the Mohammedan faith, obtained a free encampment in the spacious plains and pleasant climate of Transoxiana and Karizme. The Turkish slaves who aspired to the throne encouraged these emigrations which recruited their armies, awed their subjects and rivals, and protected the frontier against the wilder natives of Turkestan, and this policy was abused by Mahmud the Ghaznavide. Beyond the example of former times, he was admonished of his error by the chief of the race of Seljuk, who dwelt in the territory of Bakhara. The Sultan had inquired what supply of men he could furnish for military service. If you send, replied Ismail, one of these arrows into our camp, fifty thousand of your servants will mount on horseback. And if that number, continued Mahmud, should not be sufficient, send this second arrow to the horde of Balak, and you will find fifty thousand more. But, said the Ghaznavide, dissembling his anxiety, if I should stand in need of the whole force of your kindred tribes. Dispatch my bow, was the last reply of Ismael, and as it is circulated around, the summons will be obeyed by two hundred thousand horse. The apprehension of such formidable Friendship induced Mahmud to transport the most obnoxious tribes into the heart of Chaasan, where they would be separated from their brethren of the river Oxus, and enclosed on all sides by the walls of obedient cities. But the face of the country was an object of temptation rather than terror, and the vigor of Government was relaxed by the absence and death of the Sultan of Ghazna. The shepherds were converted into robbers, the bands of robbers were collected into an army of conquerors, as far as Ispahan and the Tigris, Persia was afflicted by their predatory inroads, and the Turkmens were not ashamed or afraid to measure their courage and numbers with the proudest sovereigns of Asia. Masoud, the son and successor of Mahmud, had too long neglected the advice of his wisest Amras. Your enemies, they repeatedly urged, were in their origin a swarm of ants, they are now little snakes, and, unless they be instantly crushed, they will acquire the venom and magnitude of serpents. After some alternatives of truce and hostility, after the repulse or partial success of his lieutenants, the Sultan marched in person against the Turkmens, who attacked him on all sides with barbarous shouts and irregular onset. Masoud, says the Persian historian, 13 plunged singly to oppose the torrent of gleaming arms, exhibiting such acts of gigantic force and valor as never king had before displayed. A few of his friends, roused by his words and actions, and that innate honor which inspires the brave, seconded their lord so well, that wheresoever he turned his fatal sword, the enemies were mowed down, or retreated before him. But now, when victory seemed to blow on his standard, misfortune was active behind it. For when he looked round, be beheld almost his whole army, excepting that body he commanded in person, devouring the paths 
of flight. The Ghaznavide was abandoned by the cowardice or treachery of some generals of Turkish race, and this memorable day of Zendekan 14 founded in Persia the dynasty of the shepherd kings. 15. 11. Return, see a just and natural picture of these pastoral manners, in the history of William Archbishop of Tyre, L.I.C. 7. In the Gusta Dei per Francos, p. 633, 634, and a valuable note by the editor of the Histoire Genealogique des Totters, p. 535 to 538. 12. Return, the first emigration of the Turkmens, and doubtful. Origin of the Seljukians, may be traced in the laborious history. Of the Huns, by M. D. Geens, Tom I. Tables Chronologics, L. V. Tom. 3 L. 7. 9 X and the Bibliotheca Rental, of D. Herbalus, p. 799-802-897-901, Elmison, History Saracen p. 321-333, and a Bolferagius, Dynast p. 221-222. Thirteen, Return, Dow. History of Hindustan, Vol. I. P. 89, 95-98. I have copied this passage as a specimen of the Persian manner, but I suspect that, by some odd fatality, the style of Farishta has been improved by that of Ashan. Asterisk note, Gibbon's conjecture was well-founded. Compare the more sober and genuine version of Colonel Briggs, Vol. I.P. 110, M. Fourteen. Return. The Zendekan of Deherbalus, p. 1028. The Dindaka of Dao, Vol. I. P. 97, is probably the Dan Dankan of a bull feather. Geograph, p. 345. Ryski, a small town of Chaasan, two days. Journey from Maru, and renowned through the east for the. Production and Manufacture of Cotton 15. Return, The Byzantine Historians, Cedrinus, Tom 2 p. 766, 766, Zonaris Tom 2 p. 255, Nice Forest Brian News, p. 21. Have confounded, in this revolution, the truth of time and place of names and persons, of causes and events. The ignorance and errors of these Greeks, which I shall not stop to unravel, may inspire some distrust of the story of Cyaxares and Cyrus, as it is told by their most eloquent predecessor. The victorious Turkmens immediately proceeded to the election of a king, and if the probable tale of a Latin historian 16 deserves any credit, they determined by lot the choice of their new master. A number of arrows were successively inscribed with the name of a tribe, a family, and a candidate, they were drawn from the bundle by the hand of a child, and the important prize was obtained by Togrel Beg, 
the son of Michael the son of Seljuk, whose surname was immortalized in the greatness of his posterity. The Sultan Mahmud, who valued himself on his skill in national genealogy, professed his ignorance of the family of Seljuk, yet the father of that race appears to have been a chief of power and renown. 17 For a daring intrusion into the harem of his prince. Seljuk was banished from Turkestan, with a numerous tribe of his friends and vassals, he passed the Jaxarts, encamped in the neighborhood of Samarkand, embraced the religion of Muhammad, and acquired the crown of martyrdom in a war against the infidels. His age, of a hundred and seven years, surpassed the life of his son, and Seljuk adopted the care of his two grandsons, Togrel and Jaffer, the eldest of whom, at the age of forty-five, was invested with the title of Sultan, in the royal city of Nishavar. The blind determination of chance was justified by the virtues of the successful candidate. It would be superfluous to praise the valor of a Turk, and the ambition of Togrel 18 was equal to his valor. By his arms, the Ghasnavids were expelled from the eastern kingdoms of Persia, and gradually driven to the banks of the Indus, in search of a softer and more wealthy conquest. In the West he annihilated the dynasty of the Boides, and the scepter of Iraq passed from the Persian to the Turkish nation. The princes who had felt, or who feared, the Seljukian arrows, bowed their heads in the dust, by the conquest of Azerbaijan, or Media. He approached the Roman confines, and the shepherd presumed to dispatch an ambassador, or herald, to demand the tribute and obedience of the Emperor of Constantinople. 19 In his own dominions, Togrel was the father of his soldiers and people, by a firm and equal administration, Persia was relieved from the evils of anarchy, and the same hands which had been imbrued in blood became the guardians of justice and the public peace. The more rustic, perhaps the wisest, portion of the Turkmen's twenty continued to dwell in the tents of their ancestors, and, from the Oxus to the Euphrates, these military colonies were protected and propagated by their native princes. But the Turks of the court and city were refined by business and softened by pleasure, they imitated the dress, language and manners of Persia, and the royal palaces of Nishavar and Rei displayed the order and magnificence of a great monarchy. The most deserving of the Arabians and Persians were promoted to the honors of the state, and the whole body of the Turkish nation embraced, with fervor and sincerity, the religion of Muhammad. The northern swarms of barbarians, who overspread both Europe and Asia, have been irreconcilably separated by the consequences of a similar Conduct Among the Moslems, as among the Christians, their vague and local traditions have yielded to the reason and authority of the prevailing system, to the fame of antiquity, and the consent of nations. But the triumph of the Quran is more pure and meritorious, as it was not assisted by any visible splendor of Worship which might allure the pagans by some resemblance of idolatry. The first of the Seljukian sultans was conspicuous by his zeal and faith, each day he repeated the five prayers which are enjoined to the true believers, 
of each week, the two first days were consecrated by an extraordinary fast, and in every city. Amash was completed, before Togrel presumed to lay the foundations of a palace. 21. 16. Return, Willerm. Tear. L. I. C. 7. P. 633. The Divination by Arrows is ancient and famous in the East. 17. Return, Deherbalus, p. 801. Yet after the fortune of his posterity, Seljuk became the 34th in lineal descent from the great Afrasiab, Emperor of Turin, p. 800. The Tartar Pedigree of the House of Zingis gave a different cast to flattery and fable, and the historian Merkhan derives the Seljukides from Alangkava, the Virgin Mother, p. 801, Colonel 2. If they be they, same as the Zalzuts of Abulgazi Bahadur Khan, History. Genealogic, p. 148 we quote in their favor the most weighty evidence of a Tartar prince himself, the descendant of Zingis, Alang Kava, or Alanko, and Ogas Khan. 18. Return, by a slight corruption, Togrel Beg is the Tangrily picks of the Greeks. His reign and character are faithfully exhibited by Deherbalus, Bibliotheca Rintal, p. 1027, 1028, and Degines, Histoire des Huns, Tom 3p. 189-201. 19, Return, Cedrinus, Tom 2p. 774, 775. Zonaras, Tom. 2. p. 257. With their usual knowledge of Oriental affairs, they describe the ambassador as a Sharif, who, like the Sincellus of the Patriarch, was the vicar and successor of the Caliph. 20. Return, from William of Tyre I have borrowed this distinction of Turks and Turkmens, which at least is popular and convenient. The names are the same, and the addition of man is of the same import in the Persic and Teutonic idioms. Few critics will adopt the etymology of James D. Vitry, History here Ossel L. I. C. 11 p. 1061, of Turkomani, Quisi Tursi et Kamani, a mixed people. 21. Return. History. General de Huns, Tom. 3 p. 165, 166. 167. M. D. Gojian Isabel Mahazan, an historian of Egypt. With the belief of the Quran, the son of Seljuk imbibed a lively reverence for the successor of the Prophet. But that sublime character was still disputed by the caliphs of Baghdad and Egypt. And each of the rivals was solicitous to prove his title in the judgment of the strong, though illiterate barbarians. Mahmud the Ghaznavid had declared himself in favor of the line of Abbas, and had treated with indignity the robe of honor which was presented by the Fatimite ambassador. Yet the ungrateful Hashemite had changed with the change of fortune, he applauded the victory of Zendekan, and named the Seljukian Sultan his temporal vicegerent over the Muslim world. As Togrel executed and enlarged this important trust, he was called to the deliverance of the Caliph Kayim, and obeyed the holy summons which gave a new kingdom to his arms. 22 In the palace of Baghdad, 
the commander of the faithful still slumbered, a venerable phantom. His servant or master, the prince of the Boides, could no longer protect him. From the insolence of meaner tyrants, and the Euphrates end. Tigris were oppressed by the revolt of the Turkish and Arabian emirs. The presence of a conqueror was implored as a blessing, and the transient mischiefs of fire and sword were excused as the sharp but salutary remedies which alone could restore the health of the Republic. At the head of an irresistible force, the Sultan of Persia marched from Hamadan, the proud were crushed, the prostrate were spared, the prince of the Boides disappeared, the heads of the most obstinate rebels were laid at the feet of Togrel, and he inflicted a lesson of obedience on the people of Mosul and Baghdad. After the chastisement of the guilty, and the restoration of peace, the royal shepherd accepted the reward of his labors, and a solemn comedy represented the triumph of religious prejudice over barbarian power. 23 The Turkish Sultan embarked on the Tigris, landed at the gate of Raqqa, and made his public entry on horseback. At the palace gate he respectfully dismounted, and walked on foot, preceded by his emirs without arms. The caliph was seated behind his black veil, the black garment of the Abbasides was cast over his shoulders, and he held in his hand the staff of the Apostle of God. The conqueror of the East kissed the ground, stood some time in a modest posture, and was led towards the throne by the vizier and interpreter. After Togrel had seated himself on another throne, his commission was publicly read, which declared him the temporal lieutenant of the vicar of the prophet. He was successively invested with seven robes of honor, and presented with seven slaves, the natives of the seven climates of the Arabian Empire. His mystic veil was perfumed with musk, two crowns 231 were placed on his head, two cimeters were girded to his side, as they symbols of a double reign over the east and west. After this inauguration, the Sultan was prevented from prostrating himself a second time but he twice kissed the hand of the commander of the faithful, and his titles were proclaimed by the voice of heralds and the applause of the Moslems. In a second visit to Baghdad, the Seljukian prince again rescued the caliph from his enemies and devoutly, on foot, led the bridle of his mule from the prison to the palace. Their alliance was cemented by the marriage of Togrel's sister with the successor of the Prophet. Without reluctance he had introduced a Turkish virgin into his harem, but Kayim proudly refused his daughter to the Sultan, disdained to mingle the blood of the Hashemites with the blood of a Scythian shepherd, and protracted the negotiation many months till the gradual diminution of his revenue admonished him that he was still in the hands of a master. The royal nuptials were followed by the death of Togrel himself, twenty-four as he left no children, his nephew Alparslan succeeded to the title and prerogatives of Sultan, and his name, after that of the Caliph, was pronounced in the public prayers of the Moslems. Yet in this revolution, the Abbasids acquired a larger measure of liberty and power. On the throne of Asia, the Turkish monarchs were less jealous of the 
Domestic Administration of Baghdad, and the commanders of the faithful were relieved from the ignominious vexations to which they had been exposed by the presence and poverty of the Persian dynasty. 22. Return, consult the Bibliotheca Oriental, in the articles of the Abbasides, Cahr and Kaim, and the Annals of Elmasan and Abul Faragius. 23. Return, for this curious ceremony, I am indebted to M. D. Gaines, Tom 3 p. 197, 198, and that learned author is obliged to Bondari, who composed in Arabic the history of the Seljukides, Tom v. p. 365, I am ignorant of his age, country, and character. 231, Return, according to von Hammer, crowns are incorrect. They are unknown as a symbol of royalty in the East. v. Hammer Osmanis Geschicht, Vol. I. P. 567, M. 24, Return, Iadem Anno, A. H. 455, Obiat Princeps Togralbicus. Rex Foot Clemens, Prudens, E. T. Peridus Regandi, Cujus Terror. Corda Mortalium in Vaserat, Eta Utia B. Dirant E. I. Regisit Cad. Ipsum Scribe Rent. Elma C. I. N., History. Saracen. P. 342, Ver. Erpani I. Asterisk Note, He Died being 75 years old. V. Hammer M. Chapter LVII, The Turks, Part 2 Since the fall of the Caliphs, the discord and degeneracy of the Saracens respected the Asiatic provinces of Rome, which, by the victories of Nisphorus, Zemises and Basil, had been extended as far as Antioch and the eastern boundaries of Armenia. Twenty-five years after the death of Basil, his successors were suddenly assaulted by an unknown race of barbarians, who united the Scythian valor with the fanaticism of new proselytes, and the art and riches of a powerful monarchy. Twenty-five the myriads of Turkish Horse overspread a frontier of 600 miles from Taurus to Arzurum, and the blood of 130,000 Christians was a grateful sacrifice to the Arabian prophet. Yet, the arms of Togrel did not make any deep or lasting impression on the Greek Empire. The torrent rolled away from the open country. The Sultan retired without glory or success from the siege of an Armenian city, the obscure hostilities were continued or suspended with a vicissitude of events, and the bravery of the Macedonian legions renewed the fame of the conqueror of Asia. 26. The name of Alp Arslan, the valiant lion, is expressive of the popular idea of the perfection of man, and the successor of Togrel displayed the fierceness and generosity of the royal animal. He passed the Euphrates at the head of the Turkish cavalry, and entered Caesarea, the metropolis of Cappadocia, to which he had been attracted by the fame and wealth of the temple of Street Basil. The solid structure resisted the destroyer, but he carried away the doors of the shrine in Chrysostath with gold and pearls, and profaned the relics of the tutelar saint, whose mortal frailties were now covered by the venerable rust of antiquity. The final conquest of Armenia and Georgia was achieved by Alp Arslan. In Armenia, 
the title of a kingdom, and the spirit of a nation, were annihilated, the artificial fortifications were yielded by the mercenaries of Constantinople, by strangers without faith, veterans without pay or arms, and recruits without experience or discipline. The loss of this important frontier was the news of a day, and the Catholics were neither surprised nor displeased, that a people so deeply infected with the Nestorian and Eutychian errors had been delivered by Christ and his mother into the hands of the infidels. 27. The woods and valleys of Mount Caucasus were more strenuously defended by the native Georgians. 28. Or Iberians but the Turkish Sultan and his son Malak were indefatigable in this holy war, their captives were compelled to promise a spiritual, as well as temporal, obedience, and, instead of their collars and bracelets, an iron horseshoe, a badge of ignominy, was imposed on the infidels who still adhered to the worship of their fathers. The change, however, was not sincere or universal, and, through ages of servitude, the Georgians have maintained the succession of their princes and bishops. But a race of men, whom nature has cast in her most perfect mold, is degraded by poverty, ignorance, and vice, their profession, and Still more their practice, of Christianity is an empty name, and if they have emerged from heresy, it is only because they are too illiterate to remember a metaphysical creed. 29. 25. Return, for these wars of the Turks and Romans, see in General the Byzantine Histories of Zonaras and Cedrinus. Silitz is the continuator of Cedrinus, and Nisphorus Brian News. Caesar. The two first of these were monks, the two latter. Statesmen, yet such were the Greeks, that the difference of style and character is scarcely discernible. For the Orientals, I draw. As usual on the wealth of Deherbalus, see titles of the first. Seljukides, and the accuracy of De Gines, History des Huns, Tom. 3LX. 26, Return, Cedrinus, Tom 2P, 791. The credulity of the Vulgar is always probable, and the Turks had learned from the Arabs the history or legend of Eska and Dei or Dulcarnian, Deherbalus. P. 213 and C. 27, Return, Silitzes, Ad Calcium Cedrini, Tom 2 p. 834. Whose ambiguous construction shall not tempt me to suspect that. He confounded the Nestorian and Monophysite heresies, he. Familiarly talks of the qualities, as I should apprehend, very foreign to the perfect being, but his bigotry is forced to confess that they were soon afterwards discharged on the Orthodox Romans. 28. Return, had the name of Georgians been known to the Greeks. Streetite or Memoriae Byzant Tom for Iberica, I should derive it from their agriculture, L4C 18, P 289, Edit. Wesseling. But it appears only since the Crusades, among the Latins, J.A.C. A. Vitriaco, History here also. C. 79, P. 1095, and Orientals. Deherbalus, P. 407, and was devoutly borrowed from Street. George. Of Cappadocia. 29, 
Return, Mosheim, Institute History Ecclesiastes p. 632 C. In Chardon's Travels, Tom I. p. 171-174, The Manners and Religion Of this handsome but worthless nation See the pedigree of their Princes from Adam to the present century, in the tables of M. D. Gaines, Tom I. P. 433-438 The false or genuine magnanimity of Mahmud the Ghaznavide was not imitated by Alp Arslan, and he attacked without scruple the Greek Empress Eudocha and her children. His alarming progress compelled her to give herself and her scepter to the hand of a soldier, and Romanus Diogenes was invested with the imperial purple. His patriotism, and perhaps his pride, urged him from Constantinople. Within two months after his accession, and the next campaign he most scandalously took the field during the holy festival of Easter. In the palace, Diogenes was no more than the husband of Eudocha, in the camp, he was the emperor of the Romans, and he sustained that character with feeble resources and invincible courage. By his spirit and success the soldiers were taught to act, the subjects to hope, and the enemies to fear. The Turks had penetrated into the heart of Phrygia, but the Sultan himself had resigned to his emirs the prosecution of the war, and there numerous detachments were scattered over Asia in the security of conquest. Laden with spoil, and careless of discipline, they were separately surprised and defeated by the Greeks, the activity of the emperor seemed to multiply his presence, and while they heard of his expedition to Antioch, the enemy felt his sword on the hills of Trebizond. In three laborious campaigns, the Turks were driven beyond the Euphrates, in the fourth and last, Romanus undertook the deliverance of Armenia. The desolation of the land obliged him to transport a supply of two months' provisions, and he marched forwards to the siege of Malazgird, 30 an important fortress in the midway between the modern cities of Arzurum and Van. His army amounted, at the least, to 100,000 men. The troops of Constantinople were reinforced by the disorderly multitudes of Phrygia and Cappadocia, but the real strength was composed of the subjects and allies of Europe, the legions of Macedonia, and the squadrons of Bulgaria, the Uzi, a Moldavian horde, who were themselves of the Turkish race, 31 and above all, the mercenary and adventurous bands of French and Normans. Their lances were commanded by the valiant Ursul of Balliol, the kinsman or father of the Scottish kings, 32 and were allowed to excel in the exercise of arms, or, according to the Greek style, in the practice of the Pyrrhic dance. 30. Return, this city is mentioned by Constantine. Porphyrogenitus, de administrat. Imperii, L. 2. C. 44, p. 119. And the Byzantines of the Zith century, under the name of Mansikirt, and by some is confounded with Theodosiopolis, but Delisle, in his notes and maps, has very properly fixed the situation. A bullfeather, Geograph Tab 18 p. 310, describes 
Malisgird is a small town, built with black stone, supplied with water, without trees, and sea. 31. Return, the Uzi of the Greeks, Street Tte or, Memorial. Byzant. Tom. 3p 923-948, are the gods of the Orientals, History Day. Huns, Tom. 2p 522, Tom. 3p 133, and c. They appear on the Danube and the Volga, and Armenia, Syria, and Chaasan, and they Name seems to have been extended to the whole Turkmen race. 32. Return, Ursleus, the Rus Elius of Zonaras, is Distinguished by Geoffrey Malaterra, LIC 33, among the Norman Conquerors of Sicily, and with the surname of Balliol, and our own. Historians will tell how the Balliols came from Normandy to Durham, built Bernard's castle on the Tees, married an heiress of Scotland, and C. Duckenge, not Adnice Fear. Bryanium, L. 2. Number 4. Has labored the subject in honor of the President de Bailul whose father had exchanged the sword for the gown. On the report of this bold invasion, which threatened his hereditary dominions, Alp Arslan flew to the scene of action at the head of 40,000 horse. 33. His rapid and skillful evolutions distressed and dismayed the superior numbers of the Greeks, and in the defeat of Basilisius, one of their principal generals, he displayed the first example of his valor and clemency. The imprudence of the emperor had separated his forces. After the reduction of Malazgird, it was in vain that he attempted to recall the mercenary Franks, they refused to obey. His summons, he disdained to await their return the desertion of the Uzi filled his mind with anxiety and suspicion, and against the most salutary advice he rushed forwards to speedy and decisive action. Had he listened to the fair proposals of the Sultan, Romanus might have secured a retreat, perhaps a peace. But in these overtures he supposed the fear or weakness of the enemy, and his answer was conceived in the tone of insult and defiance. If the barbarian wishes for peace, let him evacuate the ground which he occupies for the encampment of the Romans, and surrender his city and palace of Rei as a pledge of his sincerity. Alp Arslan smiled at the vanity of the demand, but he wept the death of so many faithful Moslems, and, after a devout prayer, proclaimed a free permission to all who were desirous of retiring from the field. With his own hands he tied up his horse's tail, exchanged his bow and arrows for a mace and scimitar, clothed himself in a white garment, perfumed his body with musk, and declared that if he were vanquished, that spot should be the place of his burial. 34 The Sultan himself had affected to cast away his missile weapons, but his hopes of victory were placed in the arrows of the Turkish cavalry, whose squadrons were loosely distributed in the form of a crescent instead of the successive lines and reserves of the Grecian tactics, Romulus led his army in a single and solid phalanx, and pressed with vigor and impatience the artful and yielding resistance of the barbarians. In this desultory and fruitless combat he spent the greater part of a summer's day, till prudence 
and fatigue compelled him to return to his camp. But a retreat is always perilous in the face of an active foe, and no sooner had the standard been turned to the rear than the phalanx was broken by the base cowardice, or the baser jealousy, of Andronicus, a rival prince, who disgraced his birth and the purple of the Caesars. 35 The Turkish squadrons poured a cloud of arrows on this moment of confusion and lassitude, and the horns of their formidable crescent were closed in the rear of the Greeks. In the destruction of the army and pillage of the camp, it would be needless to mention the number of the slain or captives. The Byzantine writers deplore the loss of an inestimable pearl, they forgot to mention that in this fatal day the Asiatic provinces of Rome were irretrievably sacrificed. 33. Return, Elmason, p. 343-344, assigns this probable number, which is reduced by a bull Ferragius to 15,000, p. 227, and by Deherbalus, p. 102 to 12,000 horse. But the same Elmason gives 300,000 met to the emperor, of whom a bull Ferragius says, cum centum hominum millibus, multisc equus et magna pompa. Instruct us. The Greeks abstain from any definition of numbers. 34. Return. The Byzantine writers do not speak so distinctly of the presence of the Sultan, he committed his forces to a eunuch, had retired to a distance, and see. Is it ignorance, or jealousy, or truth? 35. Return, he was the son of Caesar John Ducas, brother of the Emperor Constantine, Dukenj, Fam Byzant p. 165. Nice for us. Brian News applauds his virtues and extenuates his faults, li. p. 30, 38. l. 2. p. 53. Yet he owns his enmity to Romanus. Silitzus speaks more explicitly of his treason. As long as a hope survived, Romanus attempted to rally and save the relics of his army. When the center, the imperial station, was left naked on all sides, and encompassed by the victorious Turks, he still, with desperate courage, maintained the fight. Till the close of day, at the head of the brave and faithful subjects who adhered to his standard, they fell around him, his horse was slain, the emperor was wounded, yet he stood alone and intrepid, till he was oppressed and bound by the strength of multitudes. The glory of this illustrious prize was disputed by a slave and a soldier, a slave who had seen him on the throne of Constantinople and a soldier whose extreme deformity had been excused on the promise of some signal service. Despoiled of his arms, his jewels, and his purple, Romanus spent a dreary and perilous night on the field of battle, amidst a disorderly crowd of the meaner barbarians. In the morning the royal captive was presented to Alp Arslan, who doubted of his fortune, till the identity of the person was ascertained by the report of his ambassadors, and by the more pathetic evidence of Basilisius, who embraced with tears the feet of his unhappy sovereign. The successor of Constantine, in a plebeian habit, was led into the Turkish divan, and commanded to kiss the ground before the Lord of Asia. 
he reluctantly obeyed, and Alp Arslan, starting from his throne, is said to have planted his foot on the neck of the Roman Emperor. 36 But the fact is doubtful, and if in this moment of insolence, the Sultan complied with the national custom, the rest of his conduct has extorted the praise of his bigoted foes, and may afford a lesson to the most civilized ages. He instantly raised the royal captive from the ground, and thrice clasping his hand with tender sympathy, assured him, that his life and dignity should be inviolate in the hands of a prince who had learned to respect the majesty of his equals in the vicissitudes of fortune. From the divan, Romanus was conducted to an adjacent tent, where he was served with pomp and reverence by the officers of the Sultan, who, twice each day, seated him in the place of honor at his own table. In a free end, familiar conversation of eight days, not a word, not a look, of insult escaped from the conqueror, but he severely censured the unworthy subjects who had deserted their valiant prince in the hour of danger, and gently admonished his antagonist of some errors which he had committed in the management of the war. In the preliminaries of negotiation, Alp Arslan asked him what treatment he expected to receive, and the calm indifference of the emperor displays the freedom of his mind. If you are cruel, said he, you will take my life, if you listen to pride, you will drag me at your chariot wheels, if you consult your interest, you will accept a ransom, and restore me to my country. And what? Continued the Sultan, would have been your own behavior, had fortune smiled on your arms. The reply of the Greek betrays a sentiment which prudence and even gratitude should have taught him to suppress. Had I vanquished, he fiercely said, I would have inflicted on thy body many a stripe. The Turkish conqueror smiled at the insolence of his captive, observed that the Christian law inculcated the love of enemies and forgiveness of injuries, and nobly declared, that he would not imitate an Example which he condemned. After mature deliberation, Alp Arslan dictated the terms of liberty and peace, a ransom of a million. 361 An annual tribute of 360,000 pieces of gold, 37 The marriage of the royal children, and the deliverance of all the Moslems, who were in the power of the Greeks. Romanus, with a sigh, subscribed this treaty, so disgraceful to the majesty of the empire, he was immediately invested with a Turkish robe of honor, his nobles and patricians were restored to their sovereign, and the sultan, after a courteous embrace, dismissed him with rich presents and a military guard. No sooner did he reach the confines of the empire, than he was informed that the palace and provinces had disclaimed their allegiance to a captive, a sum of two hundred thousand pieces was painfully collected, and the fallen monarch transmitted this part of his ransom, with a sad confession of his impotence and disgrace. The generosity or perhaps the ambition of the Sultan, prepared to espouse the cause of his ally, but his designs were prevented by the defeat, imprisonment and death, of Romanus Diogenes. 38. 36. Return, this circumstance, 
which we read and doubt in. Silitz's and Constantine Manus's, is more prudently omitted by Nisphorus and Zonera's. 361, Return, Elmason gives 1,500,000. Wilkin, Geschichter. Kruzzug, Vol. L. P. 10 M. 37, Return, The Ransom and Tribute are attested by reason and The Orientals. The other Greeks are modestly silent, but Nice forest Brian News dares to affirm that the terms were bad and that the Emperor would have preferred death to a shameful treaty. 38. Return, the defeat and captivity of Romanus Diogenes may be found in John Silitz's Ad Calcium Cedrini, Tom. 2p 835-843 Zonaras, Tom. 2p 281-284 Nice Forest Brian News, L.I.P. 25-32 Glycas, p 325-327 Constantine Manasses, p 134 Elmison. History. Saracen. P. 343-344. Abulfarag. Dynast. P. 227. Deherbalus, P. 102-103. Degeens, Tom. 3P. 207-211. Besides, my old acquaintance Elmason and Abul Faragius, the historian of the Huns has consulted Abul Fetha, and his epitomizer Ben Shauna. A Chronicle of the Caliphs, by Abul Mahazan of Egypt, and Noveri of Africa. In the Treaty of Peace, it does not appear that Alp Arslan extorted any province or city from the captive emperor, and his revenge was satisfied with the trophies of his victory, and the spoils of Anatolia, from Antioch to the Black Sea. The fairest part of Asia was subject to his laws, twelve hundred princes, or the sons of princes, stood before his throne, and two hundred Thousand soldiers marched under his banners. The Sultan disdained to pursue the fugitive Greeks, but he meditated the more glorious conquest of Turkestan, the original seat of the House of Seljuk. He moved from Baghdad to the banks of the Oxus, a bridge was thrown over the river, and twenty days were consumed in the passage of his troops. But the progress of the great king was retarded by the governor of Burzum, and Joseph the Charismian presumed to defend his fortress against the powers of the east. When he was produced a captive in the royal tent, the sultan, instead of praising his valor, severely reproached his obstinate folly, and the insolent replies of the rebel provoked a sentence that he should be fastened to four stakes, and left to expire in that painful situation. At this command, the desperate Charismian, drawing a dagger, rushed headlong towards the throne, the guards raised their battle axes, their zeal was checked by Alp Arslan. The most skillful archer of the age, he drew his bow, but his foot slipped, the arrow glanced aside, and he received in his breast the dagger of Joseph, who was instantly cut in pieces. The wound was mortal, and the Turkish prince bequeathed a dying admonition to the pride of kings. In my youth, said Alp Arslan, I was advised by a sage to humble myself before God, to distrust my own strength, 
and never to despise the most contemptible foe. I have neglected these lessons, and my neglect has been deservedly punished. Yesterday, as from an eminence I beheld the numbers, the discipline, and the spirit, of my armies, the earth, seemed to tremble under my feet, and I said in my heart, Surely, thou art the king of the world, the greatest and most invincible of warriors. These armies are no longer mine, and, in the confidence of my personal strength, I now fall by the hand of an assassin. 39 Alp Arslan possessed the virtues of a Turk and a Musulman, his voice and stature commanded the reverence of mankind, his face was shaded with long whiskers, and his ample turban was fashioned in the shape of a crown. The remains of the Sultan were deposited in the tomb of the Seljukian dynasty, and the passenger might read and meditate this useful inscription, 40. Oh yeah, who have seen the glory of Alp Arslan exalted to the heavens, repair to Maru, and you will behold it buried in the dust. The annihilation of the inscription, and the tomb itself more forcibly proclaims the instability of human greatness. 39. Return, this interesting death is told by De Herbalis, p. 103, 104, and M. D. Geens, Tom 3 p. 212, 213, from there. Oriental writers, but neither of them have transfused the spirit. Of Elmison, History Saracen p. 344, 345. 40. Return, a critic of high renown, the late Dr. Johnson, who has severely scrutinized the epitaphs of Pope, might cavil in this sublime inscription at the words repair to Maru, since the reader must already be at Maru before he could peruse the Inscription During the life of Alp Arslan, his eldest son had been acknowledged as the future Sultan of the Turks. On his father's death the inheritance was disputed by an uncle, a cousin, and a brother, they drew their cimeters, and assembled their followers. And the triple victory of Malak Shah 41 established his own reputation and the right of primogeniture in every age and more especially in asia the thirst of power has inspired the same passions and occasioned the same disorders but from the long series of civil war it would not be easy to extract a sentiment more pure and magnanimous than is contained in the saying of the Turkish prince. On the eve of the battle, he performed his devotions at Thaus, before the tomb of the Imam Riza. As the Sultan rose from the ground, he asked his vizier Nizam, who had knelt beside him, what had been the object of his secret petition, that your arms may be crowned with victory, was the prudent and most probably the sincere, answer of the minister. For my part, replied the generous Malak, I implored the Lord of hosts that he would take from me my life and crown, if my brother be more worthy than myself to reign over the Moslems. The favorable judgment of heaven was ratified by the Caliph, and for the first time, the sacred title of Commander of the Faithful was communicated to a barbarian. But this barbarian, by his personal merit, and the extent of his empire, was the greatest prince of his age. After the settlement of Persia and Syria, he marched at the head of innumerable armies to achieve the conquest of Turkestan, 
which had been undertaken by his father. In his passage of the Oxus, the boatman, who had been employed in transporting some troops, complained that their payment was assigned on the revenues of Antioch. The Sultan frowned at this preposterous choice, but he mild at the artful flattery of his vizier. It was not to postpone their reward that I selected those remote places, but to leave a memorial to posterity, that under your reign, Antioch and the Oxus were subject to the same sovereign. But this description of his limits was unjust and parsimonious, beyond the Oxus, he reduced to his obedience the cities of Bakhara, Karizme, and Samarkand, and crushed each rebellious slave, or independent savage, who dared to resist. Malak passed the Sihon or Jaxarts, the last boundary of Persian civilization, the hordes of Turkestan yielded to his supremacy. His name was inserted on the coins, and in the prayers of Kashgar, a Tartar kingdom on the extreme borders of China. From the Chinese frontier, he stretched his immediate jurisdiction or feudatory sway to the west and south, as far as the mountains of Georgia, the neighborhood of Constantinople, the holy city of Jerusalem, and the spicy groves of Arabia Felix. Instead of resigning himself to the luxury of his harem, the shepherd king, both in peace and war, was in action and in the field. By the perpetual motion of the royal camp, each province was successively blessed with his presence, and he is said to have perambulated twelve times the wide extent of his dominions, which surpassed the Asiatic reign of Cyrus and the Caliphs. Of these expeditions, the most pious and splendid was the pilgrimage of Mecca, the freedom and safety of the caravans were protected by his arms, the citizens and pilgrims were enriched by the profusion of his alms, and the desert was cheered by the places of relief and refreshment, which he instituted for the use of his brethren. Hunting was the pleasure, and even the passion, of the Sultan, and his train consisted of 47,000 horses. But after the massacre of a Turkish chase, for each piece of game, he bestowed a piece of gold on the poor, a slight atonement, at the expense of the people, for the cost and mischief of the amusement of kings. In the peaceful prosperity of his reign, the cities of Asia were adorned with palaces and hospitals with moshes and colleges, few departed from his divan without reward, and none without justice. The language and literature of Persia revived under the house of Seljuk, 42 and if Malak emulated the liberality of a Turk less potent than himself. 43 His palace might resound with the songs of a hundred poets. The Sultan bestowed a more serious and learned care on the reformation of the calendar, which was effected by a general assembly of the astronomers of the East. By a law of the Prophet, the Moslems are confined to the irregular course of the lunar months, in Persia, since the age of Zoroaster, the revolution of the sun has been known and celebrated as an annual festival, 44. But after the fall of the Magian Empire, the intercalation had been neglected, the fractions of minutes and hours were multiplied into days, and the date of the springs was removed from the sign of Aries to that of Pisces.
the reign of Malak was illustrated by the Jelalian era, and all errors, either past or future, were corrected by a computation of time, which surpasses the Julian, and approaches the accuracy of the Gregorian, style. 45. 41. Return, the Bibliotheca Rental has given the text of The Reign of Malak, p. 542, 543, 544, 654, 655, and the Histoire General des Huns, Tom 3 p. 214 to 224, has added the usual measure of repetition emendation, and supplement. Without those two learned Frenchmen I should be blind indeed in the Eastern world. 42. Return, see an excellent discourse at the end of Sir William Jones's History of Nader Shah, and the articles of the Poets, Amak, Anvari, Raski D, and C, in the Bibliothèque. Orintal. 43. Return, his name was Kedir Khan. Four bags were placed round his sofa, and as he listened to the song, he cast handfuls of gold and silver to the poets, Deherbalus, p. 107. All this may be true, but I do not understand how he could reign in Transoxiana in the time of Malak Shah, and much less how Kedar could surpass him in power and pomp. I suspect that the beginning, not the end, of the Zith century is the true era of his reign. 44. Return, C. Chardon, Voyages and Purse, Tom 2 p. 235. 45. Return, The Jelalian Era, Jelaldin, Glory of the Faith. Was one of the names or titles of Malak Shah, is fixed to the XVTH of March, AH 471, AD 1079. Dr. Hyde has produced the original testimonies of the Persians and Arabians, de religione. Veterum personarum, c. 16 p. 200 to 211. In a period when Europe was plunged in the deepest barbarism, the light and splendor of Asia may be ascribed to the docility rather than the knowledge of the Turkish conquerors. An ample share of their wisdom and virtue is due to a Persian vizier, who ruled the empire under the reigns of Alp Arslan and his son, Nizam, one of the most illustrious ministers of the East, was honored by the Caliph as an oracle of religion and science, he was trusted by the Sultan as the faithful vicegerent of his power and justice. After an administration of thirty years, the fame of the vizier, his wealth, and even his services, were transformed into crimes. He was overthrown by the insidious arts of a woman and a rival, and his fall was hastened by a rash declaration that his cap and inkhorn, the badges of his office, were connected by the divine decree with the throne and diadem of the Sultan. At the age of 93 years, the venerable statesman was dismissed by his master, accused by his enemies, and murdered by a fanatic, 451. The last words of Nizam attested his innocence, and the remainder of Malek's life was short and inglorious. From Ispahan, the scene of this disgraceful transaction, the Sultan moved to Baghdad, with the design of transplanting the Caliph, and of fixing his own residence in the capital of the Muslim world. The Feeble 
successor of Muhammad obtained a respite of ten days, and before the expiration of the term, the barbarian was summoned by the Angel of Death. His ambassadors at Constantinople had asked in marriage a Roman princess, but the proposal was decently eluded. And the daughter of Alexius, who might herself have been the victim, expresses her abhorrence of his unnatural conjunction. 46. The daughter of the Sultan was bestowed on the Caliph Moktadi, with the imperious condition, that, renouncing the society of his wives and concubines, he should forever confine himself to this honorable alliance. 451. Return he was the first great victim of his enemy, Hassan Sabek, founder of the assassins. Von Hammer, Geschichter. Assassinen, p. 95 m. 46, return, she speaks of this Persian royalty. Anna Kamna was only nine years old at the end of the reign of Malak Shah. A.D. 1092 and when she speaks of his assassination, she confounds the sultan with the vizier, Alexius, L6 p. 177. 178. Chapter LVII, The Turks, Part 3. The greatness and unity of the Turkish Empire expired in the person of Malak Shah. His vacant throne was disputed by his brother and his four sons, 461 end, after a series of civil wars. The treaty which reconciled the surviving candidates confirmed a lasting separation in the Persian dynasty, the eldest end, principal branch of the House of Seljuk. The three younger dynasties were those of Kerman, of Syria, and of Rum, the first. Of these commanded an extensive, though obscure, 47 dominion on the shores of the Indian Ocean, 48 the second expelled the Arabian princes of Aleppo and Damascus, and the third, R. Peculiar care, invaded the Roman provinces of Asia Minor. The generous policy of Malak contributed to their elevation, he allowed the princes of his blood, even those whom he had vanquished in the field, to seek new kingdoms worthy of their ambition, nor was he displeased that they should draw away the more ardent spirits, who might have disturbed the tranquility of his reign. As the supreme head of his family and nation, they Great Sultan of Persia commanded the obedience and tribute of his royal brethren, the thrones of Kerman and Nice, of Aleppo and Damascus, the Atabeks, and emirs of Syria and Mesopotamia, erected their standards under the shadow of his scepter, 49 and the hordes of Turkmens overspread the plains of the western Asia. After the death of Malak, the bands of union and subordination were relaxed and finally dissolved, the indulgence of the house of Seljuk invested their slaves with the inheritance of kingdoms. And, in the oriental style, a crowd of princes arose from the dust of their feet. 50. 461, Return, C. Von Hammer, Osmanis Geschicht, Vol. I. P. 16. The Seljukian dominions were for a time reunited in the person of Sanjar, one of the sons of Malak Shah, who ruled from Kashgar to Antioch, from the Caspian to the Straits of Babel Mondel. M. 47, Return, So Obscure that the industry of M.D. Gaines could only copy, Tom I.P. 244, 
Tom 3 Part I P 269 and C. The history, or rather list, of the Seljukides of Kerman, in Bibliotheca Rental. They were extinguished before the end of the Zeeth century. 48. Return, Tavernier, perhaps the only traveler who has visited Kerman, describes the capital as a great ruinous village. 25 days journey from Ispahan, and 27 from Ormus, in the midst of a fertile country, voyages and Turkey et. And Purse, p. 107, 110. 49. Return, it appears from Anakamna, that the Turks of Asia Minor obeyed the signet and chouse of the great Sultan. Alexias, L6 p. 170, and that the two sons of Solomon were detained in his court, p. 180. 50. Return, this expression is quoted by Petit de la Croix, vi. D. Justice p. 160, from some poet, most probably a Persian. A prince of the royal line, Katulmish, 501 the son of Israel, the son of Seljuk, had fallen in a battle against Alp Arslan and the humane victor had dropped a tear over his grave. His five sons, strong in arms, ambitious of power, and eager for revenge, unsheathed their scimitars against the son of Alp Arslan. The two armies expected the signal when the caliph, forgetful of the majesty which secluded him from vulgar eyes, interposed his venerable mediation. Instead of shedding the blood of your brethren, your brethren both in descent and faith, unite your forces in a holy war against the Greeks, the enemies of God and his apostle. They listened to his voice, the sultan embraced his rebellious kinsmen, and the eldest, the valiant Solomon, accepted the royal standard, which gave him the free conquest and hereditary command of the provinces of the Roman Empire, from Arzurum to Constantinople, and the unknown regions of the West. 51 Accompanied by his four brothers, he passed the Euphrates, the Turkish camp was soon seated in the neighborhood of Kyotei in Phrygia, and his flying cavalry laid waste the country as far as the Hellespont and the Black Sea. Since the decline of the Empire, the peninsula of Asia Minor had been exposed to the transient, though destructive, inroads of the Persians and Saracens, but the fruits of a lasting conquest were reserved for the Turkish Sultan, and his arms were introduced by the Greeks, who aspired to reign on the ruins of their country. Since the captivity of Romanus, Six years the feeble son of Eudocha had trembled under the weight of the imperial crown, till the provinces of the east and west were lost in the same month by a double rebellion, of either chief Nisphorus was the common name. But the surnames of Brian Neus and Boton Iates distinguish the European and Asiatic candidates. Their reasons, or rather their promises, were weighed in the divan, and, after some hesitation, Solomon declared himself in favor of Boton Iates, opened a free passage to his troops in their march from Antioch to Nice, and joined the banner of the Crescent to that of the Cross. After his ally had ascended the throne of Constantinople, the Sultan was hospitably entertained in the suburb of Chrysopolis or Scutari, and a body of 2,000 Turks was transported into Europe, to 
whose dexterity and courage the new emperor was indebted for the defeat and captivity of his rival, Brian Neuse. But the conquest of Europe was dearly purchased by the sacrifice of Asia. Constantinople was deprived of the obedience and revenue of the provinces beyond the Bosphorus and Hellespont, and the regular progress of the Turks, who fortified the passes of the rivers and mountains, left not a hope of their retreat or expulsion. Another candidate implored the aid of the Sultan, Melis Senus, in his purple robes and red buskins, attended the motions of the Turkish camp, and the desponding cities were tempted by the summons of a Roman prince, who immediately surrendered them into the hands of the barbarians. These acquisitions were confirmed by a treaty of peace with the Emperor Alexius, his fear of Robert compelled him to seek the friendship of Solomon, and it was not till after the Sultan's death that he extended as far as Nicomedia, about sixty miles from Constantinople, the eastern boundary of the Roman world. Trebizond alone, defended on either side by the sea and mountains, preserved at the extremity of the Euxine the ancient character of a Greek colony, and the future destiny of a Christian Empire. 501, Return, Wilkin considers Katulmish not a Turkish name. Geschicht Kruzug, Vol. I. P. 9 M. 51, Return, On the Conquest of Asia Minor, M. D. Geens has derived no assistance from the Turkish or Arabian writers, who produce a naked list of the Seljukites of Rum. The Greeks are unwilling to expose their shame, and we must extort some hints. From Silitzes, p. 860, 863, Nice Forest Brian News, p. 88, 91, 92, NC 103, 104, and Anacomna, Alexius, p. 91, 92, NC 163, NC. Since the first conquests of the caliphs, the establishment of the Turks in Anatolia or Asia Minor was the most deplorable loss which the Church and Empire had sustained. By the propagation of the Muslim faith, Solomon deserved the name of Geza, a holy champion, and his new kingdoms, of the Romans, or of Rome, was added to the tables of Oriental geography. It is described as extending from the Euphrates to Constantinople, from the Black Sea to the confines of Syria pregnant with mines of silver and iron, of alum and copper, fruitful in corn and wine, and productive of cattle and excellent horses. 52 The wealth of Lydia, the arts of the Greeks, the splendor of the Augustan age, existed only in books and ruins, which were equally obscure in the eyes of the Scythian conquerors. Yet, in the present decay, Anatolia still contains some wealthy and populous cities, and under the Byzantine Empire, they were far more flourishing in numbers, size, and opulence. By the choice of the Sultan, Nice, the metropolis of Bithynia, was preferred for his palace and fortress, the seat of the Seljukian dynasty of Rum was planted 100 miles from Constantinople, and the divinity of Christ was denied and derided in the same temple in which it had been pronounced by the first general synod of the Catholics. The unity of God, and the mission of Muhammad, 
were preached in the mashas. The Arabian learning was taught in the schools, the caddies judged. According to the law of the Quran, the Turkish manners end. Language prevailed in the cities, and Turkmen camps were scattered over the plains and mountains of Anatolia. On the hard conditions of tribute and servitude, the Greek Christians might enjoy the exercise of their religion, but their most holy churches were profaned, their priests and bishops were insulted. 53 They were compelled to suffer the triumph of the pagans, and the apostasy of their brethren, many thousand children were marked by the knife of circumcision, and many thousand captives were devoted to the service or the pleasures of their masters. 54 After the loss of Asia, Antioch still maintained her primitive allegiance to Christ and Caesar, but the solitary province was separated from all Roman aid, and surrounded on all sides by the Mohammedan powers. The despair of Philaretus the governor prepared the sacrifice of his religion and loyalty, had not his guilt been prevented by his son, who hastened to the Nicene Palace, and offered to deliver this valuable prize into the hands of Solomon. The ambitious sultan mounted on horseback, and in twelve nights, for he reposed in the day, performed a march of six hundred miles. Antioch was oppressed by the speed and secrecy of his enterprise, and the dependent cities, as far as Laodicea and the confines of Aleppo, 55 obeyed the example of the metropolis. From Laodicea to the Thracian Bosphorus, or Arm of Street. George, the conquests and reign of Solomon extended thirty days' journey in length, and in breadth about ten or fifteen, between the rocks of Lycia and the Black Sea. 56 The Turkish ignorance of navigation protected, for a while, the inglorious safety of the emperor, but no sooner had a fleet of two hundred ships been constructed by the hands of the captive Greeks, than Alexius trembled behind the walls of his capital. His plaintive epistles were dispersed over Europe to excite the compassion of the Latins, and to paint the danger, the weakness and the riches of the city of Constantine. 57. 52. Return, such is the description of room by Hayden the Armenian, whose Tartar history may be found in the collections of Ramugio and Bergeron, see a bullfeather, Geograph Climat 17 p. 301 to 305. 53. Return, Dissit eos quendam abus ioni sodomitica introvertus. Episcopum, Gibert. Abbot. History here also. L. I. P. 468. It is. Odd enough that we should find a parallel passage of the same people in the present age. Illinois N.E.S.T. Point D. Horror Q.C.E.S. Turks N.I.N.T. Commas, E.T. Semblables Auxiliary Sol Deciferines, Key. Dans L.E. Sac de Unville, Non Contents de Disposer de Tautaler. GRE pretendant encore auxiliary success les moines desirables. Quelque. Sipa his ont port leurs attentats sur la personne du vieux rabbi. De la synagogue, et tzela de l'archevt greg. Memoirs du. Baron de Tot, Tom. 2p. 193. 54. Return. The emperor, or abbot described the scenes of a Turkish camp as if they had been present. 
Matris corruptaean. Conspectifiliarum multipliciter repetitus diversorum coatibus. Vexabonter, is that the true reading, cum file ye assistance. Carmina prisonier salt ando coach renta. Mox edem pascio ad. Phileas, N.C. 55, Return, C. Antioch, and the Death of Solomon, in Anna. Comna, Alexius, L. 6p, 168, 169, with the notes of. Duckenge. 56, Return, William of Tyre, L.I.C. 9, 10, p. 635, gives the most authentic and deplorable account of these Turkish conquests. 57, Return, in his epistle to the Count of Flanders, Alexius, seems to fall too low beneath his character and dignity, yet it is approved by Dukenge, not at Alexiad p. 335, and c. and paraphrased by the abbot Guybert, a contemporary historian. The Greek text no longer exists, and each translator and scribe might say with Guybert, p. 475, verbis vestitimis, a privilege of most indefinite latitude. But the most interesting conquest of the Seljukian Turks was that of Jerusalem, 58 which soon became the theater of nations. In their capitulation with Omar, the inhabitants had stipulated the assurance of their religion and property, but the articles were interpreted by a master against whom it was dangerous to dispute. And in the 400 years of the reign of the caliphs, the political climate of Jerusalem was exposed to the vicissitudes of storm and sunshine. 59 By the increase of proselytes and population, the Mahometans might excuse the usurpation of three fourths of the city, but a peculiar quarter was resolved for the Patriarch with his clergy and people, a tribute of two pieces of gold was the price of protection, and the sepulchre of Christ, with the Church of the Resurrection, was still left in the hands of his votaries. Of these votaries, the most numerous and respectable portion were strangers to Jerusalem, the pilgrimages to the Holy Land had been stimulated, rather than suppressed, by the conquest of the Arabs, and the enthusiasm which had always prompted these perilous journeys, was nourished by the congenial passions of grief and indignation. A crowd of pilgrims from the East and West continued to visit the Holy Sepulchre, and the adjacent sanctuaries, more especially at the festival of Easter. And the Greeks and Latins, the Nestorians and Jacobites, the Copts and Abyssinians, the Armenians and Georgians, maintained the chapels, the clergy and the poor of their respective communions. The harmony of prayer in so many various tongues, the Worship of so many nations in the common temple of their religion, might have afforded a spectacle of edification and peace, but the zeal of the Christian sects was embittered by hatred and revenge, and in the kingdom of a suffering Messiah, who had pardoned his enemies, they aspired to command and persecute their spiritual brethren. The preeminence was asserted by the spirit and numbers of the Franks, and the greatness of Charlemagne sixty protected both the Latin pilgrims and the Catholics of the East. The poverty of Carthage, Alexandria, and Jerusalem, was relieved by the alms of that pious emperor, and 
many monasteries of Palestine were founded or restored by his liberal devotion. Harun al-Rashid, the greatest of the Abbasids, esteemed in his Christian brother a similar supremacy of genius and power, their friendship was cemented by a frequent intercourse of gifts and embassies, and the caliph, without resigning the substantial dominion, presented the emperor with the keys of the holy sepulchre, and perhaps of the city of Jerusalem. In the decline of the Carlovingian monarchy, the Republic of Amalfi promoted the interest of trade and religion. In the east, her vessels transported the Latin pilgrims to the coasts of Egypt and Palestine, and deserved, by their useful imports, the favor and alliance of the Fatimite caliphs, 61 and Annual fair was instituted on Mount Calvary, and the Italian merchants founded the convent and hospital of St. John of Jerusalem, the cradle of the monastic and military order, which has since reigned in the Isles of Rhodes and of Malta. Had they Christian pilgrims been content to revere the tomb of a prophet, the disciples of Muhammad, instead of blaming, would have imitated their piety, but these rigid Unitarians were scandalized by a worship which represents the birth, death, and resurrection of a god. The Catholic images were branded with the name of idols, and the Muslims smiled with indignation 62 at the Miraculous flame which was kindled on the eve of Easter in the Holy Sepulchre. 63 This pious fraud, first devised in the 9th century, 64 was devoutly cherished by the Latin Crusaders, and is annually repeated by the clergy of the Greek, Armenian, and Coptic sects. 65 who impose on the credulous spectators 66 for their own benefit, and that of their tyrants. In every age, a principle of toleration has been fortified by a sense of interest, and the revenue of the prince and his emir was increased each year, by the expense and tribute of so many thousand strangers. 58. Return, our best fund for the history of Jerusalem from Heraclius to the Crusades is contained in two large and original passages of William Archbishop of Tyre, LIC 1 to 10, L 18. C 5, 6, the principal author of the Gusta Dei per Francos. M. D. Geens has composed a very learned memoir sur le commerce. De François dans le de la vente avant les croyades, and C. Mem. D. L'Académie des inscriptions, Tom. XXXVIIP 467 500. 59. Return, Secundum Dominorum Dispositionum Plurumc Lucida. Plurum Q nubula recipit intervalla, et e grotantium mor. Temporum presentium gravabatut autorud respirabit qualitate, li. c. 3, p. 630. The laudinity of William of Tyre is by no means contemptible, but in his account of 490 years, from the loss to the recovery of Jerusalem, precedes the true account by thirty years. 60. Return, for the transactions of Charlemagne with the Holy Land, C. Egenhard, D. Vita Caroli Magni, C. 16, p. 79-82. Constantine Porphyrogenitus, D. Administratione Imperii, L. 2. C. 26. P. 80, and Page I, 
Bhakti Dika, Tom, 3. AD 800, number 13. 14, 15. 61, return, the Caliph granted his privileges, Amalfitanus. Virus Amicia Ct Udalium Introductoribus, Gusta Dei, p. 934. The trade of Venice to Egypt and Palestine cannot produce so old a title, unless we adopt the laughable translation of a Frenchman who mistook the two factions of the circus, Venedi et Prasini, for the Venetians and Parisians. 62, Return, An Arabic Chronicle of Jerusalem, Apud Asemin. Bibliot. Orient. Tom. I. P. 268, Tom. 4. P. 368, Attests the Unbelief of the Caliph and the Historian, yet can Takusin presumes to appeal to the Mahometans themselves for the truth of this perpetual miracle. 63. Return, in his dissertations on ecclesiastical history, the learned Mosheim has separately discussed this pretended miracle. Tom 2p 214-306 De Lumen Sancti Sepulchre. 64. Return, William of Malmesbury, L. 4c2, p. 209, quotes. The itinerary of the monk Bernard, an eyewitness, who visited Jerusalem AD 870. The miracle is confirmed by another pilgrim. Some years older, and Mosheim ascribes the invention to the Franks, soon after the decease of Charlemagne. 65. Return, Our Travelers, Sandys, p. 134, Thevenote, p. 621-627, Mondral, p. 94, 95, and C. describes this extravagant farce. The Catholics are puzzled to decide when the miracle ended. And the trick began. 66. Return, the Orientals themselves confess the fraud, and plead necessity and edification, memoirs du Chevalier. D'Arvius, Tom. 2 p. 140. Joseph Abudakni, History. Captain of the Poet C. 20. But I will not attempt, with Mosheim, to explain the mode. R. Travelers have failed with the blood of street. Januarius et. Naples. The revolution which transferred the scepter from the Abbasides to the Fatimites was a benefit, rather than an injury, to the Holy Land. A sovereign resident in Egypt was more sensible of the importance of Christian trade, and the emirs of Palestine were less remote from the justice and power of the throne. But the third of these Fatimite caliphs was the famous Hakam, 67 a frantic youth, who was delivered by his impiety and despotism from the fear either of God or man and whose reign was a wild mixture of vice and folly, regardless of the most ancient customs of Egypt, he imposed on the women an absolute confinement, the restraint excited the clamors of both sexes, their clamors provoked his fury, a part of old Cairo was delivered to the flames and the guards and citizens were engaged many days in a Bloody conflict. At first the caliph declared himself a zealous. Musulman, the founder or benefactor of mashas and colleges. 1290 copies of the Quran were transcribed at his expense in letters of gold, and his edict extirpated the vineyards of the Upper Egypt. 
but his vanity was soon flattered. By the hope of introducing a new religion, he aspired above the fame of a prophet, and styled himself the visible image of the Most High God, who, after nine apparitions on earth, was at length manifest in his royal person. At the name of Hakam, the Lord of the living and the dead, every knee was bent in religious adoration, his mysteries were performed on a mountain near Cairo. Sixteen thousand converts had signed his profession of faith, and at the present hour, a free and warlike people, the Druzes of Mount Libanus, are persuaded of the life and divinity of a madman and tyrant. 68 In his divine character, Hakam hated the Jews and Christians, as the servants of his rivals, while some remains of prejudice or prudence still pleaded in favor of the law of Muhammad. Both in Egypt and Palestine, his cruel and wanton persecution made some martyrs and many apostles, the common rights and special privileges of the sectaries were equally disregarded, and a general interdict was laid on the devotion of strangers and natives. The Temple of the Christian World, the Church of the Resurrection, was demolished to its foundations. The luminous prodigy of Easter was interrupted, and much profane. Labor was exhausted to destroy the cave in the rock which properly constitutes the Holy Sepulchre. At the report of this sacrilege, the nations of Europe were astonished and afflicted. But instead of arming in the defense of the Holy Land, they contented themselves with burning, or banishing, the Jews, as the secret advisers of the impious barbarian. 69 Yet the calamities of Jerusalem were in some measure alleviated by the inconstancy or repentance of Hakam himself, and the royal mandate was sealed for the restitution of the churches, when the tyrant was assassinated by the emissaries of his sister. The succeeding caliphs resumed the maxims of religion and policy, a free toleration was again granted, with the pious aid of the emperor of Constantinople, the holy sepulchre arose from its ruins, and after a short abstinence, the pilgrims returned with an increase of appetite to the spiritual feast. 70 In the sea voyage of Palestine, the dangers were frequent, and the opportunities rare. But the conversion of Hungary opened a safe communication between Germany and Greece. The charity of Street Stephen, the apostle of his kingdom, relieved and conducted his itinerant brethren, 71. And from Belgrade to Antioch, they traversed 1500 miles of a Christian empire. Among the Franks, the zeal of pilgrimage prevailed beyond the example of former times, and the roads were covered with multitudes of either sex, and of every rank who professed their contempt of life, so soon as they should have kissed the tomb of their Redeemer. Princes and prelates abandoned the care of their dominions, and the numbers of these pious caravans were a prelude to the armies which marched in the ensuing age under the banner of the cross. About thirty years before the First Crusade, the Archbishop of Mentz, with the bishops of Utrecht, Bamberg and Ratisbon, undertook this laborious journey from the Rhine to the Jordan, and the multitude of their followers amounted to 7,000 persons. At Constantinople, they were hospitably entertained by the Emperor, 
but the ostentation of their wealth provoked the assault. Of the wild Arabs, they drew their swords with scrupulous reluctance, and sustained siege in the village of Capernaum, till they were rescued by the venal protection of the Fatimite Amir. After visiting the holy places, they embarked for Italy, but only a remnant of 2,000 arrived in safety in their native land. In Gulfius, a secretary of William the Conqueror, was a companion. Of this pilgrimage, he observes that they sailed from Normandy. Thirty stout and well-appointed horsemen, but that they repassed. The Alps, twenty miserable palmers, with the staff in their hand. And the wallet at their back. 72. 67. Return, C. D. Herbalis, Bibliot. Orintal, p. 411. Renaudot, History Patriarch. Alex. p. 390, 397, 400, 401. Elmison, History Saracen p. 321 to 323, and Marais, p. 384 to 386, and Historian of Egypt, translated by Reisky from Arabic into German, and verbally interpreted to me by a friend. 68. Return, the religion of the Druzes is concealed by their ignorance and hypocrisy. Their secret doctrines are confined to the elect who profess a contemplative life, and the vulgar. Druzes, the most indifferent of men, occasionally conform to the worship of the Mahometans and Christians of their neighborhood. The little that is, or deserves to be, known, may be seen in the industrious Niebuhr, Voyages, Tom 2 p. 354-357, and the second volume of the recent and instructive travels of M. D. Volney. Asterisk note, the religion of the Druzes has, within the present year, been fully developed from their own writings, which have long lain neglected in the libraries of Paris and Oxford, in The Expose de la Religion des Druzes, by M. Sylvestre de Sacy. Du Tomes, Paris, 1838. The learned author has prefixed a life of Hakim by Amrala, which enables us to correct several errors. In the account of Gibbon, these errors chiefly arose from his want of knowledge or of attention to the chronology of Hakim's life. Hakim succeeded to the throne of Egypt in the year of the Hijira 386. He did not assume his divinity till 408. His life was, indeed, a wild mixture of vice and folly, to which may be added, of the most sanguinary cruelty. During his reign, 18,000 persons were victims of his ferocity. Yet such is the God, observes M.D. Sacy, whom the Druzes have worshipped for 800 years. C.P. Uk 6, all his wildest and most extravagant actions were interpreted by his followers as having a mystic and allegoric meaning, alluding to the destruction of other religions and the propagation of his own. It does not seem to have been the vanity of Hakam which induced him to introduce a new religion. The curious point in the new faith is that Hamza the son of Ali, the real founder of the Unitarian religion, such as its boastful title, was content to take a secondary part. While Hakim was God, the One Supreme, the Imam Hamza was his intelligence. It was not in his divine character that Hakim hated the Jews and 
Christians, but in that of a Mohammedan bigot, which he displayed. In the earlier years of his reign, his barbarous persecution, and the burning of the Church of the Resurrection at Jerusalem, belong entirely to that period, and his assumption of divinity was followed by an edict of toleration to Jews and Christians. The Mahometans, whose religion he then treated with hostility and contempt, being far the most numerous, were his most dangerous enemies, and therefore the objects of his most inveterate hatred. It is another singular fact, that the religion of Hakam was by no means confined to Egypt and Syria. M. D. Sacy quotes a letter addressed to the chief of the sect in India, and there is likewise a letter to the Byzantine Emperor Constantine, son of Armanus, Romanus, and the clergy of the empire. Constantine 8. M. D. Sacy supposes, but this is irreconcilable with Chronology, it must mean Constantine XI, Monomagus. The assassination of Hakam is, of course, disbelieved by his sectaries. M. D. Sacy seems to consider the fact obscure and doubtful. According to his followers he disappeared, but is hereafter to return. At his return, the resurrection is to take place, the triumph of Unitarianism, and the final discomfiture of all other religions. The Temple of Mecca is especially devoted to destruction. It is remarkable that one of the signs of this final consummation, and of the reappearance of Hakam, is that Christianity shall be gaining a manifest predominance over Mahometanism. As for the religion of the Druzes, I cannot agree with Gibbon that it does not deserve to be better known, and am grateful to M. D. Sacy, notwithstanding the prolixity and occasional repetition in his two large volumes, for the full examination of the most extraordinary religious aberration which ever extensively affected the mind of man. The worship of a mad tyrant is the basis of a subtle metaphysical creed, and of a severe, and even ascetic, morality. M. 69, Return, C. Glaber, L. 3 C. 7, and the Annals of Barrow News and Page I, A.D. 1009 70, Return, Per Idem Tempus Ex Universo Orb Tam Innumerabilis Multitudo Copit Confluere Ad Sepulcrum Salvatoris Hierosolimis Quantum Nullus Hominum Prius Sperare Poderat Ordo Infer Iores Plebis Mediocres Regis et comites. Pras Yules. Muliers multi nobilis cum papiri oribus. Pluribus enim erat. Mentis desiderium mori prius quam ad propria rebate carenta. Glaber, L4C, 6, Bouquet. Historians of France, Tom. X, P. 50, asterisk note. Compare the first chapter of Wilkin, Geschichter. Kruzug, M. 71, Return, Glaber, L. 3C1. Katona, History Critic. Regum. Hungary, Tom. I. P. 304 311, Examines Weather Street. Stephen. Founded a monastery at Jerusalem. 72, Return, Barrow News, AD 1064, No 43 to 56, has transcribed the greater part of the original narratives of Engulfius, Marianus, 
and Lambertus. After the defeat of the Romans, the tranquility of the Fatimite. Caliphs was invaded by the Turks. 73 One of the lieutenants of Malak Shah, ATSI's the Karizmian, marched into Syria at the head of a powerful army, and reduced Damascus by famine and the sword. Hems, and the other cities of the province, acknowledged the Caliph of Baghdad and the Sultan of Persia, and the victorious Amir advanced without resistance to the banks of the Nile, the Fatimite was preparing to fly into the heart of Africa, but the Negroes of his guard and the inhabitants of Cairo made a desperate sally, and repulsed the Turk from the confines of Egypt. In his retreat he indulged the license of slaughter and rapine, the judge and notaries of Jerusalem were invited to his camp, and their execution was followed by the massacre of three thousand citizens. The cruelty or the defeat of ATSIs was soon punished by the Sultan Tukush, the brother of Malak Shah, who, with a higher title and more formidable powers, asserted the dominion of Syria and Palestine. The House of Seljuk reigned about twenty years in Jerusalem, seventy-four but the hereditary command of the holy city and territory was entrusted or abandoned to the Amir Ortok, the chief of a tribe of Turkmens, whose children, after their expulsion from Palestine, formed two dynasties on the borders of Armenia and Assyria. 75 The Oriental Christians and the Latin pilgrims deplored a revolution, which, instead of the regular government and old alliance of the caliphs, imposed on their necks the iron yoke of the strangers of the north. 76 In his court and camp the great sultan had adopted in some degree the arts and manners of Persia, but the body of the Turkish nation, and more especially the pastoral tribes, still breathed the fierceness of the desert. From Nice to Jerusalem, the western countries of Asia were a scene of foreign and domestic hostility, and the shepherds of Palestine, who held a precarious sway on a doubtful frontier, had neither leisure nor capacity to await the slow profits of commercial and religious freedom. The pilgrims, who, through innumerable perils, had reached the gates of Jerusalem, were the victims of private rapine or public oppression, and often sunk under the pressure of famine and disease, before they were permitted to salute the Holy Sepulchre. A spirit of native barbarism, or recent zeal, prompted the Turkmen's to insult the clergy of every sect, the patriarch was dragged by the hair along the pavement, and cast into a dungeon, to extort a ransom from the sympathy of his flock, and the divine. Worship in the Church of the Resurrection was often disturbed by the savage rudeness of its masters. The pathetic tale excited the millions of the West to march under the standard of the cross to the relief of the Holy Land, and yet how trifling is the sum of these accumulated evils, if compared with the single act of the sacrilege of Hakam, which had been so patiently endured by the Latin Christians. A slighter provocation inflamed the more irascible temper of their descendants, a new spirit had arisen of religious chivalry and papal dominion, a nerve was touched of exquisite feeling, and the sensation vibrated to the heart of Europe. 73, Return, C. Elmison, History Saracen p. 349, 350, 
End. A Bolfaragius, Dynast P. 237, Ver. Pakuk. M. D. Geens. History de Huns, Tom 3 Part I. P. 215, 216, adds the testimonies, or rather the names, of a Bolfetha and Noveri. 74, Return, from the Expedition of Ezar Atsis, A.H. 469, A.D. 1076, to the expulsion of the Ordo Kids, A.D. 1096. Yet. William of Tyre, L.I.C. 6, P. 633, asserts, that Jerusalem was. 38 years in the hands of the Turks, and an Arabic. Chronicle, quoted by Pagei, Tom 4p 202, supposes that the city was reduced by a Khwarezmian general to the obedience of the Caliph of Baghdad, A.H. 463, A.D. 1070. These early dates are not very compatible with the general history of Asia, and I am sure that as late as A.D. 1064, the Regnum Babylonicum, of Cairo. Still prevailed in Palestine, Barrow News, A.D. 1064, number 56. 75, Return, D. Geens, Histoire des Huns, Tom I.P. 249-252. 76, Return, William. Tier. L. I. C. 8. P. 634, who strives hard to magnify the Christian grievances. The Turks exacted an aureus from each pilgrim. The Kafar of the Franks now is 14 dollars, and Europe does not complain of this voluntary tax. Chapter LVIII, The First Crusade, Part I. Origin and Numbers of the First Crusade Characters of the Latin Princes Their March to Constantinople Policy of the Greek Emperor Alexius Conquest of Nice, Antioch, and Jerusalem, by the Franks Deliverance of the Holy Sepulchre Godfrey of Bouillon First King of Jerusalem Institutions of the French or Latin Kingdom about twenty years after the conquest of Jerusalem by the Turks, the Holy Sepulchre was visited by a hermit of the name of Peter, a native of Amiens, in the province of Picardy one in France. His resentment and sympathy were excited by his own injuries and the oppression of the Christian name, he mingled his tears with those of the Patriarch and earnestly inquired, if no hopes of relief could be entertained from the Greek emperors of the East. The Patriarch exposed the vices and weakness of the successors of Constantine. I will rouse, exclaimed the hermit, the marshal. Nations of Europe in your cause, and Europe was obedient to the call of the hermit. The astonished patriarch dismissed him with epistles of credit and complaint, and no sooner did he land at Bari, than Peter hastened to kiss the feet of the Roman pontiff. His stature was small, his appearance contemptible, but his eye was keen and lively, and he possessed that vehemence of speech, which seldom fails to impart the persuasion of the soul. Too he was born of a gentleman's family, for we must now adopt a modern idiom, and his military service was under the neighboring counts of Boulogne, the heroes of the First Crusade. But he soon relinquished the sword and the world, and if it be true, that his wife, however noble, was aged and ugly, he might withdraw with the less reluctance, 
from her bed to a convent, and at length to a hermitage. 211 In this austere solitude, his body was emaciated, his fancy was inflamed, whatever he wished, he believed, whatever he believed, he saw in dreams and revelations. From Jerusalem the pilgrim returned an accomplished fanatic, but as he excelled in the popular madness of the times, Pope Urban II received him as a prophet, applauded his glorious design, promised to support it in a general council, and encouraged him to proclaim the deliverance of the Holy Land. Invigorated by the approbation of the pontiff, his zealous missionary traversed with speed and success, the provinces of Italy and France. His diet was abstemious, his prayers long and fervent, and the alms which he received with one hand, he distributed with the other, his head was bare, his feet naked. His meager body was wrapped in a coarse garment, he bore and displayed a weighty crucifix, and the ass on which he rode was sanctified, in the public eye, by the service of the man of God. He preached to innumerable crowds in the churches, the streets, and the highways, the hermit entered with equal confidence the palace and the cottage, and the people, for all was people, was impetuously moved by his call to repentance and arms. When he painted the sufferings of the natives and pilgrims of Palestine. Every heart was melted to compassion, every breast glowed with indignation, when he challenged the warriors of the age to defend their brethren, and rescue their savior, his ignorance of art and language was compensated by sighs, and tears, and ejaculations and Peter supplied the deficiency of reason by loud and frequent appeals to Christ and his mother, to the saints and angels of paradise, with whom he had personally conversed. 212 The most perfect orator of Athens might have envied the success of his eloquence, the rustic enthusiast inspired the passions which he felt, and Christendom expected with impatience the Council's end. Decrees of the Supreme Pontiff 1. Return, whimsical enough is the origin of the name of Picards, and from thence of Picardy, which does not date later than A.D. 1200. It was an academical joke, an epithet first. Applied to the quarrelsome humor of those students, in the University of Paris, who came from the frontier of France and Flanders, Valisai Notitia Galliarum, p. 447, Longuero. Description de la France, p. 54. 2. Return, William of Tyre, L.I.C. 11, p. 637, 638, thus describes the hermit, Pusillus, persona contemptibilis, vivaci. Ingenii, et oculum habeas perspicaciem gratumc, et spont fluens. Ei non dirit eloquium. C. Albert Aquensis, p. 185. Guybert, p. 482. Anacomna in Alex ISD. LXP 284, and C, with Ducarge's Notes, P 349. 211, Return, Wilkin considers this as doubtful, Vol I P. 47, M. 212, Return, he had seen the Savior in a vision, a letter had fallen from heaven Wilkin, Vol. I. P. 49. M. 
the magnanimous spirit of Gregory VII had already embraced the design of arming Europe against Asia, the ardor of his zeal and ambition still breathes in his epistles, from either side of the Alps, 50,000 Catholics had enlisted under the banner of street. Peter, three and his successor reveals his intention of marching at their head against the impious sectaries of Muhammad. But the glory or reproach of executing, though not in person, this holy enterprise, was reserved for Urban II, for the most faithful of his disciples. He undertook the conquest of the East, whilst the larger portion of Rome was possessed and fortified by his rival Guybert of Ravenna, who contended with Urban for the name and honors of the pontificate. He attempted to unite the powers of the West, at a time when the princes were separated from the church, and the people from their princes, by the excommunication which himself and his predecessors had thundered against the emperor and the king of France. Philip the first of France, supported with patience the censures which he had provoked by his scandalous life and adulterous marriage. Henry IV, of Germany, asserted the right of investitures, the prerogative of confirming his bishops by the delivery of the ring and crozier. But the emperor's party was crushed in Italy by the arms of the Normans and the Countess Matilda, and the long quarrel had been recently envenomed by the revolt of his son, Conrad and the shame of his wife, five who, in the synods of Constance and Placentia, confessed the manifold prostitutions to which she had been exposed by a husband regardless of her honor and his own. Six so popular was the cause of Urban, so weighty was his influence, that the council which he summoned at Placentia seven was composed of two hundred bishops of Italy, France, Bagandi, Swabia, and Bavaria, four thousand of the clergy, and thirty thousand of the laity, attended this important meeting, and, as the most spacious cathedral would have been inadequate to the multitude, the session of seven days was held in a plain adjacent to the city. The ambassadors of the Greek emperor, Alexius Comnus, were introduced to plead the distress of their sovereign, and the danger of Constantinople, which was divided only by a narrow sea from the victorious Turks, the common enemies of the Christian name. In their suppliant address they flattered the pride of the Latin princes, and, appealing at once, to their policy and religion, exhorted them to repel the barbarians on the confines of Asia, rather than to expect them in the heart of Europe. At the sad tale of the misery and perils of their eastern brethren, the assembly burst into tears, the most eager champions declared their readiness to march, and the Greek Ambassadors were dismissed with the assurance of a speedy end. Powerful succor. The relief of Constantinople was included in the larger and most distant project of the deliverance of Jerusalem. But the prudent Urban adjourned the final decision to a second synod, which he proposed to celebrate in some city of France in the autumn of the same year. The short delay would propagate the flame of enthusiasm, and his firmest hope was in a nation of soldiers eight still proud of the preeminence of their name, and ambitious to emulate their hero Charlemagne, nine who, in the popular romance of Turpin, ten had achieved the conquest of the 
Holy Land. A latent motive of affection or vanity might influence. The choice of Urban, he was himself a native of France, a monk of Clugny, and the first of his countrymen who ascended the throne of Street. Peter. The Pope had illustrated his family and province. Nor is there perhaps a more exquisite gratification than to revisit, in a conspicuous dignity, the humble and laborious scenes of our youth. 3. Return, ultra quinquagen tamilia, si me possunt in expedition produce et pontifice habira, armata manu volant in inimicos dei in surgery et ad sepulcrum domini ipso docent. Perv Nyer, Gregor, 7 Epist, 231, in Tom, 12 322. Consul. 4. Return, see the original lives of Urban II by Pandolfius. Pisanus and Bernardus Guido, in Muratori, rare. Italian. Scripture Tom. 3 Pars I P. 352-353. Five return. She is known by the different names of Praxis, Euprecia, Euphtasia, and Adelaide, and was the daughter of a Russian prince and the widow of a margrave of Brandenburg. Strav. Corpus History Germanicae, p. 340. Six return. Henricus Odio im Copit Habira, Idio in Carceravit. Im, et concessit ut plurique vim ei infer rent, im ophilium. Hortens ut im sub agiterat, do chin, continuate. Marion. Scott. Abhud Baron. AD 1093, number 4. In the Synod of Constance, she is. Described by Bert Holdus, Rerum Inspector. Quae s e tantas e t tam. In auditus fornicationum spercitias, e t atantis passum fuis. Conquesta est and c and again at Placentia, satis misericordator. Suspit, e o quad ipsum tantas spercitias pert ulus pro certo. Cognoverit papa cum sancta synodo. Apud baron. AD 1093, number 4. 1094, number 3. A rare subject for the infallible decision of a pope. And counsel. These abominations are repugnant to every principle of human nature, which is not altered by a dispute about rings and croziers. Yet it should seem that the wretched woman was tempted by the priests to relate or subscribe some infamous stories of herself and her husband. 7. Return, see the narrative and acts of the Synod of Placentia, Consul Tom 12 p. 821, and c. 8. Return, Guybert, himself a Frenchman, praises the piety and Valor of the French nation, the author, an example of the Crusades, Gens Nobilis, Prudence, Bell Icosa, Daps Elis et Natita. Quos enim Britons, Anglos, Ligures, si bonus eos moribus. Vidiamus, non illico francos homines appel lemus? p. 478. He owns, however, that the vivacity of the French degenerates into petulance among foreigners, p. 488, and vain loquaciousness, p. 502. 9. Return, per viam quam jamjidum carolus magnus mirificus rex. Francorum apteri facet usque c. p. gusta francorum, p. 1. Robert. Monarch. 
History Hieros L I P 33 and C 10 Return John Tilpian Hughes or Tilpian Hughes was Archbishop of Reims AD 773 After the year 1000 this romance was composed in his name by a monk of the borders of France and Spain and such was the idea of ecclesiastical merit that he describes himself as a fighting and drinking priest yet the book of lies was pronounced authentic by Pope Calixtus II AD 1122 and is respectfully quoted by the abbot Suger in the great Chronicles of Street Dennis Fabric Bibliot Latin Media Evi, Edit Man C. Tom 4p 161 It may occasion some surprise that the Roman pontiff should erect, in the heart of France, the tribunal from whence he hurled his anathemas against the king, but our surprise will vanish so soon as we form a just estimate of a king of France of the 11th century. 11 Philip I was the great-grandson of Hugh Capet, the founder of the present race, who, in the decline of Charlemagne's posterity, added the regal title to his patrimonial estates of Paris and Orleans. In this narrow compass, he was possessed of wealth and jurisdiction, but in the rest of France, Hugh, and his first descendants were no more than they feudal lords of about sixty dukes and counts, of independent and hereditary power, twelve who disdained the control of laws and legal assemblies, and whose disregard of their sovereign was revenged by the disobedience of their inferior vassals. At Clermont, in the territories of the Count of Auvergne, 13 the Pope might brave with impunity the resentment of Philip, and the council which he convened in that city was not less numerous or respectable than the Synod of Placentia. 14. Besides his court and council of Roman cardinals, he was supported by 13 archbishops and 2. 125 bishops, the number of mitred prelates was computed at 400, and the fathers of the church were blessed by the saints and enlightened by the doctors of the age. From the adjacent kingdoms, a martial train of lords and knights of power and renown attended the council, 15 in high expectation of its resolves, and such was the ardor of zeal and curiosity, that the city was filled, and many thousands, in the month of November, erected their tents or huts in the open field. A session of eight days produced some useful or edifying canons for the reformation of manners, a severe censure was pronounced against the license of private war, the truce of God 16 was confirmed, a suspension of hostilities during four days of the week, women and priests were placed under the safeguard of the church, and a protection of three years was extended to husbandmen and merchants, the defenseless victims of military rapine. But a law, however venerable be the sanction, cannot suddenly transform the temper of the times, and the benevolent efforts of Urban deserve the less praise, since he labored to appease some domestic quarrels that he might spread the flames of war from the Atlantic to the Euphrates. From the Synod of Placentia, the rumor of his great design had gone forth among the nations, the clergy on their return had preached in every diocese 
the merit and glory of the deliverance of the Holy Land, and when the Pope ascended a lofty scaffold in the marketplace of Clermont, his eloquence was addressed to a well-prepared and impatient audience. His topics were obvious, his exhortation was vehement, his success inevitable. The orator was interrupted by the shout of thousands, who with one voice, and in their rustic idiom, exclaimed aloud, God wills it, God wills it. Seventeen it is. Indeed the will of God, replied the Pope, and let this memorable word, the inspiration surely of the Holy Spirit, be forever adopted as your cry of battle, to animate the devotion and courage of the champions of Christ. His cross is the symbol of your salvation, wear it, a red, a bloody cross, as an external mark, on your breasts or shoulders, as a pledge of your sacred and irrevocable engagement. The proposal was joyfully accepted. Great numbers, both of the clergy and laity, impressed on their garments the sign of the cross, eighteen and solicited the Pope to march at their head. This dangerous honor was declined by the more prudent successor of Gregory, who alleged the schism of the Church, and the duties of his pastoral office, recommending to the faithful, who were disqualified by sex or profession, by age or infirmity, to aid, with their prayers and alms, the personal service of their robust brethren, the name and powers of his legate he devolved on Adhemar Bishop of Puy, the first who had received the cross at his hands. The foremost of the temporal chiefs was Raymond Count of Thaulaus, whose ambassadors in the council excused the absence, and pledged the honor, of their master. After the confession and absolution of their sins, the champions of the cross were dismissed with a superfluous admonition to invite their countrymen and friends, and their departure for the Holy Land was fixed to the festival of the Assumption, the 15th of August, of the ensuing year. 19. 11. Return Cata de la France, by the Count de Boulain Villiers, Tom. I. P. 180 to 182, and the second volume of the Observations sur l'histoire de France, by the Abbe de Mably. 12. Return, in the provinces to the south of the Loire, the First Capetians were scarcely allowed a feudal supremacy. On all sides, Normandy, Britannia, Aquitaine, Burgundy, Lorraine, and Flanders, contracted the same and limits of the proper France. See Hadrian Vales. Notitia Galliarum. 13. Return, these counts, a younger branch of the Dukes of Aquitaine, were at length despoiled of the greatest part of their country by Philip Augustus. The bishops of Clermont gradually became princes of this city. Melanges, Tires d'un Grand. Bibliothèque, Tom. XXXVIP 288, and C. 14, Return, See the Acts of the Council of Clermont, Consul. Tom. 12 p. 829, and c. 15, Return, Confluxerunt ad concilium e multis regionibus, viri. Potens et honorati, in numeri quam vis singula laic alis militiae. Superbi, Baldric, an eyewitness, p. 86-88. Robert. 
Monarch P. 31, 32 Will Tear I. 14, 15 P. 639 to 641 Guybert P. 478 to 480 Fulcher Carnot P. 382 16 Return The Truce of God Treva or Truga Dei was first invented in Aquitaine AD 1032 blamed by some bishops as an occasion of perjury and rejected by the Normans as contrary to their privileges Duckenge Gloss Latin Tom 6 p 682 to 685 17 return Dies Volt Dies Volt was the pure acclamation of the clergy who understood Latin Robert Monday L I P 32 by the illiterate laity who spoke the provincial or Limousin idiom it was corrupted to Dies Low Volt, or Dix L Volt. See Chronicles. Cassinans, L. 4. C. 11, p. 497, in Muratori, Scripture. Rerum Italian. Tom. 4, in Duckenge, Dissertat 11, p. 207, Sir Joinvili, and. Gloss. Latin. Tom. 2 p. 690, who, in his preface, produces a very difficult specimen of the dialect of Roverg, A.D. 1100. Very near, both in time and place, to the Council of Clermont. p. 15, 16. 18. Return most commonly on their shoulders, in gold, or silk, or cloth sewed on their garments. In the First Crusade, all were red, in the Third, the French alone preserved that color, while green crosses were adopted by the Flemings, and white by the English, Duckenge, Tom 2 p. 651. Yet in England, the red ever appears the favorite, and as if were, the national, color of our military ensigns and uniforms. 19. Return, Bongersius, who has published the original writers of the Crusades, adopts, with much complacency, the fanatic title of Guybertus, Gusta Dei per Francos though some critics propose to read Gusta Diaboli per Francos, Hanovii, 1611, two volume in folio. I shall briefly enumerate, as they stand in this collection, the authors whom I have used for the First Crusade. I. Gusta Francorum. 2. Robertus Monachus. 3. Baldricus. 4. Raymond Dus de Agiles. V. Albertus Aquensis 6. Fulgurius Carnoensis. 7. Guybertus. 8. Williamus Tyriensis. Muratori has given us. 9. Radolfus Cato Menses de Gestis Tancredi. Scripture Rare. Italian Tom. V. P. 285-333. X. Bernardus Thesaurius de Acquisition Terrae Sancti. Tom. 7 P. 664-848. The last of these was unknown to a late French historian who has given a large and critical list of the writers of the Crusades. Esprit de Croades, Tom I. P. 13-141, and most of whose judgments my own experience will allow me to ratify.
it was late. Before I could obtain a sight of the French historians collected. By Duchesne. I. Petri tude bodi se sardoti civ recensis historia d. Hiero Salimitano itinera, tom 4 p. 773-815, has been transfused into the first anonymous writer of Bongersius. 2. The Metrical History of the First Crusade, in 7. Books, p. 890-912, is of small value or account. Asterisk note, several new documents, particularly from the East, have been collected by the Industry of the Modern Historians of the Crusades, M. Michaud and Wilkin, M. So familiar, and as it were so natural to man, is the practice of violence, that our indulgence allows the slightest provocation. The most disputable right, as a sufficient ground of national hostility. But the name and nature of a holy war demands a more rigorous scrutiny, nor can we hastily believe, that the servants of the Prince of Peace would unsheathe the sword of destruction. Unless the motive were pure, the quarrel legitimate, and the necessity inevitable. The policy of an action may be determined from the tardy lessons of experience, but, before we act, our conscience should be satisfied of the justice and propriety of our enterprise. In the age of the Crusades, the Christians, both of the East and West, were persuaded of their lawfulness and merit, their arguments are clouded by the perpetual abuse of scripture and rhetoric, but they seem to insist on the right of natural and religious defense, their peculiar title to the holy land and the impiety of their pagan and Mohammedan foes. 20. I. The right of a just defense may fairly include our civil and spiritual allies, it depends on the existence of danger, and that danger must be estimated by the twofold consideration of the malice, and the power, of our enemies. A pernicious tenet has been imputed to the Mahometans, the duty of extirpating all other religions by the sword. This charge of ignorance and bigotry is refuted by the Quran, by the history of the Musulman conquerors, and by their public and legal toleration of the Christian worship. But it cannot be denied, that the Oriental churches are depressed under their iron yoke, that, in peace and war, they assert a divine and indefeasible claim of universal empire, and that, in their orthodox creed, the unbelieving nations are continually threatened with the loss of religion or liberty. In the 11th century, the victorious arms of the Turks presented a real and urgent apprehension of these losses. They had subdued. In less than thirty years, the kingdoms of Asia, as far as Jerusalem and the Hellespont, and the Greek Empire tottered on the verge of destruction. Besides an honest sympathy for their brethren, the Latins had a right and interest in the support of Constantinople, the most important barrier of the West, and the privilege of defense must reach to prevent, as well as to repel, an impending assault. But this salutary purpose might have been accomplished by a moderate succor, and our calmer reason must disclaim the innumerable hosts and remote operations, which Overwhelmed Asia and depopulated Europe. 2011. 20. Return, 
if the reader will turn to the first scene of the first part of Henry the Fourth, he will see in the text of Shakespeare the natural feelings of enthusiasm, and in the notes of Dr. Johnson the workings of a bigoted, though vigorous mind. Greedy of every pretense to hate and persecute those who dissent. From his creed. 2011, Return, the manner in which the war was conducted surely. Has little relation to the abstract question of the justice or. Injustice of the war. The most just and necessary war may be. Conducted with the most prodigal waste of human life, and they. Wildest fanaticism, the most unjust with the coolest moderation. And consummate generalship. The question is, whether the liberties and religion of Europe were in danger from the aggressions of Mahometanism? If so, it is difficult to limit the right, though it may be proper to question the wisdom, of overwhelming the enemy with the armed population of a whole continent, and repelling, if possible, the invading conqueror into his native deserts. The Crusades are monuments of human folly. But to which of the more regular wars civilized Europe waged for personal ambition or national jealousy, will our commer Reason appeal as monuments either of human justice or human wisdom, m. 2. Palestine could add nothing to the strength or safety of the Latins, and fanaticism alone could pretend to justify the conquest of that distant and narrow province. The Christians affirmed that their inalienable title to the promised land had been sealed by the blood of their divine Saviour, it was their right and duty to rescue their inheritance from the unjust possessors, who profaned his sepulchre, and oppressed the pilgrimage of his disciples. Vainly would it be alleged that the preeminence of Jerusalem, and the sanctity of Palestine, have been abolished with the Mosaic Law that the God of the Christians is not a local deity, and that the recovery of Bethlehem, or Calvary, his cradle, or his tomb, will not atone for the violation of the moral precepts of the Gospel. Such arguments glance aside from the leaden shield of superstition, and the religious mind will not easily relinquish its hold on the sacred Ground of Mystery and Miracle 3. But the holy wars which have been waged in every climate of the globe, from Egypt to Livonia, and from Peru to Hindostan, require the support of some more general and flexible tenet. It has been often supposed, and sometimes affirmed, that a Difference of religion is a worthy cause of hostility, that obstinate unbelievers may be slain or subdued by the champions of the cross, and that grace is the sole fountain of dominion is well as of mercy. 2012 Above 400 years before the First Crusade, the eastern and western provinces of the Roman Empire had been acquired about the same time, and in the same manner, by the barbarians of Germany and Arabia. Time and treaties had legitimated the conquest of the Christian Franks, but in the eyes of their subjects and neighbors, the Mohammedan princes were still tyrants and usurpers, who, by the arms of war or rebellion, might be lawfully driven from their unlawful possession. 21. 2012, Return, God, says the Abbot Guybert, invented the Crusades as a new way for the laity to atone for their sins and 
to merit salvation. This extraordinary and characteristic passage must be given entire. Dies nostro tempor prelia sancta. Instituit, ut ordo e cestis et vulgus ober ransci vetesti. Paganitatis exemplo in mutuas versibatutsides, novum reperirent. Salutis premirandi genus, ut nec fundi t us electa, ut fiery. Asalet, monastica conversationi, seu religiosa qualibet. Professioni seculum relinquera congerenta, sed sub consuita. Licentiaet habitu ex suo ipsarum officio dei aliquantinus. Gratium consecurenter. Gib. Abbas, p. 371. C. Wilkin, Vol. I. p. 63 m. 21. Return, the Vith Discourse of Flary on Ecclesiastical History, p. 223-261, contains an accurate and rational view of the causes and effects of the Crusades. As the manners of the Christians were relaxed, their discipline of penance 22 was enforced, and with the multiplication of sins, the remedies were multiplied. In the primitive church, a voluntary and open confession prepared the work of atonement. In the Middle Ages, the bishops and priests interrogated the criminal, compelled him to account for his thoughts, words, and actions, and prescribed the terms of his reconciliation with God. But as this discretionary power might alternately be abused by indulgence and tyranny, a rule of discipline was framed, to inform and regulate the spiritual judges. This mode of legislation was invented by the Greeks, their penitentials 23 were translated, or imitated, in the Latin Church, and, in the time of Charlemagne, the clergy of every diocese were provided with a code, which they prudently concealed from the knowledge of the vulgar. In this dangerous estimate of crimes and punishments, each case was supposed, each difference was remarked, by the experience or penetration of the monks, some sins are enumerated which innocence could not have suspected, and others which reason cannot believe, and the more ordinary offenses of fornication and adultery, of perjury and sacrilege, of rapine and murder, were expiated by a penance, which, according to the various circumstances, was prolonged from forty days to seven years. During this term of mortification, the patient was healed, the criminal was absolved, by a salutary regimen of fasts and prayers, the disorder of his dress was expressive of grief and remorse, and he humbly abstained from all the business and pleasure of social life. But the rigid execution of these laws would have depopulated the palace, the camp, and the city, they barbarians of the West believed and trembled, but nature often rebelled against principle, and the magistrate labored without effect to enforce the jurisdiction of the priest. A literal accomplishment of penance was indeed impracticable, the guilt of Adultery was multiplied by daily repetition, that of homicide might involve the massacre of a whole people, each act was separately numbered, and, in those times of anarchy and vice, a modest sinner might easily incur a debt of three hundred years. His insolvency was relieved by a commutation, or indulgence, a 
year of penance was appreciated at 26 solidi 24 of silver, about 4 pounds sterling, for the rich, at 3 solidi, or 9 shillings, for the indigent, and these alms were soon appropriated to the use of the church, which derived, from the redemption of sins, an inexhaustible source of opulence and dominion. A debt of 300 years, or 1200 pounds, was enough to impoverish a plentiful fortune, the scarcity of gold and silver was supplied by the alienation of land, and the princely donations of Pepin and Charlemagne are expressly given for the remedy of their soul. It is a maxim of the civil law, that whosoever cannot pay with his purse, must pay with his body, and the practice of flagellation was adopted by the monks, a cheap, though painful equivalent, by a fantastic arithmetic, a year of penance was taxed at three thousand lashes. Twenty-five and such was the skill and patience of a famous hermit, Street. Dominic of the Iron Cuirass, twenty-six that in six days he could discharge an entire century, by a whipping of three hundred thousand stripes. His example was followed by many penitents of both sexes, and, as a vicarious sacrifice was accepted, a sturdy disciplinarian might expiate on his own back the sins of his benefactors. 27 These compensations of the purse and the person introduced, in the 11th century, a more honorable mode of satisfaction. The merit of military service against the Saracens of Africa and Spain had been allowed by the predecessors of Urban the second in the Council of Clermont that Pope proclaimed a plenary indulgence to those who should enlist under the banner of the cross the absolution of all their sins and a full receipt for all that might be due of canonical penance 28 the cold philosophy of modern times is incapable of feeling the impression that was made on a sinful and fanatic world. At the voice of their pastor, the robber, the incendiary, the homicide, arose by thousands to redeem their souls, by repeating on the infidels the same deeds which they had exercised against their Christian brethren, and the terms of atonement were eagerly embraced by offenders of every rank and denomination. None were pure, none were exempt from the guilt and penalty of sin, and those who were the least amenable to the justice of God and the Church were they best entitled to the temporal and eternal recompense of their pious courage. If they fell, the spirit of the Latin clergy did not hesitate to adorn their tomb with the crown of martyrdom, 29. And should they survive, they could expect without impatience they delay an increase of their heavenly reward. They offered their blood to the Son of God, who had laid down his life for their salvation, they took up the cross, and entered with confidence into the way of the Lord. His providence would watch over their safety, perhaps his visible and miraculous power would smooth the difficulties of their holy enterprise. The cloud and pillar of Jehovah had marched before the Israelites into the promised land. Might not the Christians more reasonably hope that the rivers would open for their passage, that the walls of their strongest cities would fall at the sound of their trumpets, and that the sun would be arrested in his mid-career, to allow them time for 
the destruction of the infidels? 22. Return, the penance, indulgences, and c. of the Middle Ages. Are amply discussed by Muratori, Antiquitat. Italii Medii Evi. Tom. V. Dessert. Oxyath p. 709-768, and by M. Chase, Letra. Sir Le Jubiles et Les Indulgences, Tom. 2 Letra 21 and 22, p. 478-556, with this difference, that the abuses of superstition are mildly, perhaps faintly, exposed by the learned Italian, and peevishly magnified by the Dutch minister. 23. Return, Schmidt, Histoire des Allemands, Tom 2 p. 211-220, 452-462, gives an abstract of the penitential of Regino in the 9th, and of Burchard in the 10th, century. In one year, five and thirty murders were perpetrated at Worms. 24. Return, till the zeth century, we may support the clear account of twelve denarii, or pence, to the solidus, or shilling. And xx. Solidi to the pound weight of silver, about the pound. Sterling. Our money is diminished to a third, and the French to a fiftieth, of this primitive standard. 25. Return, each century of lashes was sanctified with a recital of a psalm, and the whole psalter, with the accompaniment of 15,000 stripes, was equivalent to five years. 26. Return. The Life and Achievements of Street. Dominic Loricatus was composed by his friend and admirer, Peter Damianus. C. Flery, History. Ecclesiastes Tom. 13 p. 96 104. Barrow News, AD 1056. Number 7, Who Observes, from Damianus. How fashionable, even among ladies of quality, sublimis generis, this expiation, purgatorii. Genus, was grown. 27. Return, at a quarter, or even half a real a lash, Sancho. Panza was a cheaper, and possibly not a more dishonest, workman. I remember in Pere Labat, Voyages in Italy, Tom 7 p. 16 to 29. A very lively picture of the dexterity of one of these artists. 28. Return, quicunt pro sola devotioni, non pro honoris vel. Pecuni adoptioni, ad librandam ecclesiam dei Jerusalem. Profectus furet, iter illud pro omniponitentia reputatur. Canon. Consul. Claro Mont. 2 p. 829. Guybert styles it novum. Salutus genus, p. 471, and is almost philosophical on the subject. Asterisk note, see note, page 546 m. 29, return. Such at least was the belief of the Crusaders, and such is the uniform style of the historians, Esprit de Croides, Tom. 3 p. 477, but the prayer for the repose of their souls is inconsistent in Orthodox theology with the merits of martyrdom. Chapter LVIII, The First Crusade, Part 2 of the chiefs and soldiers who marched to the Holy Sepulchre, I will dare to affirm that all were prompted by the spirit of enthusiasm, the belief of merit, 
the hope of reward, and the assurance of divine aid. But I am equally persuaded, that in many it was not the soul, that in some it was not the leading principle of action. The use and abuse of religion are feeble to stem, they are strong and irresistible to impel, the stream of national manners against the private wars of the barbarians. Their bloody tournaments, licentious love, and judicial duels. The popes and synods might ineffectually thunder. It is a more easy task to provoke the metaphysical disputes of the Greeks, to drive into the cloister the victims of anarchy or despotism, to sanctify the patience of slaves and cowards, or to assume the merit of the humanity and benevolence of modern Christians. War and exercise were the reigning passions of the Franks or Latins. They were enjoined, as a penance, to gratify those passions, to visit distant lands, and to draw their swords against the nation of the East. Their victory, or even their attempt, would immortalize the names of the intrepid heroes of the cross, and the purest piety could not be insensible to the most splendid prospect of military glory. In the petty quarrels of Europe, they shed the blood of their friends and countrymen, for the acquisition perhaps of a castle or a village. They could march with alacrity against the distant and hostile nations who were devoted to their arms, their fancy already grasped the golden scepters of Asia, and the conquest of Apulia and Sicily by the Normans might exalt to royalty the hopes of the most private adventurer. Christendom, in her rudest state, must have yielded to the climate and cultivation of the Mohammedan countries, and their natural and artificial wealth had been magnified by the tales of pilgrims, and the gifts of an imperfect commerce. The vulgar, both the great and small, were taught to believe every wonder, of lands flowing with milk and honey, of mines and treasures, of gold and diamonds, of palaces of marble and jasper and of odoriferous groves of cinnamon and frankincense. In this earthly paradise, each warrior depended on his sword to carve a plenteous and honorable establishment, which he measured only by the extent of his wishes. Thirty their vassals and soldiers trusted their fortunes to God and their master, the spoils of a Turkish Amir might enrich the meanest follower of the camp, and the flavor of the wines, the beauty of the Grecian women, thirty-one were temptations more adapted to the nature, than to the profession of the champions of the cross. The love of freedom was a powerful incitement to the multitudes who were oppressed by feudal or ecclesiastical tyranny. Under this holy sign, the peasants and burghers, who were attached to the servitude of the glebe, might escape from a haughty lord, and transplant themselves and their families to a land of liberty. The monk might release himself from the discipline of his convent, the debtor might suspend the accumulation of usury, and the pursuit of his creditors, and outlaws and malefactors of every caste might continue to brave the laws and elude the punishment of their crimes. 32. 30. Return, the same hopes were displayed in the letters of the adventurers ad animandos key in French reside rant. Hugh D. Wright S. A. could boast that his share amounted to one abbey and Ten castles, 
of the yearly value of 1500 marks, and that he should acquire a hundred castles by the conquest of Aleppo. Guybert, p. 554, 555. 31. Return, in his genuine or fictitious letter to the Count of Flanders, Alexius mingles with the danger of the Church, and they Relics of Saints, the Ori et Argenti Amor, and Pol Cherimurum. Fominarum Voluptas, p. 476, as if, says the indignant Guybert. The Greek women were handsomer than those of France. 32. Return, see the privileges of the Crus Signati, freedom. From debt, usury injury, secular justice, and c. The Pope was there. Perpetual Guardian, Duckenge, Tom 2 p. 651, 652. These motives were potent and numerous, when we have singly computed their weight on the mind of each individual, we must add the infinite series, the multiplying powers, of example and fashion. The first proselytes became the warmest and most effectual missionaries of the cross, among their friends and countrymen they preached the duty, the merit and the recompense of their holy vow, and the most reluctant hearers were insensibly drawn within the whirlpool of persuasion and authority. The martial youths were fired by the reproach or suspicion of cowardice, the opportunity of visiting with an army the sepulchre of Christ was embraced by the old and infirm, by women and children, who consulted rather their zeal than their strength, and those who in the evening had derided the folly of their companions, were the most eager, the ensuing day, to tread in their footsteps. The ignorance, which magnified the hopes, diminished the perils, of the enterprise. Since the Turkish conquest, the paths of pilgrimage were obliterated, the chiefs themselves had an imperfect notion of the length of the way and the state of their enemies, and such was the stupidity of the people, that, at the sight of the first city or castle beyond the limits of their knowledge, they were ready to ask whether that was not the Jerusalem, the term and object of their labors. Yet, the more prudent of the crusaders, who were not sure that they should be fed from heaven with a shower of quails or manna, provided themselves with those precious metals, which, in every country, are the representatives of every commodity, to defray, according to their rank, the expenses of the road, princes, alienated their provinces, nobles their lands and castles, peasants their cattle and the instruments of husbandry. The value of property was depreciated by the eager competition of multitudes, while the price of arms and horses was raised to an exorbitant height by the wants and impatience of the buyers. 33. Those who remained at home, with sense and money, were enriched. By the epidemical disease, the sovereigns acquired at a cheap rate the domains of their vassals, and the ecclesiastical purchasers completed the payment by the assurance of their prayers. The cross, which was commonly sewed on the garment, in cloth or silk, was inscribed by some zealots on their skin, a hot iron, or indelible liquor, was applied to perpetuate the mark. And a crafty monk, who showed the miraculous impression on his breast was repaid with the popular veneration and the richest benefices of Palestine. 34. 
33, Return, Guybert, P. 481, Paints in Lively Colors This. General Emotion He was one of the few contemporaries who had genius enough to feel the astonishing scenes that were passing before their eyes. Eratotok Vidir Miraculum, Caro Omnes. Emery, Atvili Vendera, and C. 34, Return, Some instances of these stigmata are given in the Esprit de Croyades, Tom 3p 169 and C, from authors whom I have not seen. The 15th of August had been fixed in the Council of Clermont for the departure of the pilgrims, but the day was anticipated by the thoughtless and needy crowd of plebeians, and I shall briefly dispatch the calamities which they inflicted and suffered, before I enter on the more serious and successful enterprise of the chiefs. Early in the spring, from the confines of France and Lorraine, above 60,000 of the populace of both sexes flocked round the first missionary of the crusade, and pressed him with clamorous importunity to lead them to the holy sepulchre. The hermit, assuming the character, without the talents or authority, of a general, impelled or obeyed the forward impulse of his votaries along the banks of the Rhine and Danube. Their wants and numbers soon compelled them to separate. And his lieutenant, Walter the Penniless, a valiant though needy soldier, conducted a vanguard of pilgrims, whose condition may be determined from the proportion of eight horsemen to fifteen thousand foot. The example and footsteps of Peter were closely pursued by another fanatic, the monk god Scal, whose sermons had swept away fifteen or twenty thousand peasants from the villages of Germany. Their rear was again pressed by a herd of two hundred thousand, the most stupid and savage refuse of the people, who mingled with their devotion a brutal license of rapine, prostitution, and drunkenness. Some counts and gentlemen, at the head of three thousand horse, attended the motions of the multitude to partake in the spoil, but their genuine leaders, may we credit such folly, were a goose and a goat, who were carried in the front, and to whom these worthy Christians ascribed an infusion of the Divine Spirit. Thirty-five of these, and of other bands of enthusiasts, the first and most easy warfare was against the Jews, the murderers of the Son of God. In the trading cities of the Moselle and the Rhine, their colonies were numerous and rich, and they enjoyed under the protection of the emperor and the bishops, the free exercise of their religion. 36 at Verdun Treves, Mentz, Spires, Worms, many thousands of that unhappy people were pillaged and massacred, 37 nor had they felt a more bloody stroke since the persecution of Hadrian. A remnant was saved by the firmness of their bishops, who accepted a feigned and transient conversion, but the more obstinate Jews opposed their fanaticism to the fanaticism of the Christians, barricadoed their houses, and precipitating themselves, their families, and their wealth, into the rivers or the flames, disappointed the malice, or at least the avarice, of their implacable foes. 35. Return, foot et aliadsilis detestabile in hac. Congregation e pedistris populi stulti et vicini levitatis. 
An serum quindum divino spiritua serbanta flatum, et capulum. Non minus eadem replacetam, et his sibi dutse secondi viae. Fiserant, N.C., Albert. Aquensis, L.I.C., 31, p. 196. Had these peasants founded an empire, they might have introduced, as in Egypt, the worship of animals, which their philosophic descend. Ants would have glossed over with some specious and subtle allegory. Asterisk note, a singular allegoric explanation of this strange fact has recently been broached, it is connected with the charge of idolatry and Eastern heretical opinions subsequently made against the Templars. We have no doubt that they were Manichi or Gnostic standards. The author says the animals themselves were carried before the army M. The goose, in Egyptian symbols, as every Egyptian scholar knows, meant divine sun, or son of God. The goat meant Typhon, or devil. Thus we have the Mani Chi opposing principles of good and evil, as standards, at the head of the ignorant mob of crusading invaders. Can anyone doubt that a large portion of this host must have been infected with the Mani Chi or Gnostic idolatry? Account of The Temple Church by R. W. Billings, P. 5 London 1838 this is, at all events, a curious coincidence, especially considered in connection with the extensive dissemination of the Polychian opinions among the common people of Europe. At any rate, in so inexplicable a matter, we are inclined to catch at any explanation, however wild or subtle. M. 36 Return, Benjamin of Tudela describes the state of his Jewish brethren from Cologne along the Rhine, they were rich, generous, learned, hospitable, and lived in the eager hope of the Messiah, Voyage, Tom I.P. 243-245, P.A. Arboratia. In 70 years, he wrote about A.D. 1170, they had recovered from these massacres. 37, Return, these massacres and depredations on the Jews, which were renewed at each crusade, are coolly related. It is true. That street. Bernard, Epist. 363, Tom I.P. 329, admonishes the Oriental Franks, non sunt persequendi judaei, non sunt trucidandi. The contrary doctrine had been preached by a rival monk. Asterisk note, this is an unjust sarcasm against Street. Bernard. He stood above all rivalry of this kind see note 31. CLXM Between the frontiers of Austria and the seat of the Byzantine monarchy, the Crusaders were compelled to traverse as interval of 600 miles, the wild and desolate countries of Hungary 38 and Bulgaria. The soil is fruitful, and intersected with rivers. But it was then covered with morasses and forests, which spread to a boundless extent, whenever man has ceased to exercise his dominion over the earth, both nations had imbibed the rudiments of Christianity, the Hungarians were ruled by their native princes, the Bulgarians by a lieutenant of the Greek emperor. But, on the slightest provocation, their ferocious nature was rekindled, 
an ample provocation was afforded by the disorders of. The first pilgrim's agriculture must have been unskillful and languid among a people, whose cities were built of reeds and timber, which were deserted in the summer season for the tents of hunters and shepherds. A scanty supply of provisions was rudely demanded, forcibly seized, and greedily consumed, and on the first quarrel, the crusaders gave a loose to indignation and revenge. But their ignorance of the country, of war, and of discipline, exposed them to every snare. The Greek prefect of Bulgaria commanded a regular force, 381 at the trumpet of the Hungarian king, the eighth or the tenth of his martial subjects. Bent their bows and mounted on horseback, their policy was insidious, and their retaliation on these pious robbers was unrelenting and bloody. 39 About a third of the naked fugitives and the hermit Peter was of the number, escaped to the Thracian mountains, and the emperor, who respected the pilgrimage and succor of the Latins, conducted them by secure and easy journeys to Constantinople, and advised them to await the arrival of their brethren. For a while they remembered their faults and losses. But no sooner were they revived by the hospitable entertainment. Then their venom was again inflamed, they stung their benefactor. And neither gardens, nor palaces, nor churches, were safe from their depredations. For his own safety, Alexius allured them to pass over to the Asiatic side of the Bosphorus, but their blind Impetuosity soon urged them to desert the station which he had assigned, and to rush headlong against the Turks, who occupied the road to Jerusalem. The hermit, conscious of his shame, had withdrawn from the camp to Constantinople, and his lieutenant, Walter the Penniless, who was worthy of a better command, attempted without success to introduce some order and prudence. Among the herd of savages, they separated in quest of prey, and themselves fell an easy prey to the arts of the Sultan. By a rumor that their foremost companions were rioting in the spoils of his capital, Solomon 391 tempted the main body to descend into the plain of Nice, they were overwhelmed by the Turkish arrows. And a pyramid of bones forty informed their companions of the place. Of their defeat. Of the first crusaders, three hundred thousand. Had already perished, before a single city was rescued from the infidels, before their graver and more noble brethren had completed the preparations of their enterprise. 41. 38. Return, see the contemporary description of Hungary in Otho. Of Frizen General, L. 2. C. 31, in Muratori, Scripture. Rerum. Italicarum, Tom. 6 p. 665 666. 381. Return, the narrative of the first march is very incorrect. The first party moved under Walter de Pexigo and Walter the Penniless, they passed safe through Hungary, the Kingdom of Kalmini, and were attacked in Bulgaria. Peter followed with 40,000 men, passed through Hungary, but seeing the clothes of 16 crusaders, who had been impaled on the walls of Semlin. He attacked and stormed the city. He then marched to Nyssa, where, at first, 
he was hospitably received, but an accidental quarrel taking place, he suffered a great defeat. Wilkin, Vol. I.P. 8486M. 39, Return, the Old Hungarians, without accepting Tarazius. Are ill informed of the First Crusade, which they involve in a single passage. Katona, like ourselves, can only quote the writers of France, but he compares with local science the ancient and modern geography. Anti Portum Cyperon is Chopron or Pusson. Malvilla, Zemlin, Flavius Mero, Savus, Lintax, Leith. Miesbrock, or Mersberg, Weyer, or Mosen, Tolenburg, Prague, D. Regibus Hungarii, Tom. 3p 19-53. 391, Return, Solomon had been killed in 1085, in a battle. Against Taudana, brother of Malekshe, between Apello and Antioch. It was not Solomon, therefore, but his son David. Surnamed Kilid Jarslan, the sword of the lion, who reigned in. Nice. Almost all the Occidental authors have fallen into this. Mistake, which was detected by M. Michaud, History de Croix. Fourth. Edit. An extraits de autoroute. Arab. Rel. Auxiliary Croates, PARM. Rieno Paris, 1829, p. 3. His kingdom extended from the Orontes to the Euphrates, and as far as the Bosphorus. Kilid Jarslan must uniformly be substituted for Solomon. Brossett note on L.E. Bo, Tom. 15 p. 311 m. 40, return, Anacomna, Alexias, LXP 287, describes this. As a mountain. In the siege of Nice, such were used by the Franks. Themselves as the materials of a wall. 41, return, see table on following page. To save time and space, I shall represent, in a short table, the particular references to the great events of the First Crusade. See Table 1, Events of the First Crusade. None of the great sovereigns of Europe embarked their persons in the First Crusade. The Emperor Henry IV was not disposed to obey the summons of the Pope. Philip I of France was occupied by his pleasures, William Rufus of England by a recent conquest, the Kinjias of Spain were engaged in a domestic war against the Moors and the northern monarchs of Scotland. Denmark, 42 Sweden, and Poland were yet strangers to the passions and interests of the South. The religious ardor was more strongly felt by the princes of the second order, who held an important place in the feudal system. Their situation will naturally cast under four distinct heads the review of their names and characters, but I may escape some needless repetition by observing at once that courage and the exercise of arms are the common attribute of these Christian adventurers. I, the first, rank both in war and council is justly due to Godfrey of Bouillon, and happy would it have been for the Crusaders, if they had trusted themselves to the sole conduct of that accomplished hero, a worthy representative of Charlemagne, from whom he was descended in the female line. His father was a 